Welcome to Backspace Academy. We're currently at the start of all the pathways to AWS certification preparation with Backspace Academy. So it doesn't matter whether you're just going to go on and do the Cloud Practitioner certification, or if you're going to go further and do an associate level certification like the Developer or Solutions Architect or SysOps Administrator Associate, this is still fundamental required knowledge for you to proceed any further. So make sure that you don't skip over this and do it. And without any further ado, let's get into it. So what is the AWS Cloud? AWS has invested billions of dollars in IT resources that are distributed across the globe. And the use of those resources is shared amongst thousands upon thousands of AWS account holders. Now, although those resources are shared amongst those account holders, the accounts themselves are completely isolated from each other at the hypervisor level. You also have the option of your own dedicated resources if you wish. You as an account holder can have on-demand delivery of IT resources on a pay-as-you-go pricing model with no upfront cost. You only pay for what you use. The more you use, the more you pay. The less you use, the less you pay. When you don't use it, you don't pay for it. When you use it, you pay by the hour or the minute or the second. And some services even provide billing by the millisecond. Now that provides some really good economies of scale because the cost of that infrastructure is shared across thousands upon thousands of account holders. If you're a large enterprise, that is great because you don't have to worry about the capital expenditure of your own infrastructure. And you don't have to worry about the maintenance staff to support that infrastructure. Now that infrastructure is organized according to a range of different product types. If you want to use those IT resources for pure computing power, AWS can do that for you. If you want to use AWS just to store data, AWS can do that for you as well. If you want to run a database as a service, if you want to run a relational database, a NoSQL database, a graph database as a service, AWS can do that for you. And they'll do that on demand on a pay-as-you-go pricing model. The AWS global infrastructure is massive and is divided into geographic regions and those geographic regions are divided into separate availability zones. As you can see, there are lots of regions distributed throughout the globe. For this course, we will be using the North Virginia region because that is the largest region and supports all of the available AWS services. If you're using a smaller region, for example, Mumbai, you may encounter problems if it doesn't support all of the services. The AWS GovCloud is located in the US West Coast and is specifically for US government organizations. There is also a an AWS secret region. And I can't tell you where that is because it's a secret. That region is specifically for US government intelligence organizations. And in case you're wondering, yes, the CIA is a customer of AWS. Your choice of region can depend upon a number of things and you may want to have the lowest latency and you want your server to be located as close to your customers as possible. But you may also want to minimize costs. For example, I'm located in Sydney, but I mainly use the North Virginia region because it is cheaper for me. You may also want to locate your server in another country for regulatory reasons, or you may want to be located in your country for regulatory reasons. So there are a number of factors to take in, to, into consideration when selecting a region. Each region is divided up into at least two availability zones that are physically isolated from each other. This provides business continuity for your infrastructure if you have it distributed across multiple availability zones. If one availability zone goes down, the infrastructure in the other availability zone will continue to operate. The largest region, US East North Virginia, 
has six availability zones. And the availability zones are connected to each other through a high-speed fiber optic network. There are over 100 edge locations that are used for the CloudFront content delivery network. CloudFront can cache your popular content, such as images and videos, and distribute that to edge locations across the globe for high-speed delivery to your end users no matter where they are located. And it'll do that with very low latency. It also provides great protection against DDoS attacks. The AWS Management Console is a web-based interface to AWS and we'll use it throughout the course to access AWS services. And you'll also use it to monitor your costs. You need to have an account to access it, but once you have an account created, you can access it simply by clicking on the My Account menu from the AWS website and then selecting the Management Console. There's also an AWS Console mobile app and that is great for tablets. You can also access AWS resources through the many software development kits. This allows you to create applications that use AWS as a back end. There are SDKs for all the major languages and there's also a mobile SDK. It's also possible to access AWS with direct HTTP calls using the AWS REST API. You can also install a command line interface on your desktop and that will allow you to remotely connect into AWS and also be able to create and run scripts to automate a lot of the processes on AWS. The AWS website is located at aws.amazon.com. What I want you to do now is to go to that website and bookmark some pages of the website. The first one is the certification page, and that will have links to everything you need to know about the certification process. So if you're not sure what certification to do, or you want to know how to schedule and sit an exam, that is a place to go. The next one is the documentation page. Throughout the course, we will be referencing the documentation for the services on AWS. So that is a very important link. And the exam, it's going to be testing your knowledge of a lot of this documentation. AWS also has a site specifically for white papers, and they discuss technical issues and use cases for AWS. The products page gives a really good overview of the main products of AWS. And finally, the new products and services page, and that'll keep you up to date on the latest things that are happening in AWS. Okay, let's get started with AWS. First off, go to aws.amazon.com. Click on the orange sign up button in the top right hand corner and complete that sign up process. You'll need to have a credit card to sign up, but don't be too concerned as there is a free tier available for a 12 month period. And most of the course will be operating under that free tier. We can also set up a billing alert to alert you if you exceed your budget. For example, we can set up a $5 billing alert to notify you if you, if you exceed $5 for the month. Once you've created that account, you can then get into the management console by clicking on the My Account menu and selecting AWS Management Console. Coming up next will be some hands-on labs on AWS services. So make sure that you download the lab notes that come with this introduction to AWS before proceeding any further. And once you've done that, I'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. Coming up next, what I'm going to do is run through all of the products and services that are offered on AWS. Now, there's an enormous amount of services, so rather than go through them all in one hit, I'm going to break it up into a lot of sections, and then at the end of each section, I'm going to give you an example of how to use those services, and then after that, we'll do a hands-on session or a lab where you can actually use those services yourself hands-on. 
So what I need to do now is just give you a very quick introduction to the different types of cloud computing models that are available. Infrastructure as a service, it contains the basic building blocks for cloud IT. What that means is that that is nuts and bolts stuff. So if we want to launch a Linux server and we want to manage that Linux server ourselves, that is how we would do that as infrastructure as a service. And we would do that using the Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2 service. The next level is Platform as a Service or PaaS. And that's where AWS will take a little bit more control over what you know over the underlying infrastructure. So AWS manages that underlying infrastructure and the hardware and operating system normally. And a good example, that would be the relational database service. And in that service, AWS, they provision all the operating system, the server and everything to run that, but you still need to do the high level administration of that database. And then finally, we've got software as a service or SaaS. And that is a complete product that normally runs in a browser and it is mostly refers to end user applications. A good example of that would be Office 365 or salesforce.com. And you'll hear another term used a lot with AWS and that is serverless computing. And so that allows you to build and run applications without having to think about servers. You know, you don't need to provision the server yourself. AWS will do that for you. It's also referred to as function as a service or abstract services. Examples of that are the simple storage service where we will be using at the end of this lecture, where we create a bucket and we put objects and files into that bucket. We don't know what's behind that bucket. Obviously, there's going to be an operating system, most probably a Linux operating system, a file server. There's going to be hard drives. We don't need to worry about that because AWS, they look all that, after all that for us. AWS Lambda is where you can run code in the cloud Again, without service, you just provide AWS your code. AWS looks after everything for you. DynamoDB is a NoSQL database in the cloud as a service. And Amazon Simple Notification Service that can send out notifications to your users. So that's a pretty quick introduction of the different types of cloud computing models. The best way to really get a good knowledge of it is to go through all these products, get your hands on with them, and then you'll fully understand it a lot better. So there's only one more thing to do, and that is, let's get into it. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we're going to run through some of the storage services that are available on AWS. Then we'll look at some examples of how you can use these. And finally, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab using one of these services. Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3 for short, it's designed to store and access any type of data over the internet. It's a serverless service, and as such, we don't need to worry about what is behind it. There's obviously a file server, an operating system, a hard drive, but we don't need to be concerned about that at all. We just simply need to create this thing called a bucket, and then we upload objects to that bucket. The bucket grows as we add objects to it, and the size of that bucket is theoretically unlimited. AWS, it just looks after everything for us. Amazon Glacier is the cheapest storage option on AWS, and it's used for long-term archiving of data. It's a serverless service, just like Amazon S3, but it is not as readily accessible as S3. So it should only be used for content that is to be archived. You can also set up a lifecycle rule that will automatically migrate old data in Amazon S3 automatically over to Glacier for long-term archiving. Amazon Elastic Block Store, or EBS for short, is a highly available low latency block storage and it's specifically for attaching to servers that are launched with the Amazon EC2 service. We'll learn more about the EC2 service coming up. 
And it's similar to attaching a hard drive to your computer at home. Works in the same manner. It's block device storage. Amazon Elastic File System, or EFS for short, is network attached storage. And it's specifically for Amazon EC2 servers. Because it is network attached storage, this allows multiple servers to access the one data source. In a similar way to a NAS on your network at home can be accessed by multiple computers on that network. The AWS Storage Gateway enables hybrid storage between on-premise environments and the AWS Cloud. It provides a low latency performance by caching frequently used data on premises while storing the less frequently data in Amazon Cloud Storage Services. A Snowball device is a portable petabyte scale data storage device that can be used to migrate data and large amounts of data from on-premise environments over to the AWS Cloud. You simply download your data to the Snowball device, then you send it off to AWS, who will then upload that data to an AWS storage service for you. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples of using the AWS storage services. In orange there, we've got the AWS Cloud. Now, we can create a VPC inside that AWS Cloud. And that VPC or virtual private cloud is our own private space within the AWS Cloud. And that is an impenetrable fortress against attack. And no one will be able to enter our own private space without us allowing that to happen. So let's just say we launch two servers in our VPC. Now we want these servers to have access to data and somewhere to store that data. And so in a normal environment, you would just add a hard drive to that server. So in the same way, we can attach an Amazon Elastic Block storage device to our servers. So that's great. We've now got high speed access to our data. But what if we want that data to be available to both of those servers? So here we've only got, or we've got two EBS volumes. What if we want that data to be on one volume only? So as we know it on our computer at home, we can't attach a hard drive or a block device hard drive to multiple computers. It just doesn't work like that. So in a situation like that, in your home network at home, you would just go out and purchase a NAS, a network attached storage device. You would attach it to your network. You would set up your operating system in your desktop computers to have a mount target for that network attached storage. So when you go to your G drive or whatever it is, or E drive or F drive, whatever it is, that will point to that network attached storage. In the same way that we can do that with our network at home, we can do the same thing with AWS. So Elastic File System is network attached storage. And so that, with a mount target, can enable multiple servers to access the one data source. Now, what if we don't want to worry about mount targets and block devices and all this sort of stuff. We just want somewhere we can upload objects to in a similar way that we do with Google Drive or something like that. And we also want to have an automated solution that over time migrates that data over to something more low cost and more long term for archiving. Now that is where Amazon S3 comes in. And so we can use Amazon S3 to create a bucket, store objects in that bucket, delete objects, do whatever we want with it. And we can also set up a lifecycle rule on that bucket so that over a period of time, as objects age, they can be migrated over to an Amazon Glacier Vault for long-term archiving. It will still be accessible. It just won't be as readily accessible as the S3 bucket. 
But the advantage is that we'll be using the lowest cost storage that's available on AWS. Now, that S3 bucket will be located in the AWS cloud. It's not located in our VPC. So remember we said the VPC is our private space within the AWS cloud. And nothing gets through it without us allowing it to come through. So that is where the VPC endpoint comes in. So we can create one of those and that will allow traffic to flow in and out of our VPC specifically for that S3 service. So let's have a look at a hybrid storage example where we've got on-site storage in a corporate data center and we've also got that stored in the AWS cloud in Amazon S3. Why would we do that? Well, it's great for a disaster recovery solution because it provides high-speed access to our data in our corporate data center and at the same time, we're taking advantage of the durability and availability of Amazon S3 as a disaster recovery solution. So the first problem that we're going to encounter is that this corporate data center will have petabytes of data. And to transfer that over via the internet to the AWS cloud is not going to be practical. So AWS, they can send out to us a snowball device. And that is a high capacity device that can store petabytes of data. And so we can upload, when we receive that, that snowball device from AWS, we can upload our data to that, and then we can send that back to AWS, and they will upload that for us into the Amazon S3 bucket. And so that solves that problem for us. So then we've got to find a solution for making sure that the data in our corporate data center is synced with our AWS cloud. Now that's where the AWS storage gateway comes in and that will orchestrate all of that for us. And so if you have got a high speed link between your corporate data center and the AWS cloud, which you can with the AWS Direct Connect service, you can have the AWS Storage Gateway to orchestrate and manage that all for you. And what it will do, it will get your popular content, your content that is frequently accessed, and it will store copies of that on site in your on site storage. But at the same time, it will store all of that data in an Amazon S3 bucket for you. And so then you've got the advantage of having all of the uh, all of the durability and availability of Amazon S3 as a disaster recovery solution. But at the same time, you've got high speed access to your data, which is cached on the corporate data center. Let's have a go at using the Amazon S3 service. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to use the AWS Management Console to connect into the AWS Cloud and then we're going to create an Amazon S3 bucket. We're going to upload files to that bucket, and then we're going to download files from that bucket. And then finally, we're going to empty and delete that bucket. Now there are lab notes for this lab and the further ones coming up. So make sure that you download the introduction to AWS lab notes that come with this course, and let's get into it. Now, before we start the lab, you need to make sure that you have signed up for an AWS account. If you haven't, uh, click on the sign up button up here uh, at the AWS website. Once you've completed that sign up process, make sure that you take note of the email address and password that you use to sign up with. So once that's done, you can go to my account and select the AWS management console. Once you've done that, you can log in using that email address that you use to create your account and the password that you use as well. So once you do that, you'll be into the AWS Management Console. Okay, once we've logged in, we'll be at the AWS Management Console. From there, we can go to Services and try and find the S3 service. Now that will be in the Storage category. I actually don't like to use these categories because they change quite a bit and when you're looking for stuff, it might, might be moved into a different category. So it does make life a little bit difficult. 
The easiest way is to select up in the top right hand corner here is A to Z. And then if you're looking for S3, just go to S for S3 and you'll find it there. So once we've got into the S3 console, the first thing we need to do is to create a bucket. Now I've already created quite a number of buckets here for different labs and whatever I've done in the past, but yours will be obviously empty. You never created a bucket and it's a brand new account. So your screen here might look a little bit different to mine, but there will still be a create button or create bucket button there. So we'll click on that and we need to give our bucket a name. So I'm just going to put in anything there just to whole heap of rubbish there, but you can give it whatever you want to call it. Now, a bucket name needs to be unique across AWS. So if someone else has actually used that name, you can't use it as well. So it's a bit like domain names. Uh, once you've got it, uh, no one else can use it after that. So if I, for example, if I type backspace dash slab or something, no doubt that would have been gone. So I'll leave that as it is, it's just a whole scramble of letters there and we'll click on next. We're not going to worry about versioning or anything like that. We'll just click on next. It's going to be a private bucket. So only us will or only I will have access to this bucket. So we're not going to make it public. We're not going to change anything here. And next. So that's all we do there. It's uh, got our name and region. So we're going to be in the US East region and for all of the labs, make sure that you are in the US East region. It's the largest region and has the most services. And when services come out, they normally first come out in US East. It's also normally the cheapest region to use as well. So that looks all okay to me. We'll just click on Create Bucket. If I scroll down, I should be able to find that bucket name that I did. There we go. So just that scramble of letters there. So it will have a link to that bucket. So we'll just click on that. And there we can see our bucket is empty. So our bucket, it's simply a repository to dump objects to. Could be files, could be videos, could be a whole directory. So what we'll do now is it will upload a folder to this bucket. So we'll click on Upload. Now we can click on Add Files here, but I don't like to use that. The easiest way is to drag and drop. So if you're going to bring in a folder, for example, it's much easier to grab the whole folder and just drop it on the form. So that's what I'm going to do now. And we just drop that whole folder onto that form. And we click on Next. And it's only going to be access for us. So it's going to be private. We'll leave that as it is. And the storage class, so we've got a number of different storage classes, depending on what the availability is, how, uh, how long we're going to be using it, how quickly we need access to it, all this sort of thing. So we're just going to use the standard storage class. We'll click on next. And that's just a review screen and we'll click on upload. So there you can see down the bottom, it's starting to upload those files, that whole folder with all the files inside of it. So now that that has uploaded, we can select this folder, open it up, and we can download a file, get it back again. So let's do that. So we just click on the link in this folder to open up that folder. And I'm just going to download these lab notes. If I click on those, on that link for the lab notes, and I just do download lab notes. And there we go. So that's downloading those uh, that PDF. Now, just want to talk about this screen because a lot of people have a bit of trouble with this because instead of clicking on download, they scroll down here and they click on the object URL. Now, if we click on that, and I'll do that now, this is what you get, access denied. So what that is, is you're trying to access through your browser directly to that object. And it's a private object, so you can't access it. So if you want to have a file that is accessed like that, you need to have it public and you also need to enable website hosting in Amazon S3. So we'll just get out of that. So if you get that screen, that's what's happened. You've clicked this object URL instead of clicking the download link here. So that 
brings us to an end. Now, at the end of all of these labs, I like to clean them all up and delete everything that we've done simply because we don't want to get billed for it. So if you're operating on a new account, you're going to be getting a free tier. And so all of this stuff that we're doing here today will be free. And we just need to make sure that we clean it up afterwards. So I'm just going to jump back and click up the top here to the link to that bucket. And I'm just going to select that folder. I'm going to go to Actions and scroll down until I find Delete. And I'll delete that. And now our bucket is empty. So one more thing we can do if we really want to clean this up, we can go back into our S3 Management Console by clicking on Amazon S3 up the top right-hand side, there, or top left-hand side. And if we scroll down to find that bucket, and there it is. And then we can just click, uh, click Delete to delete the bucket. So we need to put in the name of the bucket. And confirm to delete it. So there we go. If we uh, have a look for that bucket, it's no longer there. So that brings us to an end. And coming up next, we're going to be doing some more looking into some of the services of AWS, in particular database services. And we're going to be creating a MySQL database and connecting to that database. So some pretty cool stuff coming up. And I look forward to seeing you in that one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the different options that are available for running databases on AWS. We'll then have a look at a database example. And finally, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab where we'll be creating a database server on AWS and then remotely connecting in to that database. The Relational Database Service, or RDS for short, is a fully managed database service that makes it easy to launch database servers in the AWS cloud and scale them when required. The RDS service can launch servers for MySQL, including variations of the MySQL database engine, with MariaDB and Amazon's own enterprise version of MySQL, Amazon Aurora. Standard PostgreSQL is also available and also available as Amazon's Enterprise Aurora PostgreSQL. Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle are also available. Amazon DynamoDB is AWS's NoSQL database as a service. It's a serverless service like Amazon S3 and as such, you don't need to worry about the underlying infrastructure behind it. AWS takes care of everything for you and it provides high speed, extremely low latency performance. Amazon Redshift is a fast, fully managed, petabyte scale data warehouse that is based upon the PostgreSQL database engine. If you're looking for a big data storage solution, Redshift is perfect for this. Amazon Elasticache is an in-memory data store or cache in the cloud. It allows you to retrieve information from fast, fully managed in-memory caches instead of relying for slower disk-based databases. The AWS Database Migration Service orchestrates the migration of databases over to AWS easily and securely. It can also migrate data from one database engine type to another totally different database engine type. For example, you can use it to migrate from Oracle over to Amazon Aurora. Amazon Neptune is a fast, reliable, fully managed graph database service. It has a purpose-built, high-performance graph database engine optimized for storing billions of relationships and querying the graph with millisecond latency. So let's have a look at how we could use these database services. Let's say we have an on-site Oracle relational database and we want to migrate that over 
to Amazon Aurora on the AWS cloud. The first thing we could do is to launch an RDS instance in our virtual private cloud. And remember, a VPC, it's our own private space within the AWS cloud, and no one can enter it without us allowing them to enter. We could use a database migration service to migrate that data in that on-site Oracle database over to a target RDS Amazon Aurora server. Now let's say our new database is becoming overwhelmed with requests for frequently accessed data. And we would like a high speed way of accessing that frequently accessed data. And this is where Elastacache can help us. We can put an Elastacache node in front of that RDS instance, and that will cache our frequently accessed data. And because it's delivering that data from memory, and it's not delivering it from a hard drive, it will be delivered with very low latency. And at the same time, the load on our database will be massively reduced. And any request for anything that is not in the Elasticache will be simply forwarded to the RDS instance. And that way, we have high-speed access to our frequently accessed data, while at the same time, we can still access our less frequently accessed data directly from our RDS instance. Coming up next, we'll be doing a hands-on lab, so make sure that you download the Introduction to AWS lab notes that come with this course. We'll be launching a MySQL database instance, and then we'll be connecting remotely into that database instance. Okay, so I'm in the AWS Management Console now. We go to Services, to the Database Services and RDS. Now that will take us into the RDS dashboard, but if we don't have any RDS instances created previously, then it will go into a welcome screen like this. So we're just going to go to the left-hand side here, click on Instances, and we're going to launch a DB instance. Now we have a number of options available for our database engine. We have Amazon Aurora, which as we said previously, is AWS's MySQL Enterprise Class database. And that is not eligible on the free tier, so we're not going to use that for now. And we have the MySQL Community Edition. And again, there we've, they've got the Amazon Aurora. In case you missed it previously, they've put it up there, but we're not going to use it because it costs us money. MariaDB, again, is a MySQL compatible database. And again, if you missed it, there we have Amazon Aurora as well, which we won't be selecting. PostgreSQL, Oracle, and Microsoft SQL Server. So to make sure that we don't get a bill at the end of the month, we're going to click on this checkbox here saying free tier eligible only. And there we can see Amazon Aurora is not eligible for the free tier. So we go into MySQL, and we can see Amazon Aurora there is grayed out again. We can't select it, and we're going to select the MySQL Community Edition. And again, we make sure that we have this option here available. It says only show options that are eligible for the RDS free tier. We don't want to get a big bill at the end of the month. Now, if we scroll down, we have a number of options here. So the only one that we really need to be concerned with is the instance class. So we're going to use a dbt2 micro, which is a pretty small instance, and it's on the free tier. We don't have any other options for storage type other than SSD, where we're working on the free tier. So we leave everything there as it is. Now we go into the settings of our database server. So our database server needs to have a DB instance identifier. It needs to have a name. So I'm just going to call this one backspace intro dash AWS. Now that needs to be unique within your AWS account for DB instances. Next, we're going to create a user, and I'm just going to call the master user admin, and I'll give that master user a password, and that password has to be at least eight characters long. 
So once we've completed that, we've put in our name of our database, we've put in our username for the master user of this database or this database server, and we've put in our master password and we've confirmed that password, we click on next step. Now, we don't need to configure any of these advanced settings for network and security. We just leave the default settings as they are, but as we get more into RDS and other services later on in the course, we'll be getting more involved in this sort of stuff. But for now, we just want to just get our uh, dip our toes in the water or so uh, with AWS. Now, we have an option to create a database on launch with this database server. So we're just going to create a database called test. If we leave it blank, then there'll be no databases on this database server and we can create those later on. But, but we'll just have one ready to go and we'll call it test. Now we don't need to worry about backups because this is just a lab. We're going to be doing it on the, uh, on the free tier. We just don't want to have any hassle with that. So I'm just going to change the backup retention period to zero and that will mean that it will disable automated backups for the instance. We don't need to worry about monitoring or maintenance. We just leave that as it is. Again, this is just a, a hands-on introduction to RDS. And then we can launch that DB instance. After a certain amount of time, that will be acknowledged and we can view our DB instances. And we can see there that it has a status of creating and after a while it will go to being available for use. Okay, so after a few minutes, or quite a few minutes, we've got our MySQL database server on RDS up and running and its status is available. So the thing that we need to understand here is that we can now connect through to this RDS instance through an endpoint. And that endpoint is here. So we need to take note of that. And the, the part that we're interested in is the endpoint domain. So everything there, finishing with amazonaws.com and we don't do the colon double three oh six we just select that so i'm just going to select that now because we're going to be using that later on now before we do that we need something we need some software to connect into our mysql instance so we need to go to the mysql homepage and then and there is a link in the lab notes to this to download the mysql workbench and install it to our system. Okay, so here I am in the MySQL workbench and down the bottom there we can see that we have the MySQL connections and we don't have any as yet so we just click on the plus sign next to it and we'll add our connection to our RDS instance. So we just give that a, a name. So I'm just going to call it Backspace, that will be fine. Now a host name is going to be that connection string that we got or that domain that we got from our RDS console. And it's not going to have the colon double three oh six on the end of it. It's just going to have the domain details, the host name details. And the double three oh six is our port number, which is already detailed there on the screen. Now, our username is going to be that master user that we set up when we created our RDS instance and, and I used admin. And that is all that we need. We just need a user, we need a host name, and we need the port that we're connecting on. So if we just test that connection now, it will ask for a password. And we've successfully made that MySQL connection. So we just click on OK and we can add that to there. So once we've created that connection, we can obviously connect into our database. So all we need to do is double click on that. And there we have, we've connected into our RDS database and we've got our MySQL or our SQL dashboard there set up. Now, if we look down here under schemas, we can see that we have that test database that we created or that we requested to be created in our launch configure or when we're doing our uh, configuration for our launch details of this RDS instance. So if we click on that on that information icon next to test, 
that will give us some information on that. Okay, and there we can see we've got our backspace database with a test schema in there. So our, our server backspace and our test database inside there. So there, there we have it. We've successfully created an RDS instance and we've connected into it using MySQL Workbench, which is pretty great. Now that you've successfully connected in using the MySQL Workbench, I'm going to show you how to connect in with the MySQL shell software and that will allow you to do command line work uh, such as issuing uh, SQL commands to your RDS instance. So the first thing we need to do is to install or download the MySQL shell and there is a link in the lab notes to that URL to do that. Now when you get there just scroll down, uh, select your operating system. If you're on Windows don't do this uh, this installer for Windows. It will install MySQL and all this stuff you don't really need. Uh, all we need is this 16 and a half meg file down the bottom here. So just download that. If you're on a Mac, uh, it will look something like this. So you will have a DMG archive that you, you can download and extract after you've downloaded. Okay, so now that we're in the MySQL shell, we can connect into our RDS instance. So the way that we do that is we do backslash, not forward slash, backslash, connect. And then we do our username, which was admin. And then we do at, and then we do that uh, that endpoint, our RDS endpoint. So we just jump back into the RDS console. We'll select that endpoint and copy it and bring it over. Now we don't have to worry about removing the colon double three oh six. We can leave it there, or we can take it off, and it will default to double three oh six anyway. We enter our password that we created, and that should connect us in in a short amount of time. And there we go. Now what I'd like to do is just issue some SQL commands to the database. So I need to change to SQL mode. So again, we do backslash SQL. And I can issue a command now, so show databases. Now make sure that you put a semicolon on the end of your SQL commands, otherwise they're just going to hang there. And then we can see we've got our, our standard MySQL databases there, and down the bottom we've got our test database that was created for us by the RDS service. Now the test database will be empty, so I'm just going to select one of the system databases there, so the MySQL one will be fine. So I just do use, and then that schema or that database that I'm going to use, so MySQL will be the one that I use. And there we go, schema is set to MySQL. Now, when you do that command, make sure that you don't put the semicolon on the end of it, otherwise it'll hang again. Now I just want to issue another SQL command again, so we can show schemas this time. Or well, actually no, we'll show tables actually. And that will list the tables for the MySQL database. And there you go, so there's all those standard tables that you would have in there. So we've managed to connect in using the command line interface or the shell, MySQL shell, and we've switched over to the SQL mode and we've run SQL commands. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump back into the AWS RDS console and we're going to delete all this to make sure that we don't get a bill at the end of the month. And back in the RDS console we go to, or we first of all we select our MySQL instance, we go to instance actions and then we go to delete. We don't want to create a final snapshot and then we click the acknowledgement that we won't be able to get this back after we've deleted and we click on delete. And that will be deleting and eventually it will disappear from the screen if we keep refreshing the screen here. So there we have it. Uh, we've created that instance and we've connected in and now we're cleaning it all up afterwards. So I look forward to seeing you in the next lab.
Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the different management services on AWS. We'll then finish up with a hands-on lab where we'll use the CloudWatch service to implement a billing alert on our account. CloudFormation allows you to use a text file to define your infrastructure and to use this text file to deploy resources on the AWS cloud. This allows for the defining of your infrastructure as code and you can manage your infrastructure with the same version control tools that you use to manage your code. The AWS Service Catalog allows enterprises to catalog resources that can be deployed on the AWS cloud. This allows an enterprise to achieve common governance and compliance for its IT resources by clearly defining what is allowed to be deployed on the AWS cloud. AWS CloudWatch is a monitoring service for AWS cloud resources and applications that are deployed on the AWS cloud. It can be used for triggering scaling operations, or it can also be used for providing insight into your deployed resources. AWS Systems Manager provides a unified user interface that allows you to view operational data from multiple AWS services and to automate tasks across your AWS resources. That helps to shorten the time to detect and resolve operational problems. AWS CloudTrail monitors and logs AWS account activity, including actions taken through the AWS Management Console, the AWS Software Development Kits, the Command Line Tools, and other AWS services. So this greatly simplifies security analysis of the activity of users of your account. AWS Config enables you to assess, audit, and evaluate the configurations of your AWS resources. This simplifies compliance auditing, security analysis, change management and control, and also operational troubleshooting. AWS OpsWorks provides managed instances of Chef and Puppet. Chef and Puppet can be used to configure and automate the deployment of AWS resources. AWS Trusted Advisor is an online expert system that can analyze your AWS account and the resources inside it, and then advise you on how to achieve high security and best performance from those resources. Okay, let's have a go at using one of these management services. We're going to use a billing and cost management console and the CloudWatch service to create a billing alert and that will notify us when our account has exceeded a budgeted amount. And it will do that using the simple notification service. And we'll learn more about the SNS in the next lecture. Okay, so starting off in the AWS Management Console, the first thing that we need to do is that we need to enable billing alerts on our account. So we go to our account up here and we select my billing dashboard. So from our billing and cost management dashboard, we'll scroll down and we'll go to billing preferences. And just make sure that you've got here that you're going to receive your invoices by email. And you'll also see a checks box here, which is already checked for me because I've already enabled this, but for you, it won't be. So you need to click on this checkbox. Uh, it will then uh, set up a process for you to authorize billing alerts to be received on your email address. So then you just simply save preferences. Once we've enabled our billing alerts on our account, then we can go into the CloudWatch service. So go to services and then CloudWatch. And what we can do is we can set up an alarm that is going to be triggered whenever our account exceeds a certain level in dollars. So we just go to alarms and we create an alarm here. We need to select a metric and we have a number of metrics to select from. The ones that we want are billing. Now, if you find that your screen doesn't look like this, 
It is not that the video is wrong. It is not that the lab notes are wrong. It is that you are not in the US East North Virginia region. That is the only region that you can be in to set up billing alerts on your account. So we click on billing. And the one we want to look for is total estimated charge. So we'll click on that. We'll select US dollars and we'll select that metric. Now what we need to do is we need to specify the conditions around how this alarm is going to be triggered and what's going to happen when that alarm is triggered. So we specify the metric and conditions. So we'll just scroll down. So it's going to be a static one. So it's going to be triggered whenever the value exceeds a certain limit. So it's going to be whenever it is greater than, and we'll just put in there 10 US dollars because pretty well everything that we're doing so far will be on the free tier. So if we get anything going above $10, that should alert us to being a problem. And we'll click on next. So now we're going to come to where we need to configure the actions for this alarm. So what is going to happen when this alarm is triggered? What's going to happen when our account exceeds $10? So what we need to select is that in alarm. So whenever it exceeds this level, it's going to go into an alarm. So what happens when it goes into an alarm state? We're going to create a new SNS topic or simple notification service topic. And what that will do is it will allow us to receive emails whenever this billing alert occurs. So we're just going to create a new topic We'll give it a name there, that will do. And we're just going to put in our email address there. And we create that topic. So what is going to, go, what is going to happen now is that you will receive an email from AWS to authenticate or validate that that email is actually yours. So if you go to your email account, And there we can see that we've got a, an email that's come from Amazon and we just need to confirm that subscription. So if we click on that and that will confirm that subscription. So AWS need to make sure that the email that is on there is actually an email that you are responsible for or that you own. So we'll just close out of that. So we'll just scroll down. We don't need to do anything else here. We just need to click on next. We'll just give our alarm a name and a description. We don't actually need to give it a description. I'll just leave that empty. It's pretty self-explanatory what this is. And we'll click on next. So that will detail now a preview of what's going to happen and the conditions around how it is going to be triggered and that we're going to give it a name there, P Cody Billing Alert. Of course, yours will be different to that. So let's create that alarm. Okay, so that alarm has been created. When this is first created, you will get insufficient data because it takes time uh, for CloudWatch to actually receive information. So it's going to monitor this and then within six hours, it's going to make an assessment as to whether that billing alert should be triggered. And from there, if it is triggered, if it goes over that, that level that you've defined there of $10, then you will receive an email that will come from the simple notification service. Okay, so after a, a little bit of time, so in this situation, my account is already well and truly over that $10 limit, and so it's gone into an in alarm state. And at the same time, I have received an email from AWS telling me that there is a, a, a problem with my account. It has exceeded that $10 billing alert limit. So that's how easy it is to actually set up a billing alert on your account. And it is something that you should always do because you don't want any nasty surprises. Like I said, everything that we're doing so far will be on the free tier and we'll learn more about that free tier, what is on the free tier and what is not. 
So if something is not on the free tier, you need to make sure that you clean it up afterwards so that you don't get a bill at the end of the month. But if you forget, billing alerts are a great way to basically stop you from getting a big bill at the end of the month. So that brings us to an end, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the compute and networking services of AWS. We'll then have a look at some examples, and finally, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab where we're going to deploy a WordPress web server using the Amazon EC2 service. Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2 for short, provides virtual servers in the AWS cloud. You can launch one or thousands of instances simultaneously and only pay for what you use. There's a broad range of instance types with varying compute and memory capabilities, and those will be optimized for different use cases. Amazon EC2 auto-scaling allows you to dynamically scale your Amazon EC2 capacity up or down automatically according to conditions that you define. It can scale up or down by launching or terminating instances based on demand. It can also perform health checks on those instances and replace them when they become unhealthy. Amazon LightSail, it's the easiest way to launch virtual servers running applications in the AWS cloud. AWS will provision everything you need, including DNS management and storage, to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Amazon Elastic Container Service, or ECS for short, is a highly scalable, high-performance container management service for Docker containers. The containers, they will run on a managed cluster of EC2 instances. AWS Lambda is a serverless service and lets you run code in the AWS cloud without having to worry about provisioning or managing that service. You just upload your code and AWS takes care of everything for you. So let's have a look at how we could use these services to deploy a web server in the AWS cloud. Here we have the AWS cloud and our virtual private cloud or VPC located inside that. And remember, a VPC is our own private space within the AWS cloud. And no one can enter that unless we allow them to enter it. We can launch an EC2 instance and that can be running our web application, for example, WordPress. So what happens if this single EC2 instance becomes overwhelmed by demand? For example, we might have released a new product and our WordPress application cannot deliver the web pages quickly enough to satisfy that. What we could do is that we could tear down that instance and put in a bigger instance that could handle that demand. And that is called vertical scaling. And that used to be all the rage 10, 20 years ago. But the problem is that it takes time to do that. And while we're doing that, our application is not running. And also what happens when the demand goes back down again? Do we have to tear that down and then put in a smaller instance? And what happens if that happens every day? What happens if that happens every hour? It's just not going to be economical for us to do that. What we can do is that we can horizontally scale. And we do that by adding more instances. And as demand goes up, we add more instances. And as demand goes down, we terminate those instances. And that way, we still have continuity of our application. Our application will always be running because there's always going to be at least one EC2 instance to look after the demand. One problem with this architecture is that it has multiple endpoints for our web server. And that's not practical because customers are not going to go to one endpoint until that stops working and then go to another one and then another one. It's just not going to work like that. And obviously their bookmarks in their browser are not going to be valid. 
So we need a way of having one single endpoint for that web application that our customer can go to, and then having a way of distributing those requests to a EC2 instance that is available. That is where elastic load balancing comes in. So it can receive traffic from our end users, and it will distribute that traffic to an EC2 instance that is available. So a request will come in, it will distribute it to an available EC2 instance. Another request will come in and it will distribute it to a different EC2 instance that is available. And it will balance the load across those EC2 instances. And if one of those EC2 instances become unhealthy, it will fail a health check with the elastic load balancer. And then the elastic load balancer will no longer send traffic to that unhealthy EC2 instance. But what happens if that demand is only for a short period of time, for example, half an hour? What do we do then? It's not going to be practical for us to terminate instances when demand goes down and then launch instances manually when that occurs. We can't do that every hour. It's not going to be practical. And that's where the auto scaling service comes in. It can launch EC2 instances automatically when the demand on those instances increases. And it can terminate automatically EC2 instances when the demand on those instances goes down. It can also perform health checks on those instances. And if one of those instances becomes unhealthy for whatever reason, it can replace that instance with a healthy instance, and it will do that automatically without you having to do anything at all. So now we'll have a look at the networking and content delivery services. Amazon CloudFront is a global content delivery network, or CDN for short, that securely delivers your frequently requested content to over 100 edge locations across the globe. And by doing this, it achieves low latency and high transfer speeds for your end users. It also provides protection against DDoS attacks. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC for short, lets you provision a logically isolated section of the AWS cloud. And you can launch AWS resources in that virtual network that you yourself define. And this is your own personal private space within the AWS cloud, and no one can enter it unless you allow them to enter it. AWS Direct Connect is a high-speed dedicated network connection to AWS. Enterprises can use it to establish a private connection to the AWS cloud in situations where a standard internet connection won't be adequate. AWS Elastic Load Balancing, or ELB for short, automatically distributes incoming traffic for your application across multiple EC2 instances and also in multiple availability zones. So if one availability zone goes down, the traffic will still go to the other availability zone and your application will continue to deliver responses to requests. It also allows you to achieve high availability and fault tolerance by distributing traffic evenly amongst those instances. And it can also bypass unhealthy instances. Amazon Route 53 is a highly available and scalable domain name system, or DNS for short. And it can handle direct traffic for your domain name and direct that traffic to your back-end web server. Amazon API Gateway is a fully managed service that makes it easy for developers to create and deploy secure application programming interfaces, or APIs, at any scale. It handles all of the tasks involved in accepting and processing up to hundreds of thousands of concurrent API calls. It's a serverless service, and as such, you don't need to worry about the underlying infrastructure. AWS looks after everything for you. 
So let's have a look at an example of how we can use these networking services of AWS. So here we've got the architecture that we looked at before in the compute section. But one thing we didn't mention was availability zones. So let's just say that we've launched that architecture in a single availability zone. What happens if that availability zone goes down? What happens to our traffic? Our traffic has nowhere to go and our application stops delivering responses to requests. That is why it's always desirable to have our architecture distributed across multiple availability zones. That way, if one availability zone goes down, the other one will continue to operate and the infrastructure within that other availability zone will continue to respond to requests. We can launch EC2 instances in multiple availability zones and our elastic load balancing service can distribute that traffic across multiple availability zones as well. So if one availability zone goes down, the elastic load balancer will continue to distribute traffic to the availability zone that is still healthy and to those instances in that availability zone that are still healthy as well. So let's just say our application running on these EC2 instances is a WordPress web server. And that contains lots of images and lots of video that is static content. It's not really changing that much. And it's not efficient for us to continue to keep delivering that from our EC2 instances. We would like somewhere to put that where it can be delivered with high speed and low latency and to take the load off our EC2 instances. That is where the CloudFront Content Delivery Network, or CDN, comes in. So we can get these large images and large videos that are not really changing that often, and we can put that in a CloudFront distribution. And CloudFront will cache that and distribute that across hundreds of edge locations across the globe. So when your end user requests that video or those images, it will be delivered to them with really high speed and low latency. And at the same time, it's going to take the load off your EC2 instances and is going to significantly reduce your costs. At the same time, dynamic content that is changing regularly, CloudFront can forward those requests over to the Elastic Load Balancer, which will then forward them to an EC2 instance. So that way, you have the best of both worlds. You have dynamic content delivered as a dynamic content. And at the same time, you have these large videos and images that aren't really changing that often delivered very rapidly. Now that CloudFront service or that CloudFront distribution will have its own DNS name that we can put into a browser and we can directly access that. The problem with that is that that DNS name for that CloudFront distribution will be something very complicated and just won't mean anything to our end user at all. So we would prefer to have our end user type in a domain name and have the request for that domain name forwarded to that CloudFront service. As you can see here, we've got example.com and that is where Route 53 domain name service can come in. So Route 53 will grab those requests for your domain, example.com, and it will forward those requests over to the CloudFront service and the CloudFront service will handle it from then on. So let's just say we work for a large enterprise that has its own corporate data center. And the reason it's got its own corporate data center is because that is located where the employees work. And we don't want our employees to be slowed down by a network. We want them to be able to work efficiently. But at the same time, we have resources on the AWS cloud that those employees also need to access. So we need some way of having a high speed connection between our corporate data center and the AWS cloud. And that is where 
the AWS Direct Connect service comes in, and that can provide a very high speed fiber optic network between our corporate data center and the AWS cloud, and that is completely private. Okay, so that's a very complicated architecture, and don't be too concerned if that's very overwhelming, because if you're going on to become a cloud practitioner, you're not going to need to really be able to produce this yourself. As an associate level uh, certification, that is a different story. You'd be expected to create this yourself. But cloud practitioner, you'll need to know what these services do. You'll need to know that Route 53 will forward requests for your domain name to a backend endpoint. CloudFront will distribute your content to hundreds of edge locations across the globe. Elastic Load Balancer will receive requests and distribute those requests to multiple instances across multiple availability zones. A virtual private cloud is your private space within the AWS cloud. The AWS Direct Connect is a high speed fiber optic network connection between an on-premises corporate data center and the AWS cloud. If you understand that, then you're well on your way to passing the cloud practitioner exam. Okay, so coming up next, we're going to have a lab. So make sure that you download the introduction to AWS lab notes that come with this course. So what we're going to do is that we're going to launch an EC2 instance and we're going to select an Amazon machine image of a WordPress web server. And that will allow us to deploy a WordPress server on the AWS cloud. And then we're going to be able to go to our browser and view our website that was created by that EC2 instance. And we're going to do that all through the AWS management console on our desktop computer. Okay, so in the AWS management console, we go to services, we go into compute services and we select EC2. Now that will take us into the EC2 dashboard. If you've never used EC2 before, you might be presented with a welcome screen, but just go to instances on the menu here and click on instances. And we're going to launch an instance. Now we first need to select an Amazon machine image or an AMI. And that is a template that contains the software configuration, the operating system, application server, and applications that are required to launch an EC2 instance. We can select an AMI provided by AWS from the AWS user community or from the AWS marketplace. Or we could also select our own AMI if we've created an AMI uh, previously, which we obviously haven't. So we're going to go into the AWS marketplace and we're going to search for a WordPress AMI. So they're the uh, WordPress powered by Bitnami. That will be fine for us to use, so we'll select that one. And we're going to select the T2 micro instance because it is free tier eligible, which means that if we create this instance and then we shut it down afterwards, we're not going to get billed because it's on the free tier. We, we have a whole heap of other options that we can do but we're just going to go into the configured instance details. And the only thing that we need to change here is to auto assign a public IP. So we need to have a public IP for a public IP address for this EC2 instance so that it can have a presence on the internet and so that we can access it through a web browser. Now, there are a whole heap of other options that we can look at but this is really just an introduction to AWS. We're going to do something very simple and the most simple thing that we can do right now. We're not going to get into discussing any of this stuff because we're going to go into quite in-depth detail on the EC2 service and VPC and a whole heap of other stuff further through the course. So for now, we're just going to click on review and launch and accept everything that we've got there. And we just click on launch. And instead of choosing a key pair, we're going to proceed without a key pair. And a key pair is used to 
connect directly into our EC2 server. And we're not going to be doing that. So we're not going to be connecting into the Linux operating system. But normally you would. And normally you would download a key pair and you would use that to connect into uh, your Linux server. But for now, we're not going to do that. And we just acknowledge that we will not be able to connect to this instance uh, because we don't have a key pair. And we launch the instance. So after a certain amount of time, it will be it will go through its process and will be returned to the EC2 dashboard. And there we go. So uh, we just click on View Instances. And our instance will come up with a status of pending. OK, so after a few minutes, our EC2 instance status has, or its instance state, has changed to running. And that means that we should be able to see our, our web server on the internet. So if, we, if we've selected this instance and we look at the details for this instance, so we go down here and we can see that it has been assigned a public IP address. So in our, in our, when we're configuring our launch for this, we did select to uh, create a public IP and that is a public IP address that has been created. So if we go to that, we should be able to see our WordPress application. Okay, and there is our WordPress application and looks great. So we can't really do much with it now because we need to be able to administer our, our WordPress application. You need to be able to log into this site and put web pages on it and whatever. So the people at Bitnami, what they've done is that when this EC2 instance launched, they created a username and password and they embedded that in the logs of our EC2 server. So when it was launching, there will be a number of logs that will output information. So we just need to go into those logs. So we'll go back into the EC2 management console. Again, we've selected our EC2 instance. We'll go to actions. We'll go to instance settings and we're going to get the system log. Okay, so there's the system log. If it first doesn't come up, you just need to give it a bit of time. Just go away, have a cup of coffee, come back, and the, the system log will be there. It doesn't automatically just come up straight away. It just Sometimes it does take a bit of a while to come up. So we just scroll down until we find the section where it has our details. So here we can see uh, we're setting the Bitnami application password to that. So we just need to copy that password. So we just copy and we'll just close out of this. Now if we go back into into our users blog or into our blog there and we just go to that IP address again and we go to admin and that'll take us to the admin section and we'll need to put in a username. So the user will be user and then we just need to paste in that password and log in. Okay, so there you can see, well, we won't remember that password. So there you can see that we've logged into our administration page of our WordPress application. So we can do whatever we want. We can, you know, we can add some pages in here. We can go into pages, uh, add, add new page if we want. Uh, we can do whatever we want as we would uh, with any WordPress application. So that's how we launch an EC2 instance or an EC2 server to create a web server. Now, now that we've achieved that and we've created these resources, we're not going to need them anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of them. We're going to delete them all and terminate these instances. So what we'll do is go back into the EC2 management console. We'll go into actions and then we're going to go to instant state and we're going to terminate that instance. And it's just giving us a warning saying that, you know, do you really want to do this? Yes, we do. So yes, terminate. Okay, so after a certain amount of time, and it will take quite a bit of time, that will go from shutting down to terminated. So that's all that we need to do now. So again, there's a lot more to the EC2 service that you need to know. But for now, I think you've got a good idea of how it all works. So it's now your turn to go to go and grab the lab notes and do it all yourself and I'll see you in the next one.
welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the application integration and customer engagement services. We'll then have a look at some examples, and finally, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab where we're going to use the SES service to send an email. AWS Step Functions makes it easy to coordinate the components of distributed applications and microservices using a visual workflow. For example, you may want a second function to always follow the first and only run if and when the first succeeds. And you may want to execute two functions in parallel, for example. You define your application visually as a series of steps. You define the process flow of those steps, and then you can deploy your application automatically. Amazon Simple Workflow Service works in a similar way to step functions in coordinating multiple components of a business process. For new applications, it's recommended to use step functions, not the SWF service. Amazon Simple Notification Service, or SNS for short, is a flexible, fully managed pub-sub messaging service. What that means is that you can create a topic and users subscribe to that topic, and when you publish a message to the topic, the users that have subscribed to that topic will receive that message. It can also be used for push notifications for mobile devices. Amazon Simple Queue Service, or SQS for short, is a fully managed message queuing service, and that makes it easy to decouple your applications from demand. What that means is that it allows messages to build up in a queue until the processing server that processes those messages can catch up with the demand. So let's have a look at an example of using these services to decouple our application from its demand. So let's just say we have an application and it's running on an auto-scaling group of EC2 instances. And that application is a process server. It's not a web server, it's processing messages as they come in. And those messages could have information on an image that needs to be processed or a video that needs to be processed or a cryptography problem that needs to be solved. And so those messages come in and as that demand increases or the number of messages coming in increases, then the auto-scaling group will also add more instances to cope with that increasing demand. So what happens if that increase in demand occurs over a one second period? And that is a very large spike. Our auto-scaling group cannot handle that sort of scenario because it's going to take at least five or 10 minutes for instances to launch and be up and running. So what happens in the meantime is a problem for us. In a similar way that a bank has a queue, and so when people come into a bank and the teller is too busy to serve them, they can build up in a queue until such point in time that the teller can reach them. We can do the same thing with the SQS, or Simple Queue Service. We can let those messages come in and they can build up in a queue until such time that our auto-scaling group of EC2 instances can get to that queue and empty out the queue. And that is great because we have now decoupled our demand from our application. And so if spikes come in, our application can handle it. But what happens when the average demand exceeds what our capacity is? So I'll give you an example. So we've got our bank and all of a sudden we had five tellers and four of those tellers have become sick. They've got influenza or whatever. But the same amount of people are coming through the door and the queue is going to build up and build up and the queue will never decrease. It will continue to increase in size indefinitely. The same thing can happen in this architecture. For example, we might have a whole heap of unhealthy instances and all of a sudden our capacity cannot meet demand and so that SQS queue is going to grow indefinitely. Or we may have done an update to our application that is faulty and that SQS queue continues to increase. So what we can do is that we can set up a CloudWatch metric and that will alert us 
with an SNS email notification that our SQS queue is continuing to grow and that we need to investigate that further. Now, normally we would use a metric on the instances to signal that those instances are overloaded and we need to increase our capacity of our autoscaling group. Now, in this situation, that's probably not going to happen because these messages are just going to build up in the queue. And so we need a way of notifying the auto-scaling service that the queue is increasing. And the way we can do that is with, a, again, a CloudWatch metric that will alert the auto-scaling group that the SQS queue is too big and to put on more instances to reduce the size of the queue. And at the same time, when the queue is empty, CloudWatch can send a metric to the auto-scaling group to reduce the number of instances and terminate those so that we're not wasting those resources. Let's have a look at some customer engagement services. Amazon Connect is a self-service contact center in the AWS cloud, and that is delivered on a pay-as-you-go pricing model. It has a drag-and-drop graphical user interface, and that allows you to create process flows that define customer interactions without having any coding at all. Amazon Pinpoint allows you to send email, SMS, and mobile push messages for targeted marketing campaigns, as well as direct messages to your individual customers, for example, an order confirmation. Amazon Simple Email Service, or SES for short, is a cloud-based bulk email sending service. And coming up next, we're going to be doing a lab using the Simple Email Service to send an email. So make sure that you download the introduction to AWS Lab Notes, and let's get into it. In the AWS Management Console, we go to Services. And over on the right-hand side here, we've got Messaging Services. We click on SES. And the first thing we need to do is that we need to verify our email address. So we just go to Email Addresses, and we'll put in a, or we click on here to verify a new email address. And then we click on Verify this email address. So what's happened now is that AWS has sent an email to us to verify our email. Once we click on that link, uh, we'll be able to continue to use the SES service. Okay, so when you've clicked on the verification link to the email, you'll get a uh, congratulations message that you've verified your email. So just click out of that and go back into the SES management console. If we refresh the screen, we can see that it has now been verified. So what we can do now is that we can send a test email. So just click on send a test email. We'll put in, what I'm going to do is just send a message from myself to myself so that I don't have to uh, verify any further or any additional email addresses. And just put the subject as test. Let's copy that over. And we'll send that test email. And that will be happening. And so what we can do is we'll go into our email account and we'll see that that test email will have been sent. Okay, so I've just gone and checked my email account and yes, that test email went through fine. Now, you might be questioning, what do we do now? It's one thing to send a single email, but that's not much good to us. We want to send out bulk email. Now, obviously sending out bulk email uh, is, well, it can be, can be spam. So AWS are mindful of that, and so there is an, a process that you have to go through to apply to use the SES service to, uh, to send out bulk email. So the way you do that is you're going to, uh, just going to send in, send in statistics here, and you can see there is a link there to request a sending limit increase. So just reading off there, so your Amazon SES account has sandback, sandbox access uh, in region US East Virginia. Uh, and so that is very limited to, to what you can do. Uh, and so if you're going to be using this uh, in, for example, in, in an enterprise application, then you would want to go there and uh, request a sending limit increase. 
And so just click on that and it'll take you to uh, a form that you fill out uh, with all your details and, uh, and you just submit that to the AWS support department and they will make that happen for you. So that's all I need to show you now on the SES uh, service and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we're going to be running through some of the analytics and machine learning services on AWS. Amazon Elastic MapReduce, or EMR for short, is AWS's Hadoop framework as a service. You can also run other frameworks in Amazon EMR that integrate with Hadoop, such as Apache Spark, HBase, Presto, and Flink. Data can be analyzed by EMR in a number of AWS data stores, including Amazon S3 and Amazon DynamoDB. Amazon Athena allows you to analyze data stored in an Amazon S3 bucket using standard SQL statements. Amazon Elasticsearch is a fully managed service for Elastic.co's Elasticsearch framework. This allows high-speed querying and analysis of data that is stored on AWS. Amazon Kinesis allows you to collect, process, and analyze real-time streaming data. Amazon QuickSight is a business intelligence reporting tool, similar to Tableau, or if you're a Java programmer, similar to BERT, and is fully managed by AWS. So let's have a look at some of the machine learning services on AWS. AWS DeepLens is a deep learning enabled video camera. It has a deep learning software development kit that allows you to create advanced vision system applications. Amazon SageMaker is AWS's flagship machine learning product. It allows you to build and train your own machine learning models and then deploy them to the AWS cloud and use them as a back end for your applications. Amazon Recognition provides deep learning based analysis of video and images. Amazon Lex allows you to build conversational chatbots. These can be used in many applications such as first line support for customers. Amazon Polly provides natural sounding text to speech. Amazon Comprehend can use deep learning to analyze text for insights and relationships. This can be used for customer analysis or for advanced searching of documents. Amazon Translate can use machine learning to accurately translate text to a number of different languages. Amazon Transcribe is an automatic speech recognition service that can analyze audio files that are stored in Amazon S3 and then return the transcribed text. Okay, so let's have a look at using one of these machine learning services, Amazon Recognition, for analyzing some image and video. Machine learning on AWS is one of the coolest things you can do on AWS. And Amazon Recognition is a service that just absolutely blows my mind away. The reason I say that is that 30 years ago, I used to be a young engineer and I was working in the industrial robotics industry. And back then we had a vision system that could recognize from a black and white image the difference, the difference between a triangle and a square. And back then, that was really groundbreaking stuff. And I look now over the last 30 years and where we are now compared to where we were back then, which is just unbelievable. And the potential for this stuff is absolutely beyond belief. Okay, let's get into it. It's services and then to Amazon recognition or it's R for just plain old recognition without the Amazon. So we scroll down to recognition. That'll take us into the recognition management console. And we'll try a demo. 
So this will take us into a lot of different demonstrations of the, of the power of this Amazon recognition. So here we can see we've got a sample image of a guy on a skateboard doing a flip. And Amazon recognition has analyzed this object in this scene, in this, in this picture, and it's identified that there's a 99.2% probability that there's a skateboard there. And there's the person's a human being. He's playing a sport. Um, we can see a lot more here. He's in a parking lot. Maybe not. He's on a road, but close enough. There's cars there. He's on a road. There's buildings. So you can see there's a lot of stuff that has been picked up in that image. So how does it get there? So if we want to use this ourselves, we need to send a request to the Amazon Recognition API. Or we can do that through the one of the many software development kits that are offered by AWS. So if we had, for example, the JavaScript SDK, we would have a function there that we could send this request off to. So what does a request look like? So we can see here, we're going to uh, have our object that's in a bucket. We're going to provide the bucket name. And we're also going to provide uh, the name of the object that is our image. When we send that off to AWS recognition, it comes back with a response. And here it is. It'll come back with all of the labels that it's picked up. It's picked up a skateboard with 99.2% confidence. And there you can see there's a whole heap of stuff that, is a pick, that it has picked up from that object and scene detection. Okay, so let's see how it works with an image we give it. So we'll click on Upload and we'll upload our own image. I'm just going to get a picture of an elephant and upload that. And so you can see quite quickly it's analyzed that image. It's found an animal, an elephant, some wildlife. And that's pretty cool. So let's have a look at the other one. So we've got image moderation. So what this does is it automatically detects explicit content. So for something for a, uh, a children's site, you might want to moderate the images that are being uploaded to that, to that site. And so this is a great way to do it. So we can see here we've got a family, a family image. So we just click on View Content. And we can see that it, it's come back with nothing, absolutely nothing. So we look at the, re the response, and it comes back with moderation labels, nothing. The reason it came back with nothing is that it's found nothing that is explicit or suggestive adult content. So let's have a look at the other one of the girl in the bikini. And so there we can see that we have a female swimwear or underwear, 98.7% probability that that is there. And so that's a great tool that, you know, if you really want to, uh, you know, look after children, if you've got a kid's website, this is a, a great way to do it. So let's have a look at facial analysis. This is a quite a good one. So we can see there that we've got a girl. She's got her sunglasses on, but it still recognizes that it's a girl. Uh, it still recognizes that she's smiling. She's wearing sunglasses. And there's a whole heap of information. Her eyes are open even. It can tell with sunglasses on. I don't know how it does that. Uh, mouth is open. Uh, and there's a whole heap of stuff there that, that it analyzed. And we can see here, it can do the same for multiple faces. And you can see that there's a male there. And so we can select each different one. So we can select this one, and it says it appears to, appears to be female, 100%. 11 to 18 years old. Uh, this one here, 23 to 38 years old. So it's, it's quite amazing that it can tell the difference in ages of people from an image. And it can also identify people. So here is where it's identifying from its, uh, its database of celebrities. We've got Jeff Bezos from Amazon. And we've got Andy Jassy from AWS. And so it's got 100% match confidence there. So we're going to do this ourselves. I'm just going to upload a, a, an image of a couple of celebrities and see whether it can do it for us as well. Okay, so it's, it's had a look at that image and it's identified that Keith Urban and Nicole Kidman are in that image with 100% competence. I reckon that's pretty amazing, actually. But hey, that's the whole thing about facial recognition is that we're in a whole different world now that computers can recognize who we are. So let's have a look at face comparison. 
So here we have an image on the left of a girl and an image of the same girl with a group of other girls. And here we can see that it's identified a 98% probability that they are the same girl. And it's not the other two girls. We can do the same with a different image. And so here we can see that it's identified that it is a girl on the right. Let's have a look at another one. And it has found that girl as well in the other image. And it's, and it's uh, identified that she's not the other two girls. So again, the facial recognition is really quite powerful. Let's have a look at text in image. So here we can see it's picked up text from an image. And it's picked up the number plate on a car. So obviously, there's a lot of stuff that can happen here. You know, it's obviously, if you're going to be having a toll on a, on a bridge or something like that, great service for doing that. Let's have a look at video analysis. Okay, so here's a, a video. Um, I'll just play it. You can see there's just a, uh, a video from AWS Live. And it has picked up that there are two people here and two of them are celebrities. They're both celebrities. So let's have a look at that. So we've got those two celebrities and it's identified. There we go, Mr. Vogels and Mr. Besos. And it's also identified some objects in there. So it's picked up the furniture and the chair and uh, that someone's wearing it and someone's got a beard. Uh, and it's picked up quite a bit. So that brings us to the end of this little run through of Amazon recognition. And by all means, open it up and have a play around with it yourself and try and think about what you can do with it. Because remember, this is, uh, if you're a developer, uh, you can use this as a back end by just using the JavaScript SDK, which interfaces nicely with this. Uh, and you can, you know, the, you can come up with some really interesting ideas for applications. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we'll have a look at the security, identity, and compliance services of AWS. Now, this is a very important category of AWS, and as such, there is a very broad selection of products that are available. Once we've done that, we'll finish up with a hands-on lab using the identity and access management service. AWS Artifact is an online portal that provides access to AWS security and compliance documentation. And that documentation can be readily available when needed for auditing and compliance purposes. AWS Certificate Manager issues SSL certificates for HTTPS communication with your website. It integrates with AWS services such as Route 53 and CloudFront. And the certificates that are provisioned through AWS Certificate Manager are completely free. Amazon Cloud Directory is a cloud-based directory service that can have hierarchies of data in multiple dimensions, unlike conventional LDAP-based directory services that can only have a single hierarchy. AWS Directory Service is a fully managed Microsoft Active Directory service in the AWS Cloud. AWS Cloud HSM is a dedicated hardware security module in the AWS cloud. This allows you to achieve corporate and regulatory compliance while at the same time greatly reducing your costs over using your own HSM in your own infrastructure. Amazon Cognito provides sign-in and sign-up capability for your web and mobile applications. You can also integrate that sign-up process with external OAuth providers such as Google and Facebook and also SAML2 providers as well. AWS Identity and Access Management, or IAM for short, allows you to manage user access to your AWS services and resources in your account. Users and groups of users have individual permissions that allow or deny access to your resources. AWS Organizations provides policy-based management for multiple AWS accounts. 
This is great for large organizations that have multiple accounts and they want to manage those and the users that use those accounts centrally. Amazon Inspector is an automated security assessment service. It can help to identify vulnerabilities or areas of improvement within your AWS account. AWS Key Management Service, or KMS for short, makes it easy to create and control encryption keys for your encrypted data, and it also uses hardware security modules to secure your keys. It's integrated well with AWS services such as Amazon S3, Redshift, and EBS. AWS Shield provides protection against distributed denial of service, or DDoS for short, protection against DDoS attacks. The standard version of AWS Shield is implemented automatically on all AWS accounts. Web Application Firewall, or WAF for short, is a web application firewall that sits in front of your website to provide additional protection against common attacks such as SQL injection and cross-side scripting. It has different sets of rules that can be used for different applications. Now let's have a look at using one of the core AWS security services, Identity and Access Management, or IAM. Now, up until now, we've been logging into our account using the email address and password that we use to create that account. And that is logging in as a root user, and it is not desirable to do that. The reason I say that is that the root user will have access to everything, access to finances, credit card, access to locking people out of that account. And so that is something that cannot be compromised. Otherwise, you're in a, a lot of trouble. So what we do is that we lock that down. We, we put a very long password and complicated password on that account. And we can also have multi-factor authentication if we want to go to that next step, step of, of locking that down. Once we've locked down our root access, we can create an IAM user. And we can log in as that IAM user and that IAM user will have permissions specific for what we need to do. And so if we, for whatever reason, need root access, we can still get that if we need to. But we log in for the most part as an IAM user, and that protects our account. So again, we go to services and we look for the IAM service. Now, once we're in there, we can go to users on the left here, and we can create a user by clicking on add user. We'll give that user a name. I'm just going to call it test. That'll be fine. Now that user can have management console access. Yes, we would like that, but they can also have programmatic access. If they're going to be connecting in through a software development kit or connecting in through the command line interface remotely, so we're going to give both of those for, and it's because it's going to be ourselves that'll be assuming this user. We can put in a custom password there. So I've just put in a password that I'll remember. And we won't worry about changing that password because it's for us, not for someone else. So what, once we've done that, then we can attach permissions to that user. So we click on next permissions. Up the top here, we've got attach existing policies directly. So AWS have already done the work of writing policies specifically for job functions. So if we click on that, and what we can do is we can select the administrator access, and that provides full access to AWS services and resources. But that does not include financial and that sort of secure account management stuff. So we can attach that policy to this user that we've created. So we click on review and we can see there we've got a username test and they've got both programmatic access and management console access and their permissions are defined in that administrator access. So it basically gives you full access to use all of the resources or all of the services. We click on create user. So that user has now been created. 
And we can see here we've got an access key and a secret access key. And we can download all of this information. So if we download that now, and we can save that somewhere, and that's our credentials. So when we open it up, that file, it will have information about how we log into the management console. So before we would have been logging in from aws.amazon.com, but now we've got our own sign in link and yours will be different. And if we click on that now, we will be able to sign in as that IAM user. So you will have your account ID, or if you've created an alias, it will be an alias. Now I've created an alias from my account called Backspace-Labs, but you will no doubt just have your account ID there. Put in the name of that user that we created. And then we put in the password that we created for that user as well. And if we sign in now, we should be able to get in. And so there you go. We're We've signed in back to where we were in the AWS Management Console. So now we don't need to use those root user credentials. So what we can do now is we can change those root user credentials. So to do that, we need to log in as the root user. So we go to our account up here. So I'm logged in as test. So I want to sign out and then log in with root access. So I click on sign out and that'll take me back to the AWS homepage. So if I go back into my account, AWS Management Console, and I get this screen that we had before. Down the bottom here is a link, sign in using root account credentials. So I'm going to click on that. And that's going to get me into my root user. So I just sign in. And there we go, we're signed in now as the root user of the account. So what we can do now is do the same thing again. We go into our account details here, but we go down to My Security Credentials. And what we can do now is that it's going to give us a warning that we're going to be changing the security credentials of the entire account. So that is what we want to do. So we're going to continue to Security Credentials. And here we can see up the top here is Password and click here to change the password name or email address of your root access account. So we click on that. And here we can go. So we can update the password. So we click on edit and we can put our current password in and then our new password, which I'm not going to change because I, I don't want to change it. But I'd advise you to do that and put in a really, really long and complicated password. Use a password generator to do that. Uh, and that will help to secure down your AWS account. You can also enable multi-factor authentication. It's a little bit of a long-winded process, but that will give you a little bit more security as well if you want to go down that process. So for now, um, I don't want to stay in the root user, so I'm going to log out. And next time I log in, I'll use my IAM user. So that's all I need to show you now on creating a IAM user. Going through the course, we're going to learn a lot more about IAM. And if you're going on to do an associate level certification, you'll, you'll be a, an absolute whiz of this by the end of it. You'll be writing policies. You'll be doing a lot more with this. So I'll look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, we're going to finish up with our overview of AWS by looking at the developer, media, mobile, migration, business productivity, and finally, Internet of Things services. We'll then finish up with a look at one of those services, Amazon Workspaces. AWS Cloud9 is an integrated development environment running in the AWS Cloud. It allows you to deploy servers directly to AWS from an integrated development environment. We'll be using Cloud9 extensively if you go on to the Developer Associate Pathway with Backspace Academy. AWS CodeStar makes it easy to develop and deploy applications to AWS. It can manage the entire CI-CD pipeline for you. It has a project management dashboard, including an integrated issue tracking capability powered by Atlassian Jira software. 
AWS X-Ray makes it easy to analyze and debug applications. This provides you with a better insight to the performance of your application and the underlying services that it relies upon. AWS Code Commit is a Git repository, just like GitHub, and it's running in the AWS cloud. AWS Code Pipeline is a continuous integration and continuous delivery service, or CICD for short. It can build, test, and then deploy your code every time a code change occurs. AWS Code Build compiles your source code, runs tests, and then produces software packages that are ready to deploy on AWS. AWS Code Deploy is a service that automates software deployments to a variety of compute services, including Amazon EC2, AWS Lambda, and even instances that are running on-premises. We will be using Code Pipeline, Code Build, and Code Deploy quite a bit if you're going on to do the Developer Associate Pathway with Backspace Academy. We'll be creating a fully integrated CI-CD pipeline that will automatically package Node NPM packages and run tests using Mocha before deploying to an AWS environment. AWS recently acquired a media production services company called Elemental, and as a result, there are some very high quality broadcast media services available on AWS. AWS Elemental Media Convert is a file-based video transcoding service for converting video formats for video on-demand content. Media Package prepares video content for delivery over the internet. It can also protect against piracy through the use of digital rights management. Media Tailor inserts individually targeted advertising into video streams. Viewers receive streaming video with ads that are personalized for them. AWS Elemental Media Live is a broadcast grade live video processing service for creating video streams for delivery to televisions and internet connected devices. Elemental Media Store is a storage service in the AWS cloud that is optimized for media. And finally, Amazon Kinesis Video Streams streams video from connected devices through to the AWS cloud for analytics, machine learning, and other processing applications. So let's have a look at the mobile services that are available on AWS. AWS Mobile Hub allows you to easily configure your AWS services for mobile applications in one place. It generates a cloud configuration file which stores information about those configured services. AWS Device Farm is an app testing service for Android, iOS and web applications. It allows you to test your app against a large collection of physical devices in the AWS cloud. And finally, AWS AppSync is a GraphQL backend for mobile and web applications. If you're a developer and you don't know what GraphQL is, then make sure you go out and find out because it is absolutely revolutionizing the way we think about data. So let's have a look at the migration services that are available on AWS. AWS Application Discovery Service gathers information about an enterprise's on-premises data centers to help plan migration over to AWS. Data that is collected is retained in an encrypted format in an AWS Application Discovery Service data store. AWS Database Migration Service orchestrates the migration of databases over to the AWS cloud. You can also migrate databases with one database engine type to another totally different database engine type. For example, you can migrate from Oracle over to AWS Aurora. AWS Server Migration Service can automate the migration of thousands of on-premise workloads over to the AWS cloud. 
This reduces costs and minimises the downtime for migrations. AWS Snowball is a portable, petabyte scale data storage device that can be used to migrate data from on-premise environments over to the AWS cloud. You can download your data to the Snowball device and then send it to AWS, who will then upload that to a storage service for you. So let's have a look at the business productivity and desktop streaming applications. Amazon WorkDocs is a secure, fully managed file collaboration and management service in the AWS cloud. The web client allows you to view and provide feedback for over 35 different file types, including Microsoft Office file types and PDF. Amazon WorkMail is a secure, managed business email and calendar service. Amazon Chime is an online meeting service in the AWS cloud. It is great for businesses for online meetings, video conferencing, calls, chat, and to share content both inside and outside of your organization. Amazon Workspaces is a fully managed, secure desktop as a service. It can easily provision streaming, cloud-based Microsoft Windows desktops. Amazon AppStream is a fully managed, secure application streaming service that allows you to stream desktop applications from AWS to an HTML5 compatible web browser. This is great for users who want access to their applications from anywhere. Now, one area that is really progressing rapidly is the Internet of Things on AWS. So let's have a look at some of these services. AWS IoT is a managed cloud platform that lets embedded devices such as microcontrollers and Raspberry Pi to securely interact with cloud applications and other devices. Amazon Free Atos is an operating system for microcontrollers such as the microchip PIC32 that allows small, low-cost, low-power devices to connect to AWS Internet of Things. AWS Greengrass is software that lets you run local AWS Lambda functions and messaging, data caching, sync, and machine learning applications on AWS IoT-connected devices. AWS Greengrass extends AWS services to devices so they can act locally on the data they generate while still using cloud-based AWS IoT capabilities. There's some really cool stuff going on on game development on AWS. So let's have a look at some of it. Amazon GameLift allows you to deploy, scale, and manage your dedicated game servers in the AWS cloud. Amazon Lumberyard, you can see there we've got some images of some pretty cool stuff. It's a game development environment and cross-platform AAA game engine on the AWS cloud. So let's have a look at one of these services, AWS Workspaces. Now, Workspaces, it will stream a Windows desktop to your end users. Now, that is great if you've got an enterprise of you know, hundreds of employees you can get those new employees up and running quite quickly. Now, this is not a lab, and I, I encourage you not to do this as a lab. The reason being is that to create a workspace is quite quick and easy, but to clean it up afterwards and making sure that you don't get a bill at the end of the month is not as easy. So probably best if you just sit back and watch me actually do this, uh, rather than take the risk of getting a bill at the end of the month. So first off, we go to services, and then we go to workspaces, and that will take us in to the workspace management console. And if we've never created a workspace before, we'll get this screen here. So we can click on getting started or get started now, and we'll do the quick setup. And we're going to use a standard with Windows 10. 
And what we've got to do now is that we've got to put some users in. So I'm just going to put myself in or put someone in as a, as a user. Okay, so that will actually now launch or create a a workspace for us, and this user Joe or Joe's Joe Blogs will be able to access that just the same as they would access that on a normal desktop environment. So we'll now click this launch workspaces. So we can see now it's now being launched. It's not a, an, an instantaneous action. It will take quite some time before this workspace appears. Okay, so after about half an hour, we've got this available. It, it normally takes about 10 minutes to get to the pending status, and then about another 20 minutes or so to get to the available status. So once it's available, what we can do next is that we can get our user that we've created, and we've, if we created multiple users, they would be listed here, and we can invite that user. So we just click on invite, and it will send an invitation email with a link. So we click on send invite, and that will be sent. And then once that's done, then that uh, that account for for this desktop environment will be uh, validated. So what we can do now is we can go to, we can expand this here and we can go to the client's link. So we go to that. And what we can do from here is that we can download the application that will install on our desktop that will connect to this desktop stream. So we can download it for Windows, Mac, tablet, whatever. Um, but once we've downloaded that, we're going to have an environment that's going to be very similar to a native environment uh, on our desktop. So once you receive that invite email, you'll get a screen like this where you can put your, your password or set your password there. Once you've done that, click on Update User. And what you can do then is install the Workspaces client, which is what I'm going to do now. And then you'll get a, a key to actually log into that. Okay, so I've installed Workspace's desktop client and I've got my email that has my, uh, my registration code and all I need to do is put that in there and register. And now I just sign in with my credentials. Okay, so now we have a fully blown uh, Windows desktop environment, Windows 10 environment. So if we go to here and we go to view and we go show full screen, we're going to have something that is identical to a native desktop environment. So I'll just do that now. And there we go. We've got a full blown Windows desktop. There is nothing to distinguish that from anything else. So we've got all our applications that will be part of that workspace down here. And if we want to get out of that, we just go put the mouse to the top of the screen here and a little drop down will come and just go back to view and exit full screen. So now we need to, first off, we need to remove this workspace. So we select the workspace and we select remove workspaces and remove workspace. So that will take quite a while for that to happen, probably, uh, you know, around about 10, 15 minutes. But even when that workspace has been deleted, the workspaces application has actually created a simple AD directory for us. Uh, and when we delete that workspace, we're still going to be billed for that. So we can see here, note, simple AD and AD connector are made available for you free of cost with workspaces, workmail, or work docs. If there are no workspaces being used for 30 consecutive days, you may be charged for this directory as per, you know, the pricing terms and conditions, blah, blah, blah. So we don't want that to happen. So I'm going to go into it now and delete that all as well. So the first thing I'll do is go into directories. I'll select that. And I'll do actions and deregister. Okay, so that is, it's staying registered now, but it'll take some time again. Nothing happens quick with workspaces. Okay, so now after eh, five, 10 minutes, it's now no longer registered. Okay, we can see there, no longer registered. But 
it's still there. We're still going to get billed for it. So if we go to the directory service, so we go to services and then directory services, we will see that it is still there. So that what we need to do now is we need to delete it from here as well. So we can't just directly delete this here because it's still got, if it would have still had that association in here, we wouldn't have been able to delete it, but now we can delete it. So we click on delete and we just need to put the name of it there. So I'm just going to copy that over. Okay, so that status is now deleting. So that has cleaned that all up for us. And that brings us to the end of this hands-on session. Again, it's not a lab. I don't recommend that you actually use this unless you are thinking about using this with your corporation or something like that. So I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture and follow-up lab, we're going to be looking at how we can connect to our AWS services and resources using a command line interface. So instead of having to use the AWS management console as we've done before, we can use text commands to achieve a lot of what we would normally do with that graphical user interface. We'll start off by looking at the back-end service that makes this happen, and that is the AWS Application Programming Interface, or API for short. Then we'll look at the number of different command line interface applications that we can install on our computer that will allow remote access to those services and resources. We'll also look at the AWS Cloud9 service, and we'll discuss why I primarily use this for anything to do with a command line interface and the security concerns around not using AWS Cloud9. And finally, we'll finish up by having a lab on using the Cloud9 service with the command line interface. When you're using the AWS Management Console like we've done in the past, AWS uses a application programming interface to enable that communication between your remote computer and the AWS services and resources. So how that works is that the AWS management console that you have been using is simply an application that is running on your browser and it is sending HTTP calls backwards and forwards to uh, this application programming interface backend on AWS. Now the documentation is available for the AWS API for many services, for example, for the S3 API, for the EC2 query API, but not for everything. So if you wanted to create your own application and there wasn't a software development kit for that language you're using, I, I can't imagine what language that would be because there's certainly a very broad range of uh, software development kits that are available, but it is possible for you to send HTTP calls uh, to the API, provided you have that, uh, that authentication done beforehand to actually do that. So it provides that back end mechanism for that communication. And it's utilized again by the AWS Management Console and we'll also use it with the AWS command line interface. So that again is an application that's running on your remote computer that will be sending HTTP calls to this API back end. Also, there are a number of software development kits that wrap the API up into libraries that can be used with, for example, JavaScript for PHP and Python and the like. And so you don't have to actually know how to do these HTTP calls. You just need to know how to use that software development kit. And the documentation for that is, of course, brilliant. And many other AWS services also use the API for communication within the AWS cloud. 
API calls to AWS can only be made by authenticated users with valid security credentials. For example, if you're using the management console, you would have been authenticated through your username and password. If you're using the command line interface application on a remote computer, then you would need to download an access key ID and secret and use that for authentication with AWS. If you're using an application on your browser that has been developed using one of the many AWS software development kits, then normally you would be issued with IAM temporary credentials. So what that means is that this application that you have may use login for Google, may use login for Facebook or whatever, and it might use your Google account or your Facebook account to authenticate you. And then that will be issuing temporary credentials for you to access the AWS resources through that browser-based application. And finally, we can actually log all of these API calls using the AWS CloudTrail service. So that's great if we have any security issues or any performance issues, we can go back through those CloudTrail logs and make sure that there's nothing untoward going on there. A picture tells a thousand words. So how does this all work? Down the bottom there, we've got our AWS cloud that we want to connect to using our remote computer. And so that remote computer will be sending HTTPS API calls to the AWS cloud to get information from the AWS cloud and to issue instructions to the AWS services. So the first way we can do it there is we could have an IAM user and that user will have an username and password. And they can use that username and password to log in to the AWS management console that is running inside of their browser. And the AWS management console running on that remote computer will then issue those API calls to the AWS cloud. The second option there is that we could have an IAM user download IAM credentials in the form of an access key and a secret to go with that access key. And so if that is presented to the AWS command line interface application that is running on that remote computer, that will authenticate that IAM user and that IAM user will then be able to issue command line interface commands to the AWS cloud. And finally, if we've got an external user, so this user doesn't have an AWS account. For example, you might have uh, an application like Dropbox, for example, and you have millions of users and it's not practical or it's actually not even possible to create a million IAM users. So you need to be able to somehow authenticate those users and to allow those users to temporarily access the AWS cloud. So you would use an, an application that is running using the software development kits, and that application could authenticate you using an OAuth authentication service. For example, it could use the AWS Cognito service. It could use Google, log in with Google, or log in with Facebook to authenticate you. And from that authentication, you will have limited and temporary access through that remote computer to the AWS cloud. Now, to start using the command line interface, the first thing that you need to do is that you need to have an application running on your computer that can allow that to happen. So the AWS standard CLI application, it's available for download for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And it allows those API commands to be sent to AWS using the Windows command line or a Linux or Mac terminal application. There is also the AWS shell application, which is a cross-platform standalone integrated shell environment that is written in Python that can provide even more features and more automation features 
to uh, the CLI application. And finally, we've also got the AWS tools for Windows PowerShell. So you can run CLI commands within Windows PowerShell and at the same time use all of those automation tools that are available within PowerShell. Now, if you want to have a look at all of those CLI tools that are available, just go to the AWS website, aws.amazon.com forward slash CLI. The AWS Cloud9 service is an integrated development environment, or IDE for short, that is running on an EC2 instance inside one of your VPCs, and you access it through the AWS Management Console. The Cloud9 service has a lot of tools already installed, so it also has the AWS CLI application pre-installed. Now, I predominantly use the AWS Cloud9 service for anything that requires CLI commands to be sent to AWS Cloud. The reason being is that it provides increased security because I don't have to download IAM credentials and have them sitting on a computer to be able to access uh, that service. And that's very important because if those credentials are compromised, someone can not only use it with the CLI application, they could create their own application using a software development kit, use those IAM credentials and could run bad malicious scripts that could cause a massive amount of damage and a massive amount of financial impact to your AWS infrastructure. Now you may well ask, but what about the username and password that we use to connect to the management console? What if that gets compromised? Doesn't it have the same effect? And yes, you are correct, but coming up in the IAM section of this course, we'll be talking about how to implement multi-factor authentication on IAM accounts. So what that means is that if these username and passwords are compromised, they cannot be used to log into your account because there is a secondary, a multiple factor authentication process that also needs to be followed. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our discussion on the command line interface. Coming up next, we're going to be getting our hands on with the command line interface. So I look forward to seeing you in the lab. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lab, we're going to be getting our hands on with the command line interface. We'll be creating a Cloud9 environment and using the terminal of that Cloud9 environment to send CLI commands to AWS. We're going to issue a command that will create an S3 bucket. We'll also issue commands then to upload an object and then delete that object. And finally, we'll issue a command to delete the bucket and clean it all up. Okay, so starting off in the management console, we get to the Cloud9 console by going to services and Cloud9. And that will bring us to this landing page here. If we've already got uh, Cloud9 environments already set up, you'll have a different screen here. But if you haven't used Cloud9 before, this is what you'll be presented with. So we'll click on create environment. We'll give our, our environment a name. We won't worry about a description, it's only optional, and we'll click on next step. So we're going to be creating a new instance to run this Cloud9 application on, and we're going to select a T2 micro instance for that. We're also going to select the Amazon Linux AMI because it's got a lot of tools pre-installed on there, including the command line interface. What we've also got here is a cost saving setting. So if we're not using this service for whatever reason, instead of getting billed for that EC2 instance, it will go into hibernation mode and will we'll only be billed for the drives that are attached to that instance. We won't be billed for that compute capacity as such. So that is a very good thing. We'll leave that there so that after 30 minutes, it will go into hibernation. When we go back into this, it will come out of hibernation if we haven't used it. Click on next step. And that's how easy it is to create 
a Cloud9 environment in your default VPC. And we'll click on Create Environment. Now, after a few minutes, the EC2 instance will be launched and that Cloud9 application will be running and we'll have the IDE operating within our browser. Okay, so after about five minutes or so, we've got our Cloud9 integrated development environment up and running. So on the left-hand side there, we can see that we've got a tree view of our file structure within this EC2 instance. So that's great. So we can actually, from there, we can upload files quite easily just by simply dragging and dropping them onto a form. Down the bottom there, we've got a bash screen. So that's a Linux terminal console. And from there, we can start issuing commands through our EC2 instance to the AWS service. And in the center there, we've got tabs, which will allow us to view files and modify files. So that is our editor as such. Now, if we want to change this, so yours will probably be a, a quite light and bright uh, user interface. I like a dark one. So what you can do is just go into this toolbox icon here, this, uh, uh, this sprocket, and just click on that for the preferences. And if you scroll down and you go to themes, you can select, so by default, I think you have this flat theme, which will be that one there, but you can change it to a darker theme. And I, I'd like this dark gray one here. So if you like the dark gray, you can change it to that quite easily. So we'll just close out of that now. And we'll start to issue some commands and see how we go. Now, the first thing that we need to do is to check whether the AWS command line interface tools are installed. So we do AWS dash dash and version. And there we can see we've got the latest version of our CLI in there. So what I'll do now is I'm going to issue a command that is going to create a bucket on our, on our AWS account. So the command there is AWS for the CLI command, S3 for the SC, S3 service, MB is the command to make a bucket. And then we do S3 colon forward slash forward slash and the name of that bucket. So I'm just going to give it a unique name. Now you'll need to have a different name to this. It will need to be unique for a bucket and we'll click on enter. And so there we can see that that has successfully created a bucket for us. So if we go into uh, the S3 console, we'll be able to see that that bucket has been created. But before we do that, how about we upload a file? So first off, what we'll do is we'll upload a file to this EC2 instance. And we're going to be doing that by going onto the, uh, the tree view here. And what we can do is go to file and upload local files. And then all we need to do is just drag and drop a file. So I'm just going to drag and drop the lab notes onto this, onto this uh, form. And then that will upload that to this EC2 instance. Okay, so there on the left-hand side, you can see that we're uploading it, and very quickly, it has uploaded that to our, our EC2 instance. So I'm just going to shorten that name a little bit, and just going to call it Notes, and that will be fine. Okay, what we can do now is that we can issue a command that will copy that file over as an S3 object to that S3 bucket. So the command we need to use is the AWS S3 CP command. So AWS S3 CP, and then the, the actual file name, so it'll be notes. Now remember file names are case sensitive. So this has a capital N, so I'm putting a capital in there. Dot PDF, and then the name of the bucket, which will be S3, and then that name of the bucket. So S3 colon forward slash forward slash, and that bucket name. CLI. Okay. So there we go. AWS S3 CP, the file name, and then the bucket name there. Click enter. And there we go. It's uploaded that notes.pdf to that bucket. So if we go into the 
Management console for S3 will be able to see that uploaded object inside of that bucket. Okay, so we'll do a new tab here and just jump into the management console. So there we go. So if we jump into the S3 service, have a look for that bucket. There it is, CLI Pucati. And there we can see we've got that bucket has been created. Our notes.pdf document is there. Everything seems fine. So what we'll do now is we'll clean it all up by deleting that, that notes.pdf. So the command that we use is AWS S3 RM and then S3 and colon forward slash forward slash and then the name of that bucket and then forward slash the name of the actual file itself and enter. So there we can see we've successfully deleted that. And if we go to this management console and if we refresh the screen, we can see that now the bucket is empty. So bucket's empty, we can now delete it. So the command that we use is AWS S3 and RB to remove that bucket. And then simply the name of that bucket. Okay, so it's removed that bucket. So that's pretty well all I want to show you as far as the command line interface goes, because it's a very, very powerful tool that can be used with a whole heap of different services. So if you want to know more about the CLI, or you want to see the documentation, just go to the Amazon website, so aws.amazon.com forward slash CLI. And then we can go to the CLI reference. Okay, so that will have a whole heap of different commands that are available for the different services. So you see the available services is absolutely massive. So we'll scroll down to what we've been using, which is S3. So we see there we've got two. We've got S3 and we've got S3 API. So the S3 API is far more powerful and that takes advantage of all of the API commands that are available, whereas the S3 commands only have very shortened, limited use. So they're, they're more for quick things to be done. So CP instead of, you know, copy and then having this big long string. So let's have a look at that. So we go into the S3 API and if we want to create a bucket, we can scroll down and we can see the command there. It's quite long and lengthy. So we can see there uh, it's a lot more verby than using just a simple CP command but it's a lot more powerful. You can do a lot more with it. So I'll just go back. And we'll have a look at the S3 commands. So we can see here, we don't have a lot of commands available. So they're the only commands that are available using that S3. So if you want more than that, and you want the full capability that you have with the S3 service, you can use the S3 API commands. So let's have a look at one of the ones that we've been using there. So CP, and we can see there, it's going to have uh, different options and whatever that are available. It'll have an example if we scroll down. Okay, so there we can see we've got an example. Now, what you do there is that we've got, first off, we define what that file, that local file is, and then we define where we want to send it to. So we just sent it to uh, my bucket, but if you wanted to change the name of that, because you can see here we're going from test to test two, you can actually put that extension to that bucket name there. So that's pretty well it as far as that S3 stuff goes. There's not really a lot to learn with that S3, but again, go to the document page and have a look at it and see if you can play around with some of these different sorts of commands and you'll find it is quite a powerful thing to use. So that brings us to the end of the lab. First thing that we need to do now is just clean up this development environment. So what we do is we click on AWS Cloud9 here. We go to our dashboard. And there are our environments. Now I've got two environments here. You'll just have one. Select that environment and delete. And just type in delete. And that will eventually delete that EC2 instance and that complete environment and bring you back so that you're not going to get a bill at the end of the month. That brings us to the end and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.
Welcome back to Backspace Academy. Elastic Beanstalk, it's one of AWS's deployment services, and it allows you to deploy your applications to complex architectures on AWS. And it does this without you having to worry about the underlying architecture that is behind that. Elastic Beanstalk, it looks after everything for you, and you just need to worry about writing your code. We'll also talk about how Elastic Beanstalk can create highly available and fault-tolerant architectures and what that actually means. And then finally, we'll look at the different deployment options that are available on Elastic Beanstalk. Elastic Beanstalk, it's been around for quite some time, was first launched in 2011. It allows you to quickly deploy and manage applications on environments, and those environments are launched for you without you having to worry about how it all works. It'll automatically handle capacity provisioning. It'll launch a load balancer for you if you need that. It'll auto scale for you and it can also implement health monitoring so that if one of these instances that are launched becomes unhealthy, it can replace those automatically for you. If you need to change your code after you've deployed it, it's quite easy to upload new versions of that code and that can be done through the console or the command line interface. And also complete environments can also be redeployed if need be. Your application that you're deploying could be a Docker container. It could be raw code. It could be Node.js, Java, .NET, PHP, Ruby, Python, or Go. You just supply your code and Elastic Beanstalk will deploy that for you and it will provision that Node.js or whatever environment for you automatically. Or it could be a service such as Apache, Nginx, Passenger, or IIS. The Elastic Beanstalk process, it starts with us going through a, an application creation process where we will first off upload a version of our software or our code or whatever it is. And then Elastic Beanstalk will launch an environment and that will consist of EC2 instances or it could be a single EC2 instance. It could be a multi-AZ environment, but we define that for Elastic Beanstalk and it will do that automatically for us. From there, we will have our environment launched and our code will be running on that environment. Now, if we find that we need to deploy a new version of that code, we can deploy that to that existing environment or we can create a whole new environment. It doesn't really matter. So if we deployed it to our existing environment, then when that environment has gone through that update process and the new version is deployed and running, then the environment will feed back to the application to notify that that new version of your application is actually running. One of the big advantages of Elastic Beanstalk is that it can create a highly available and fault tolerant architecture without us having to worry about how to actually do that. So what is a highly available and fault tolerant architecture? So here we've got the AWS cloud. And as we know, it's divided up into regions, and those regions are divided up into availability zones. So we've, if we have our architecture distributed across multiple availability zones, if one of those availability zones goes down, our infrastructure will still continue to operate and serve requests. Now, our virtual private cloud, that will span the entire region, so it will span multiple availability zones. And so what we can do is that we can launch instances into both of those availability zones, and that's going to give us high availability if one of those availability zones goes down. Now, in order for our architecture to respond to spikes in demand or increases in demand because an availability zone goes down, what we can do is we can launch our instances using an auto-scaling group. So if demand on one of those or a group of instances increases, the auto-scaling group will add instances to accommodate that. And vice versa, if the demand goes down, we will reduce our number of EC2 instances. And that allows for elasticity in our design. And finally, to receive requests from the outside world and to distribute those requests to those multiple instances, we're going to need an elastic load balancer to do that. And that will also have the advantage of conducting health checks on our instances so that if communication breaks down between the Elastic Load Balancer and our EC2 instance, then our auto-scaling group will automatically 
add additional instances and that creates fault tolerance in our architecture. Just the same as you've got a number of options available for architecture that you're deploying to, such as a single EC2 instance or a highly available and fault tolerant architecture across multiple availability zones, you've also got a number of different deployment options that you can use. So for example, if you've got 20 EC2 instances and all at once deployment, we'll deploy that across all of those 20 EC2 instances all at once. The downside of that is going to be that while that is occurring, your architecture won't be able to respond to requests. So that's obviously not a good thing. So another option there is to do a rolling deployment and that will deploy your application to a single batch at a time. So what that means is that if you've got 20 EC2 instances, it can deploy that to say two at a time. So you're not going to be down by much. You're just going to be down from 20 instances down to 18 instances, but your architecture will still be responding to requests. You can also do a rolling with an additional batch. So what that will do is that if you've got, again, 20 EC2 instances, it will temporarily increase to 22 while you're doing those two uh, deployments across those two EC2 instances. And that way you're still going to have your capacity at 20, which is what you have designed for. The other option there is an immutable deployment, and that is a bit of a variation of the all at once. So it's still doing an all at once deployment across your 20 EC2 instances. But while that's going on, it's going to deploy another 20 EC2 instances. So temporarily, you're going to have 40 EC2 instances. So it's going to double up a lot on your capacity. But through that period where your environment is being deployed or your new version or whatever is being deployed to that environment, you're not going to be suffering any downtime. And finally, we've got blue-green deployments, and they will have two environments that will be running your application under the one Elastic Beanstalk application. And so what that is, is you will have a blue environment and a green environment. One of those could be a development environment, and the other one could be your production environment. So when you get to the stage where your development environment is ready to go to be deployed, to deploy that, all you simply need to do is to switch over from one environment to the other environment. And then your old environment will then become your new development environment. And so that is very straightforward with Elastic Beanstalk because what it does, it will simply allow you to switch the domain names for those two environments automatically for you. And so that makes sure that your changeover doesn't or doesn't involve any downtime for returning of requests. Later on in the course, we're going to learn a lot more about blue-green deployments and how to deploy those across Elastic Beanstalk. So, but coming up next, we're going to use Elastic Beanstalk to deploy a highly available and fault-tolerant architecture. So make sure that you download the lab notes for this one, and I'll see you in the lab. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lab on Elastic Beanstalk, we're going to be using the Elastic Beanstalk service to deploy a Node.js application and deploy it to a highly available and fault tolerant architecture. So starting off in the Elastic Beanstalk console, again, we get there from services and Elastic Beanstalk. Once we're there, we can see a welcome screen there if we haven't got any Elastic Beanstalk environments already. What I'd like you to do now is just click on Get Started. And we'll give our application a name. We'll select Node.js as our platform. And we're just going to use the sample application that AWS use. And we're going to click on Configure More Options. Now, if we didn't click on Configure More Options and just clicked straight on Create Application, it would launch our environment as a single instance. So it wouldn't be a highly available and fault tolerant architecture. And so as we can see here, our capacity is just a single instance and we don't have a load balancer. So what we need to do is we need to select High Availability. And there we can see our capacity has changed and it's going to be in an auto scaling group that will have instances ranging from one to four, and we can change that as well. And also we can see there that we've got a load balancer as well. 
So what we'll do is we'll click on now, we'll click on create app. And what it's going to do, it's not only going to create that Elastic Beanstalk application for us, it's going to create an environment to launch our code on, and that will be a highly available and fault tolerant architecture. Okay, so after a certain amount of time, we've got there, our environment has been launched and we've got the big green tick there. Now what we can do is we can go to this endpoint up the top here, which will be the URL for our application, our web application. So we click on that, and there we can see that is the sample Node.js application from AWS. Now that will be deployed to a HA and FT architecture. What that means is it will have an auto scaling group and EC2 instances will be launched by that. And it will also have an elastic load balancer as well. So let's just make sure that that has actually occurred. So we go to services, then go over to EC2. And if you remember, we had our auto scaling group was varying between one and four, depending on demand. So there we can see we've got one instance running. Now, if we scroll down, we should be able to find a load balancer there as well. So there we go. We've got our Elastic Load Balancer there that has been created by Elastic Beanstalk, and it's got one instance in service. We should also have an auto scaling group. And there we go, we've got an auto scaling group as well. And there we can see it's got a desired capacity of one, which is what we're at now, and a minimum to maximum of four, depending on demand on those instances. So what we'll do now is that we've pretty well finished the lab. What we need to do now is clean this all up to make sure that we don't get a bill. So the best way to do it is not to go in and delete resources. What you need to do is go into all applications and then just select that application here with actions and delete the application. So that will delete your application and it will also delete that environment that was created by Elastic Beanstalk. So we click on delete. So it doesn't look like anything's happened, but if you click on that environment, you will see that it is now terminating your environment. And after a few minutes, uh, those all those resources, that auto scaling group, that Elastic Load Balancer, the instances all will be removed from your account and you won't get billed for that. So that brings us to the end of a pretty straightforward lab, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. I'd just like to very quickly introduce you to the AWS free tier. Now, up until now, Everything that we've done with these labs has been covered under that free tier and we won't be getting a bill for it. Provided we deleted everything after the lab, we won't, be, uh, we won't experience a problem there. So what I'd like to do now is first of all show you how to get to the AWS free tier website. So you go to aws.amazon.com, the AWS website, and it's simply forward slash free. Now what we can see is that there are some things here that are free for 12 months, some things that are always free and trial. So what that means is that if we signed up for our account three months ago, there are some things that are going to be free for another nine months. So they're only free for 12 months from the time that you first opened your AWS account. We also have some things that are always free. So provided we stay below a certain limit of that service, we're going to get that for free as well. And that won't be uh, affected by the 12 month period at all. We also have short trials of services as well. Now we, we can have a look here and just have a look at the product categories. So I'll just click on that. So under compute, we've been using Amazon E2, EC2 and we'll be using it quite a bit throughout this course. And that will give you 750 hours free for 12 months per month. So what that means is that we can have 750 hours per month of T2 micro instance, and that will expire 12 months after signing up for AWS. Now, the big thing to remember is that this is only for a T2 micro instance. If you have anything bigger than that, it doesn't matter how much you use, you're going to get billed for it. And also to consider is that a smaller instance like the T2 Nano will not be covered under the free tier. It is specifically for the T2 micro instance. The other thing to take into consideration, if we're launching a highly available and fault tolerant architecture, 
where we're using, say, two T2 micro instances, that will double up our, our usage. So instead of having 750 hours of usage, if we're using two of the T2 micro instances, we're only going to be able to have 375 of those, of those uh, hours available. So the more instances you use, the less hours you're going to have. And the same with our database service. So with RDS, we've, again, we've used that as well. And we're going to get 750 hours of that. And that is, again, only going to be for T2 Micro. And with storage and content delivery, we're going to be using S3 a lot. And again, we're going to get 5 gig of standard storage under that free tier. So let's have a look at the things that are always free. So under Amazon CloudWatch, so we have 10 custom metrics and 10 alarms. So provided we stay below that, that's not going to cost us anything. And that doesn't expire after 12 months. So it's always free. And DynamoDB, 25 gig of storage, always free. Amazon SES, 62,000 outbound messages per month. Provided we stay under that for the month, we're not going to incur a charge for that. And we also have trials. So you need to be very careful with trials. So for example, with Amazon Redshift, that is a, a quite an expensive service. So if you look there, you've got 750 hours of DC2 large hours per month for two months. But if your account is already over two months old and you sign up for, or you actually start using Redshift, you're going to get billed for it and you're going to be billed for quite an expensive uh, instance as well. So that's the AWS free tier. So what I'd, I'd recommend you do is go to this website, have a look around, see what's free. As you're working through the labs, if you have any, any doubts about something being free, then just go to here and, and check it out. And I'm sure it'll be fine. So we tr tr do try to stay under this free tier throughout the course, but things such as buying a domain name will incur a cost. So that's all I want to say about that for now, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about how you can present a business case for migrating over to Amazon Web Services. I'll talk about the advantages of cloud computing. I'll talk about the tools that are available to estimate the costs of AWS. I'll talk about total cost of ownership and the tools that are available to measure that. I'll talk about the Amazon Inspector service that reduces your costs for security. I'll talk about the AWS compliance program. And finally, I'll talk about where you can get support for your organization within AWS. AWS defines six advantages and benefits of cloud computing. First off, we're going to be trading capital expense for variable expense. So what that means is we're not going out and buying major equipment. We're not going out buying network servers. We're not going out and buying office space to house it. We're not going out and buying air conditioners. And we're trading that for a variable pay-as-you-go expense that we can estimate with high accuracy and we can write off immediately. We're going to benefit from the massive economies of scale that AWS have. They literally have hundreds of thousands of customers, and we're spreading those costs across those hundreds of thousands of customers. And that's going to provide us with a great economy of a scale. We don't need to worry about guessing capacity anymore. These, these can be implemented as elastic services that can expand and contract as our demand changes. We can be more agile and we can respond to customer de demands much more quickly. For example, we can spin up an elastic beanstalk environment within minutes, not hours or days or weeks or months even. We can do that in a very short amount of time and get our application up and running really quickly. We're not going to worry about spending money on running and maintaining data centers. We have data warehouses. We have large capacity data services on AWS, and that is a pay-as-you-go service. And finally, we can go global in minutes. This is a massive architecture. It's a massive global infrastructure that is available for us within AWS, and we can go global across every part of the world you can think of. 
if you're looking for a very quick and simple way of estimating the costs or the monthly costs of using AWS, then you can use the AWS Simple Monthly Calculator. And so what that does, it labels you to put in what your EC2 instances will be or what your other services, what your S3 buckets and the size of those you expect those to be. Uh, put in all your data transfer information that you expect. And that will spit out an estimate of your monthly bill. It also has on the right hand side there, you can see there are common uh, customer samples. So you can actually get a pre-baked uh, estimate all, already. So if you can see there for a large web application, all on demand, you can use that as a starting point uh, for your monthly calculator. So what that looks like is that you will get everything broken down into a item by item basis and the cost of that. And you can export that to CSV, which is great if you want to put that into a report and present it to, uh, to management or to accountants. So if you want to learn more about the AWS Simple Monthly Calculator, go to aws.amazon.com forward slash calculator. If you're looking to present a business case for migrating from on-premises or co-location over to AWS, then there's a lot more that you need to take into account. So yes, we know that we're going to have server costs and storage costs, but there's also going to be network costs. There's going to be IT labor costs, and those are also going to include other costs. For example, when we, when we look at server costs, it's not only the hardware, it's also the software, the operating system, the maintenance, the maintenance of that software as well. When we look at storage costs, there's also administration costs involved in that. And servers, storage and networks all have an overhead cost as well. They require space, they require electricity, they require air conditioning. So that all needs to be taken into account. And AWS provides a great tool, the AWS TCO calculator. And you just go to awstocalculator.com to have a look at that. So when you go to the AWS TCO calculator, you can see that there uh, at the top there, there's an option for advanced or basic. So the basic version just gives you servers and storage. The advanced takes into account server storage, network and IT labor. So what you do is you put in there what your existing architecture is and what your existing hardware and costs currently are. And then AWS will look at a business case scenario of applying AWS services to fulfill uh, what, you've, what you've already got. One of the major costs within a large organization will be the costs of security uh, audits and the cost of having consultants come out and analyze your security and the like. So the Amazon Inspector helps to massively reduce those costs. It's an automate, automated security assessment service. And it acts as a, an expert system and will go through your entire architecture and make sure that there are no gaps in your security. So it helps to massively reduce the costs of manually doing that. The pricing is very cheap, starts at 30 cents per agent uh, assessment per month. And there is, of course, volume discounting on that. And it can go down to as low as five cents per agent assessment per month. AWS is certified and compliant to a very large amount of uh, regulations, certifications, uh, frameworks and the like that are out there. Uh, the big ones there, we can see that it is certified to payment card industry data security standard, which is a very good one. It's uh, ISO 9001, as most major organisations are. So it's certified in that. It also provides services that can uh, enable you to become certified in a standard, for example, HIPAA standard or GLBA for finance. Now, one thing to understand is that there is a big difference between AWS being compliant to a standard and AWS providing compliance enabling services. So for example, when we look at ISO 9001, AWS is certified in that. When we look at PCI DSS level one, AWS, they have a, a certificate in that. They are certified and compliant for PCI DSS level one. When we look at something like HIPAA, HIPAA is not a standard for cloud services. 
It's not a standard for data service, data storage, but it does define that in the standard. So the HIPAA application covers a lot more than that, and it's it's the AD, the AWS customer is responsible for that application. But AWS, the services that they provide, will not impede that process. They have services that are compliance enabling services. And they also have a program that can structure their services to make that more streamlined for you to achieve your the HIPAA compliance for your application. So please understand that AWS is not certified in HIPAA but they have services that have been assessed by a third party that can enable clients to achieve certification in HIPAA. Now, when you're presenting a business case to migrate across to Amazon Web Services, one of the key advantages is obviously going to be the reduction in support personnel. So obviously a question is going to be asked about what happens when something goes wrong. And that's where the AWS support plans come in. So they, they are available from basic to developer to business to enterprise. So if you're a large enterprise, uh, you may want a quick response to any problem. So if your website, for example, has gone down, you would want to, at the very least, have a business level support plan, which is going to give you less than one hour response to critical failures. But you may also want to look at enterprise and getting that down to less than 15 minutes response to critical failures 24 seven. If you want to find out more about the AWS support plans, just go to the AWS website at aws.amazon.com forward slash premium support compare plans. So that brings us to the end of this lecture, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about what it means to be an architect using AWS services. I'll talk about where we can find information that will help us to provide the best solutions for our stakeholders. This includes the AWS well-architected framework, and that helps us to define exactly what a good architecture looks like. We'll talk about reference architectures, including ones that have cloud formation templates, then they'll allow us to launch complete architectures, very complex architectures, with a very simple click of a button. Finally, we'll discuss the various compliance services that are available with AWS that can help us to navigate through many difficult compliance processes. Now, the best place to start is with the AWS Architecture Center. And you get there by going to the AWS site at aws.amazon.com and then forward slash architecture. And so this is the starting point for all of your information that you need about architecting on AWS. So just having a look at here at the site, up the top here we've got latest reference architectures. So these are really good. They're very complex and detailed architectures. And what they, what they are is they have a GitHub repository, and that includes a cloud formation template, and that will allow you to launch these very complex architectures yourself simply by clicking a button. So you can see there we've got WordPress hosting, and so we've already uh, used WordPress. We've launched it on a single EC2 instance. But what happens if we want to have an enterprise-scale application that has a million users, for example, our single instance is just not going to cut it. So we're going to have to have something a little bit more complicated than that. So it, here we have a GitHub repository. So if we go to the GitHub repository. We can see there that we've got a template here. So we go into templates and we've got a cloud formation template there. And it's made up of a master template here and a, a number of different sub templates as well that are referenced from this master template. So you just need to launch this master template and that will allow you to launch this or 
create this entire architecture very simply and easily. So this architecture will also have a reference diagram for it as well. So if we scroll down here, and we can see here we've got a reference architecture diagram. So let's get that up a little bit bigger here. So what we can see there, we, we no longer have a single instance running WordPress. We've got a lot of stuff happening here. So if you're running WordPress on multiple instances, for example, in an auto scaling group, or for example, using Elastic Beanstalk, you're going to run into problems because the WordPress application that you have installed has a database installed on it as well. It also has a, a, a data documents directory as well. And so when you launch another instance, you, you create another database, a fresh database. And that's not synced to the other database. So you have basically these separate sites of WordPress running and they're not synchronized between each other. So when you're running WordPress, what you need to do is that you need to run it using a central database. And that's where Amazon Aurora comes in. So you can have multiple instances and they can reference a single endpoint with Amazon Aurora. Also with your data documents that are referenced within WordPress, that needs to be centrally, centrally located as well. Because if a user uploads an image or whatever, they want to have that accessed later on. They might come to a different instance and it's not available. So we need all that central data stored as well. And so you can see here, we've got Amazon Elastic File Service, which is going to create a file server there that is going to be accessible by all of those WordPress instances. And also we've got an Elasticache layer there between, uh, between the Aurora endpoint as well, which is going to speed up our access there as well. We've got an internet gateway, which is going to create a connection between the wider internet and our VPC. We've got Amazon CloudFront, which is going to speed up access to images and videos and all of that regularly access static data. And finally there, we've also got Amazon Route 53, which is our domain name service. So if we've got our domain name, we need to direct the traffic through to our infrastructure. So you can see there, that's something that's very, very complicated. And to do that by uh, manual process, it takes quite a bit of time and you can run into errors as well. So using this out of the box, you've got a solution there that works great. Uh, it's going to comply with all of the best practices of AWS and you're going to be able to deploy that with a single click of a cloud formation template. And jumping back in the AWS Architecture Center, so there we've got our latest reference architectures. Scrolling down, we've got the latest AWS quick starts. So what they are, they are again, they're cloud formation template. And you can use those to deploy applications automatically on AWS. So for example, Atlassian, great Australian company. If you wanted to install some of their great software on AWS, this is a great way to do it very quickly. It's a quick start, it gets you up and running very quickly. Scrolling down a little bit for, and we've got some AWS reference architectures. So they don't have a cloud formation template. They're a little bit more high level, but very useful all the same. So we've got a web application hosting one there, and that is a PDF or PDF diagram. So we'll just open that up now. And there we can see that it's a lot more generic. It's not as technical as the other one. It doesn't have a cloud formation template and it leads, needs, leaves a lot up to yourself uh, to design in uh, features. So one thing that we can notice here is that it doesn't use Elastic File Service for those document data, that shared document data, but it's using Amazon S3. So for a WordPress application, you probably couldn't use this without EFS. Uh, but if you're designing your own web application, then this would be a great architecture because you could use Amazon S3 to store all your regularly accessed content and all of those files and uh, web pages and whatever that are used throughout the entire application by all of those instances. And at the same time, you've still got your data stored in your central database that has one endpoint there with Amazon Aurora. 
Everything else is very similar. It's got Amazon Route 53 CloudFront, uh, but it's a great architecture there, and that it was is designed around the best practices of AWS. So that is what a good architecture looks like for that application. So if we look there, we've got content and media sharing, batch processing, fault tolerance, really good stuff. So if you want to see what good looks like from a, an architecture perspective, that is where you go. So just go back up, back up here to the top and we can see here we've got this AWS well architectured site. So I'm just going to go into that. And what we've got is an AWS well architectured framework. And that helps you to build architecture around best practices. It provides a framework for you to work in. It's very high level, it's very generic, and it's not prescriptive as such. But it gets you thinking in the right areas and it's built around five pillars of excellence. And so those are operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. So when we talk about operational excellence, we need to make sure that we've got our processes designed like we would have in a good business process. We need to make sure that we've got our architecture is implemented as code. We're using cloud formation templates or something like that that defines our architecture and has version control around our architecture. We're taking advantage of automation to streamline and to reduce waste, just the same as we would with any other business process. So we need to take into consideration these operational considerations and operational excellence when we're designing our architecture. Security, of course, that is fundamental and we don't need to discuss that much more, but security is key with AWS and especially when you're talking about the cloud services. Reliability, making sure that we have a highly available and fault tolerant architecture. It can, it can respond to demand, both long-term demand and spikes in demand. We have performance efficiency, making sure that we're getting the most out of those resources. They're not sitting around doing nothing. We don't have all of these orphan instances and EBS volumes that we're paying for and we're not using. And finally, we've got cost optimization, making sure that we get the right solution for our budget. It's no point designing something that's massive and complicated and expensive if it's just not going to be economical to do that. We might be able to go to a lower cost solution, such as designing a static website and using cloud format or cloud front, rather than having large services that cost a lot of money. Now to help us along the way, there is actually an AWS Well Architected Tool. And there's a link to it here. The AWS Well Architected Tool is now available. So we can just open that up now and see what it is. So here we have this AWS Well Architected Tool. So that brings you into the AWS Management Console and it's an AWS service there, just like any of the other services. What it does, it helps you to really critically analyze your workload and your solution and making sure that you've asked all of the right questions and you've taken into consideration everything that you need to take into consideration to make sure that you have something that is designed around the best practices of AWS. So let's jump into it. So get started with the well architected tool. Okay, so there we go. How it works is, again, we go through those five pillars of excellence and it will ask you a series of questions, quite a lot of questions. And it's a bit like a benchmarking process. And so you'll go through, you'll ask or you'll define your workload first, and then you'll go through and you'll answer all of these questions. And you can save that as a milestone. And then you can come back when you've fixed up all of the issues and then go back and redo that the AWS architected tool, put in another milestone until you get to the point where you're completely satisfied that you've taken into consideration everything of this well-architected framework. 
And then you can print out a report, which is great because it's great for going to clients and saying, look, this is what we've taken into consideration with your architecture. And we've come up with a solution that is based upon the best practices on a number of different areas. And this is what we've come up with. So it's a great tool and, and as well, a great marketing tool as well. Okay, so we've got these great tools. We've got this great framework. How do we learn more about it? So the best way, we'll just go back to the AWS Well Architected site. And if we scroll down a little bit more, we can see that we've got these Well Architected lenses. So if we want to see how a best practice application of this from a serverless perspective, we've got it there from a high performance computing perspective, we can have a look at those PDF diagrams or those PDF uh, white papers uh, and, and that will help us to understand exactly how that is. So these well-architected lens are a look at a certain application. So they're very helpful as well. Uh, but also what we've got here, if we scroll down, we've actually got some training on the well-architected framework. Now, that only takes an hour to complete, so it's a good idea to just jump in and have a look at that. And that will give you a very good overview of the well-architected framework as well. So that is all I need to discuss right now about architecture. What I want to talk about now is how do we create an architecture that might be compliant with a certain framework such as HIPAA or some other certification framework that we need to make sure that it fits in with. So the best place to start is the AWS compliance homepage. So we get there again by going to aws.amazon.com forward slash compliance. So there we can see we've got a homepage specifically around designing architectures that comply with different standards and certifications. So we can see there we've got compliance enablers, the, the services that we can use that help us to get compliance. We've got compliance programs. We've got the shared responsibility model. And we'll talk a lot about the shared responsibility model in the IAM section of the course. And we've got a number of different compliance programs that AWS work with or can get you compliant with or they are themselves compliant with. Uh, you can also handle information requests for AWS. So you can, if you've got a, a problem, you can drop them a line and they'll help, help you with that request. So we'll just get to have a look at these compliance programs. And we can see there's a lot of them. So we've got these global ones here. Uh, PCI DSS level one for payment card standards. That's a great one, a very important one if you're going to be doing e-commerce. So uh, anything on AWS uh, can be set up for PCI compliance or PCI DSS one compliance. We've also got here a number of US ones. Now, even though these are compliance programs that AWS have on their compliance program website, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you use AWS, you are automatically have this compliance. For example, HIPAA. AWS can provide everything that you need to get HIPAA certified, but because HIPAA is not a certification for cloud services or infrastructure or anything like that, there is, there is no way that AWS can be HIPAA compliant because they don't actually have any HIPAA applications as such. But you can launch your application and provided your application conforms with HIPAA, the AWS component of that is not going to interfere with that and it will help you to get HIPAA compliant. And of course, uh, AWS can work with you to get your application HIPAA compliant as well. So that's what we talk about with the compliance and the compliance program. So that brings me to an end on the discussion around architecture and compliance. So quite a bit going through there. Probably best if you just jump online yourself and have a bit of a play around and look around this stuff because it is quite important and good for you to know where to find things. So I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this section, I'm going to break with tradition a little bit and I'm going to just basically throw you in at the deep end. So we're going to create a very complex and bulletproof architecture with no experience whatsoever. 
So that will enable you to get some very good confidence in using Amazon Web Services. And you'll also learn about the power of Amazon Web Services, not only the power of Amazon Web Services, the simplicity of using and utilizing that power for hosting a static website. You'll get exposure to many commonly used services, and that will include the Amazon S3 service or simple storage service. And we're going to use that to upload our website to Amazon Web Services. And then we're also going to use that same service to host this website to the wider internet. Once that's set up, then we can start looking at getting some really high performance out of our website. And the way we can do that is by using the CloudFront Content Delivery Network. What that will do, it'll grab a copy of that website and it will distribute across well over 50 edge locations across the globe. So what that means is that when someone accesses your website, they're going to get very, very low latency, very fast response to those requests to your website. Once that's up and running, and we've created that CloudFront distribution or that cache that has been distributed across these edge locations, we can then look at using the Route 53 domain name service to route traffic that is going to go to our domain to that CloudFront distribution. Once that's up and running, then we're gonna go a little bit step further and then we're gonna look at implementing HTTPS. And so we'll do that by using the AWS Certificate Manager to create a secure sockets layer or SSL certificate for us. And we will associate that certificate with our CloudFront distribution. So there's a lot going on there. It's a big exercise to do at the start, but I'm sure you can appreciate when you get at the end of this, you're going to realize that yes, you can do this. Yes, this is what you want to do, and yes, there is certainly a very bright light at the end of this AWS tunnel. And it's certainly worthwhile persisting and getting to the end of this course. So without any further ado, let's go and jump in at the deep end. So what we're going to do is first off, we're going to purchase a domain name using the Route 53 service. Then we're going to look at uploading our website to Amazon Web Services, it, specifically the AWS S3 service. And then we're going to enable that to host our website. Once we've done that, what we're going to do is then create a CloudFront distribution, which will make a copy of our website and distribute it across well over 50 different edge locations across the world. Then we're going to look at using the Route 53 service, the main name service of Amazon Web Services to route our traffic uh, through to our edge locations. And then once we've done that, we can look at increasing security with HTTPS uh, encryption uh, for traffic to and from our website. Now, what will this look like? Our request to our domain name will come to Amazon Web Services through the AWS Route 53 service. From there, it will distribute our request to a CloudFront edge location close to us or close to your end user. So for example, if your end user is located in Australia, then they'll most likely end up getting their content delivered from the Sydney Edge location. If your user is located in North Virginia, then they will definitely be getting their, their copy of your website from the US East region. So to enable that to happen, CloudFront needs a CloudFront distribution, which is a copy of your website. And what it does, it gets that from the Amazon S3 service. So we're going to get your website and we're going to upload it to Amazon S3 service into what we call a bucket, which will contain that website. And then the CloudFront service will update on a reasonably regular basis, probably every day or whatever we want to specify 
will update its CloudFront distribution and then distribute that across the CloudFront Edge locations. We are also going to have HTTPS enabled. So we're going to have a SSL encryption on traffic coming to and from if we require that. And so we're going to again use the AWS Management Console to create an SSL certificate using the AWS Certificate Manager. Now this in the past used to be quite an expensive thing. You used to have to pay around about $100 to do this and there was a bit of mucking around to get that into Amazon Web Services. And uh, so now it's all very automated and free and uh, a really great simple process to do right now. So that's what it will look like uh, when we finish. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get an Amazon Web Services account. So go to aws.amazon.com if you don't already have an AWS account. Sign up, costs you nothing to sign up. And uh, if you start using their services, you will uh, be able to, for the first 12 months, use it under the AWS free tier. The next thing we need is we obviously need a website. If you don't have one ready to go, there are a couple of sites there where you can get free HTML5 templates, and they're, they're pretty good templates as well. Uh, the ones there are freehtml5.co or html5up.net. And so go to either one of those and uh, download and unzip the file that you get there, and you'll have a, a website ready to go that we can upload to Amazon S3. You're also going to need the course notes for the course. So in the next lecture, uh, if you go to the reference section there, there will be a link to, to download the course notes. And those course notes are quite good. They'll have every step of the way, they'll have screenshots, and you'll be able to just watch the lectures and then go ahead, use these course notes to implement the infrastructure yourself. So that brings us to the end of the intro, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do when we create a website is that we need to purchase a domain name. And we can do that through Amazon Route 53 service. Now that will cost us around about 11 or $12 US, depending on what top level domain you select. Now you can do probably half of the lab without a domain name, without purchasing a domain name if you like, but if, to do the complete lab you're going to have to purchase a domain name. So just a word of warning, that is not covered on the free tier. So we go to services and then we scroll down to networking and content delivery. We go to route 53. And if we've never used Amazon route 53, we get this welcome screen. Now we just scroll over to Domain Registration and click Get Started Now. And then we can click on Register Domain. And we'll put in a domain name there. So I'm just going to get one for my son, who does a little bit of coding. So we'll look for thedevkid.com. And that is available. So what we do is we can click on Add to Cart. And you can see there on the right hand side is a shopping cart and it's been added there at cost of $12 for a .com domain. We scroll down and we go to continue. And you put in your contact details there. And then once you've done that, you can click on continue. Now just down the bottom here, privacy protection is enabled by default. And the good thing about this is that it's free with Amazon Web Services. You don't have to pay extra to get privacy protection and that's one thing about Amazon Web Services that, that with the domain name service that you will find is that it's basically what they tell you it costs is what it costs when you look at other services like like GoDaddy for example you're going to have to pay extra for this and extra for that uh, and the price they give you is really just for that first year and then when it goes to renew it's a lot more than that so once you've put in your contact details, then you'll get this review screen. So just check the terms and conditions. I understand, that's fine. And there'll be a verification email that will be sent to the email address that you put in the contact. Uh, make sure that that email address is a valid email address, otherwise you're going to be in a bit of trouble. So just click on complete purchase. 
and there we go so that's actually done now and so the only thing that needs to happen to actually use that uh, that domain name is that you need to uh, go to this email and click on the link for that email okay so it's been around about half an hour and the process has finally completed I must say it did take a lot longer this time with a brand new account than it normally does with the Backspace Academy account it's normally a lot quicker for some reason with a new account it does seem to take a lot longer uh, so you will have received one email saying action required to verify your email address so you if you clicked on that link then you would receive another email saying that your email address has been verified and then there will be a third email saying that you've re your, your, you've signed up to Amazon Registrar. And then around about half an hour after that, you'll receive uh, an email from Amazon Route 53. And the title of that email or the subject of that email will be your domain was successfully registered with Route 53. So once that's done, you can go back into the console and you can click on Registered Domains and you will see your domain name is there all ready to go and also if you click on hosted zones there will be a hosted zone already set up and we'll talk more about that as we get further on into the lab that brings us to the end of the first part of the lab coming up next we're going to be creating a bucket an Amazon S3 bucket and we're going to be uploading a website to that bucket and we're going to be setting up website hosting from that bucket. I'll see you in the next one. Okay, now we need to create an Amazon S3 bucket that is going to contain our HTML5 website and then we're going to upload our files for that website to that bucket. So again, services and S3. And create bucket. Now our bucket name, it needs to be unique. And the best way to keep it unique is to use the domain name of your website. So I've just got there, the devkid.com. And that will be unique. And click on next. And we're not going to worry about versioning. So we'll click on next. Now this is going to be a public accessed website. So people need to go to a browser and they need to be able to view things. So we need to make sure that it's publicly accessible. So we need to uncheck all of this. And then what we're going to do after we've created this bucket is we're going to associate a policy to that bucket that's going to give a public access for it as well. So we click on next and create bucket. So there's our, our bucket that has been created. So what we need to do now is to create a policy for this bucket. In order to create a bucket policy, we need to first copy the Amazon resource name or the ARN, which is a unique identifier for this bucket. So we go back to the start. So Amazon S3 up here, we click on. We'll scroll, scroll down to our bucket and we'll click on the checkbox here and a pop-up will appear. We'll click on copy bucket ARN. And that will copy that over to our clipboard. Once we've done that, we can go back into that bucket by clicking on the name of that bucket. We'll go into permissions and we click on bucket policy and we're going to scroll down and we're going to click on the policy generator, which is going to allow us to generate a policy for permissions on this bucket. Okay, so there's the AWS policy gen generator. The first thing we need to do is select our policy type, which will of course be an S3 bucket policy. The effect is going to be allow. The principle is going to be everything. So it will be a wildcard symbol. The service is going to be Amazon S3. And the actions is going to be get object. and the Amazon resource name, which we paste in there. Now we don't just paste in the Amazon resource name, we also need to put in a, a forward slash and another wildcard, which is going to give us access to the, to the contents inside of that, of that bucket. Then we click on add statement. 
And there we can see. So we've got a statement there that is going to allow us to get objects from that bucket, anything inside of that bucket. Generate that policy. And what that's done is it has created the JavaScript object notation or JSON that we need to put into our bucket policy. And the action is going to be get object. So what that allows is that anyone can access or get read access to anything inside of this bucket, which is what we want for a publicly accessible website. So what we do is uh, we'll just select all that and control C to copy it. And we'll bring that into our bucket policy. So we go back into our bucket policy editor and we paste that in. And we click on save. And you should get a this bucket has public access message there. If you don't, uh, it's most probably because you haven't created the bucket properly. So go back, read the lab notes very carefully, make sure that you uncheck all of those, uh, those check boxes that needed to be unchecked and you should be fine. But again, read the lab notes. There is a troubleshooting section on this as well if you get stuck. Now, once we've created our bucket, we can now look at uploading our website over to that bucket so we need to have a website to upload so a good place to go is to html5up.net html5up.net if you go there they've got heaps of really really good website templates there that are html5 that, that really look quite nice so i'm just going to download one of these just this massively one that looks fine okay so once that's downloaded just extract it somewhere and we can upload that to uh, to our bucket. Now that we've got our HTML5 website, we've unzipped it, we can now copy that over to our bucket. So we go back into our overview here and we click on upload. Now, the best way to do this, to make sure that everything is, is dragged across is to simply uh, go into Explorer select everything and drop it onto that form there. Uh, don't click on add files, uh, it may not bring everything in. So just drag that across and drop that onto the form. Once you've done that, you can click on next. Now what we need to do is that we need to scroll down to manage public permissions and we need to give public read access to these objects. It'll come up with a little warning there, not a problem, we click on next. We're going to just select standard and we click on next and we upload. Now that has finished uploading. So what we need to do now is that we need to enable S3 website hosting on this bucket and that will allow Amazon S3 to respond to requests from a browser. So we go to properties and static website hosting. And we need to use this bucket to host a website. We need to give the details of our index document and for the one that I've uploaded, it will be index.html. Uh, that is required, you cannot leave that empty, but you can leave the error document empty if you like. Um, and I don't think this pack actually has an error document, so I'll leave that empty and we just click on save. So that has enabled website hosting. So we will have a website now that we can go to. So if we click on that again, if we have a look up here, we've got an endpoint for that, that website. So if we click on that, that should, and as it does, it's created that website for us and it's delivering that website uh, to the browser. So that's great. So the only thing here is that we do have uh, a domain name that's quite very long so obviously as we go on in this lab we're going to change that uh, we're going to put CloudFront in front of this as well so you can deliver this much much quicker so I look forward to seeing you in the next one okay so now we're going to be using the AWS certificate manager to create an SSL certificate 
and we're going to associate that with our domain that we just purchased and by doing that we're going to be able to set up HTTPS for encrypted traffic to our website so we need to go into the AWS certificate manager so go to services and certificate manager and if we've never used it before we've got no certificates we'll have a welcome screen here we don't want to select private certificate authority that is not what you want you want to select provision certificates and we'll click on get started there what we want to do is we want to request a public certificate and we click on request a certificate and what we need to do now is that we need to add in our domain names so the first one there are the devkid.com and what we also want to do is actually have this certificate also for our subdomains as well so we might have a www.thedevkid.com uh, or we might have user.thedevkid.com or whatever so we can put those all in individually if we like so we just go in here and add another name to this certificate so I could you can see that we could put in there www.example.com uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a wildcard symbol so just a star and then dot and then uh, the devkid.com or whatever your domain name is and so what that will do is it will make this uh, this certificate valid for any subdomain as well as the root domain as well we click on next and we've got two options here so bef when certificate manager first came out there was only email validation it did cause a few problems with a lot of students because the emails just seemed to go missing or they typed in the wrong email when they were doing this the certificate so this lab is being recreated uh, using the new DNS validation method which I think is a lot quicker and easier and what it does is, is that because we need to uh, establish an association between our domain name and this certificate what we do is the certificate manager gives us some, some records that we need to put into our domain name service and then the certificate manager can pick those up and by doing that it can identify that that uh, that we do actually have power over that uh, that domain so we click on review and we can see here we've got our domain name and our additional name being our wildcard symbol for all the subdomains and our validation method there is DNS we click on confirm and request okay so it'll take a few seconds to uh, to get its things happening so there it is now because we've selected DNS validation we need to create records in route 53 now there is actually an easier we can actually export these by just downloading this file which will have all those details for us but there is a much easier way and that is simply to by expanding these domains and in there you've got the the name and the C name record type and whatever and we can actually have the certificate manager do it for us so we just click on create record in route 53 and it'll ask us if that's okay and we just click on create and it says success so the DNS record was written to your route 53 hosted zone for that domain it takes up to 30 minutes for that to propagate across the internet and then the certificate manager can pick that up now we should also do that for the wildcard domain but we don't need to because they are exactly the same record so you can see here that is exactly the same as that and that is exactly the same as that so we don't need to do anything we just need to do that once to put that one record if we do it twice it's just going to override the other record okay so we click on continue and that will take us to the uh, to the certificate dashboard which will list all of our certificates so we've only got one there it's pending validation and it'll take about half an hour so you go away have a cup of coffee whatever you want to do and just come back and just click on refresh icon here until it's uh, it's been validated okay so it's been about 20 minutes or so and after clicking the refresh icon we can see that the status is now issued so that brings us to the end of this part of the lab coming up next we'll be creating a cloud front distribution which we'll be putting in front of our static website and that will help us to have really low latency high speed access to our website no matter where in the globe we are actually located so I'll see you in the next one
Okay, so we've got our uh, website up and running. We've got our domain name registered and ready to go. And we've got our SSL certificate all up and running and ready to go and fully issued. The next thing we need to do is that we're going to create a CloudFront distribution and that will be a copy, a cache of our website and CloudFront will distribute that across hundreds of edge locations across the globe. What that will do is it will give your end users very high speed access to your, your website. It also has some advantages. It will reduce your costs because the cost of your users accessing it from an edge location will be less than accessing it from uh, Amazon S3. And also it will provide some additional security because it will be able to prevent uh, DDoS attacks on your website. So what we do now is we go to services and again, uh, not certificate manager, I'll go back again. We go services and cloud front and we create distribution and we want to do a web distribution. Now our origin name, if we just click on that, the origin for our distribution is going to be our S3 bucket that contains our website, of course. So we select it there. It should come in a drop down list. We leave origin path as it is and origin ID. We don't touch anything there. Now we scroll down to default cache behavior. So we would like to have all of our traffic coming or being redirected to HTTPS. So we'll select that. We'll scroll down further. Okay, so what we need to do now is that we need to add our alternate names. And so that will be our domain name. So uh, AWS or CloudFront will create a domain name, which will be a CloudFront domain. And it'll look something like this here. It'll be, uh, you know, a whole heap of letters and numbers followed by .cloudfront.net. And that will be the CloudFront domain. But we don't want that. We want our own. So we put our own one in here. Okay, so we put that one in and we also want to put in our www as well. So if someone accesses our website through the root domain or through www, it will go to this CloudFront distribution. The next thing that we want to do is that we want to use our custom SSL certificate that we created for this, uh, this domain or these two domains. So what we can do is just click on that and we can see again that that is there ready to go on the drop down. So we just select it there and that's all we need to do there. And we scroll down again. Now our default root object. So that what that means is that when someone goes to our, our domain and they type in whatever.com, uh, what file is going to be served up by CloudFront and that will be our index.html. And we scroll down a bit further and we just we don't need to enable IPv6 so we just uncheck that. And I like to put a comment in there um, just to put in the, the actual domain name so as I can find them in this list of CloudFront distributions quite easily. So once we've done that we can just click on create distribution. Now this takes quite some time, probably take about half an hour for the distribution to, to uh, do its stuff. And so again you'll see that it'll be chugging away in progress. Uh, and then after a certain amount of time it will be uh, it will be ready to go and we can have a look at it. Okay so it's been quite some time uh, over half an hour uh, and our CloudFront distribution has now finished doing its stuff so what I can do now is there is this domain name now that is the domain name for the CloudFront cache or the CloudFront distribution that has been distributed across the Route 53 edge locations across the globe. So if we go to that domain, we should see our website. And there you go. So there is our HTML5 website that we uploaded to Amazon S3. The CloudFront service has taken that and it has distributed across all of the edge locations for us. So what we need to do now is that we need to go into Amazon Route 53 and make sure that our requests for our domain name and our www subdomain 
get redirected to this CloudFront distribution. And that's what we will be doing in the next lab. Okay, so we've created our CloudFront distribution and CloudFront has distributed that across all of its edge locations across the globe. What we need to do now is that we need to make sure that Amazon Route 53 domain name service is distributing all of its traffic coming to our domain name out to this CloudFront distribution. So the first thing I want to do is just take a copy of this domain name, the CloudFront domain name, and we're going to jump into Route 53 console. So again, we go to services and Route 53. And a hosted zone would have already been created when we purchased that domain name. And so there it is. And we can see there there's already been four records that have been created for us by AWS. So we have a look at that. And we can see there there's a name server record and a start of authority record and two C name records. So these two were created when we created the, uh, when we purchased the domain name. And these two here were created by the certificate manager when we went through that uh, validation process uh, to create that, that uh, validation between our ownership of this domain and that certificate. So what we need to do now is we need to create a record set for directing traffic from our Apex domain, which is in this case is the devkid.com. Yours will of course be different. And we need to direct that through to our CloudFront distribution. So we select an A record and it will be an alias and it will go to our CloudFront distribution. And so we drop down here, we click on alias target. We will be able to select our, our CloudFront distribution. And then we click on create. So after a certain amount of time, that will propagate across the internet and then when you type into your browser the apex domain there the devkid.com or whatever yours is it will the traffic will be directed through to the cloudfront distribution so we need to create another one for the www so when people go to www uh, they will get directed to that CloudFront distribution as well. Now we're not allowed to create more than one of these A records. We need to create a C name record. Uh, we can't have more than one A going to our Apex, uh, our Apex domain. So we do a C name and that will not be an alias and that will be, we just simply paste in our CloudFront domain. And what that will do, again, is uh, anything that comes in for www.thedevkid.com will be resolved to uh, that CloudFront distribution. Now that will take a while to propagate and Route 53 won't be able to tell you when it's propagated across the internet. So what there is, there's a website called What's My DNS. And if you go there and you just put in uh, the, the domain, so I've got here the devkid.com, and you want to check on the A record, just click on search. And you can see there, I've actually put this in before, uh, and it's, it's propagated quickly. It's not going to propagate that quickly for you. Uh, it's, this is the second time that I've run through this. But it'll take about 15 minutes or so to propagate out. And we can check the www and see whether that one has started to propagate or not. Now that one was a C name record and we can search that as well. And there we go. So that was very quick actually. And that's one thing you'll learn about uh, AWS is uh, or Route 53 is that if you've used other DNS services uh, Route 53 is very quick and very reliable and like everything with AWS uh, it's certainly um, best of class. So that's pretty good. So what we can do now is if we go to the devkid.com there you go. So that's all up and running not a problem and we've got HTTPS here so we, we came in on HTTP and CloudFront automatically converted that over to HTTPS. So we're now on encrypted traffic now. And we do www, it should go to the same area. And there we go. So www is also working. So that's pretty good. 
Okay, so before we finish up with this part of the lab, I just want to give you a quick overview of how to create, how to invalidate a CloudFront distribution. So what I mean by that is that when you create or when CloudFront creates a distribution, it has a time to live or a TTL and it won't be changed until that is up. So if you have a TTL of 24 hours, uh, it's not going to fetch new data or new information from your S3 bucket shorter time than that. So if, for example, you've got something that's critical that needs to be updated on your website and you can't wait 24 hours for it to be updated, what you can do is you can invalidate that CloudFront distribution. You can invalidate, invalidate the whole distribution or just parts of it. So what we do is go into CloudFront and we can click on our distribution and then we can go into invalidations and then we can go in create a validation. So there's a few examples that were there, but you know, if you just wanted to invalidate everything, you could just do a, a wildcard symbol like that and it'll invalidate everything uh, in that domain or in that distribution. If you just wanted to uh, invalidate your um, your main web page, you could just put in index.html, but you click on invalidate and then it will go through and after a certain amount of time, it will come through like this and, and uh, come through as completed. This is one that I did previously because it takes around about 15 minutes or so to invalidate it depending on what you're invalidating. So that brings us to the end of this part of the lab. Coming up next, we're going to talk about using the bucket redirection feature of S3 website hosting. What that means is that we can have traffic that is coming in for a domain and we can redirect it somewhere else, which is really quite handy. So you might have, for example, if we've got, you know, backspaceacademy.com, we might have .net, uh, .com .au, .com .br and all these ones, and we want to redirect them all to the same domain. We can do that by creating a bucket and like what we did before and a, a hosting bucket, but we can select redirection on that bucket and it will redirect everything back to our main domain. So uh, that's coming up next and I'll see you in that one. Okay, so we've created a website. We've hosted that on Amazon S3. We've created a CloudFront distribution. We've purchased a domain name and we've got traffic directed from that domain name through to this CloudFront distribution. Uh, we've got HTTPS encrypted traffic and we've created a SSL certificate using the AWS Certificate Manager. And yes, we've done quite a lot. So give yourself a pat on the back if you've come this far. And we're just going to finish up with talking about another feature of Amazon S3 that is quite handy. If you've got multiple domain names and you want them all to get redirected through to a single domain name. So for example, we've got backspace.academy, but we might have backspaceacademy.com, .net, .net.au, .com.au, .com.br. We might have all these different domain names out there just in case someone types in the wrong thing into their, into their uh, browser. And we want those all to get directed through to our Backspace.academy website. So what we can do is that we can set up buckets for each one of those domain names and we can have that redirected through to whatever domain that we want. And we do that using the S3 website hosting redirection feature. Now what we need to do is we need to go into S3 to make this happen. So what we'll do is we'll go into, into this bucket that we had before. And we go into properties. And we go into static website hosting. And what we're going to do is redirect requests to somewhere. So I've just put in there google.com. And, and I just did that so that you know that it doesn't have to be a website that you own. You can direct it to anywhere on the internet as long as it's a publicly accessed endpoint. So I've just put in there google.com. So if I want everything to come into the devkid.com, it's going to get forwarded over to or redirected over to google.com. So I'm just going to save that. Now if I go to this static website again and I click on that endpoint, it's taking me to Google. 
instead of taking me to somewhere else. So the only thing we, we need to do now is to go into Route 53 and create a record that is going to direct traffic for our devkid.com through to this endpoint here. Okay, so let's jump into the Route 53 management console. So what I need to do now is I need to get this, the devkid.com. I'm just going to delete that, the A record that we set up that's going to redirect to our CloudFront distribution. I'm going to delete that one and recreate it. So create record set. We leave that the same. It's an A record still, but it's alias again. But this time, instead of selecting that CloudFront distribution, we're going to select our S3 website endpoint. What will happen is that when it hits that website endpoint, it's going to redirect all that traffic through to google.com because that's the way we've got it set up. So just click on create. Once that's propagated through, we'll be able to do that. Now I've already done it before, so it should already have been propagated. So I'm just going to put it in here into what's my DNS, search on that, and there we can see it's come through. So if I go to that domain again, have a look, and there we go. It's redirected automatically to google.com, which is pretty good. Now, we can do the same for the www. What we need to do to make that happen is that we need to create another bucket. So we've got our thedevkid.com bucket. We need to create another bucket called www.thedevkid.com. And then again, we create the static website. And this time we would grab that um, that domain minus the HTTP stuff and we would copy that over into here and we would put that in in the C name and we would get rid of that delete that and we would put that in there uh, and and that will redirect that traffic through to that WW it won't if you put the uh, the apex domain one in there it won't work so you need to have one specifically for WWW a bucket for that and redirect that traffic uh, using that here. So I'm not going to go into that because it's just extra work that it's not really going to add any value. It's all in the notes if you want to go through and do that bit yourself as well. So that brings us to the end. You have covered a great deal of stuff. So you now will have a very good knowledge of AWS, I'm sure. And now it's time for you to download those lab notes, go through them very carefully and take your time because there's a lot going on here and make sure that everything's right. And hopefully you get to the end. If not, just drop me a question and I'll be able to help you out. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture on Identity and Access Management, or IAM for short, AWS Organizations and CloudTrail, we're going to start off with talking about the shared responsibility model. What that means is that AWS, they're responsible for their cloud. They're responsible for their infrastructure, but we're responsible for what we do with their cloud. So. If we've got sensitive material and we make that public, that's our responsibility. That's our decision that we made and AWS is not responsible for that. So we have a shared responsibility model around security. We have users, groups and roles that can allow people to access our account and for us to be able to control that access. So we could create a user and that user can access our account. We could create groups of users, or we could even create a role that a resource could assume. For example, it could be a server, and that server could assume a role that allows it to access other services within our AWS account. We have AWS organizations, and they're very important if we have a very large organization that has multiple AWS accounts. How do we manage that and how do we manage that centrally? We do that with AWS organizations. We use IAM or Identity and Access Management policies to define with very fine grained detail what access users, groups or roles have to our account. 
we have identity federation and that allows us to verify the identity of a user through a third party service, for example, through Google or through Facebook. And we can limit what access they have to our account. And finally, we have AWS CloudTrail, which is a very important security service, which tracks all activity to and from services on our account. AWS, it works upon a shared responsibility model for security. What does that mean? AWS, they are going to be responsible for security of their AWS cloud. But you, as a customer, are going to be responsible for what you put in the AWS cloud. For example, AWS is going to be responsible for all of that low-level architecture. They're going to be responsible for those regions, availability zones, edge locations, and those services that they're going to run on that. But from your perspective, you have a responsibility to make sure that what you put in that AWS cloud is secure. For example, if you have an EC2 instance and you have sensitive data that is being controlled by that EC2 instance, you're going to have to make sure that you look after client-side encryption of that data. Also, server-side encryption of that data, if it has drives attached to it or, or devices attached to it, you need to make sure that that data is secure. You also have to make sure that the network traffic coming backwards and forwards from that EC2 instance is secure. For example, you might have a WordPress application that has sensitive information for a customer. You're also going to be responsible for the Linux operating system or the Windows operating system that is going to be running on that EC2 server. You're going to be responsible for not only the Linux firewall configuration, but also on the AWS side with the security groups. You're going to be responsible for that WordPress application that you're running. You're going to have to make sure that the administrator access to that application has good password protection. And also you need to make sure that the users that are accessing your AWS account will have good identity and access management on there and they have least privileges granted to them. And finally, you've got that customer data. You need to make a decision as to what you are going to uh, uh, store as far as sensitive customer data goes. Now this shared responsibility model, it varies according to what service you're using. For example, if you're using a, for example, an abstract service like Amazon S3. So AWS are going to be taking more control over, over that service. It's not going to be like an EC2 server, which would be called a infrastructure service, where AWS are going to be looking after the low level stuff. With Amazon S3, they're going to be looking after a lot more because it's, it's a more abstract service. And in the middle there, we've got container services. A good example of that is the RDS, Relational Database Service. So that fits somewhere in the middle there. So AWS is going to have more responsibility than an EC2 server, but less than Amazon S3. So let's have a look at the infrastructure services. So that is the lowest level of service with AWS, and that includes the Amazon EC2 related services, such as Elastic Block Storage, Auto Scaling, Amazon Virtual Private Cloud. So you control the operating system. You've got a Linux server there. You look after that Linux operating system. You make sure that it's up to date. You make sure that it is secure. You're also looking after the identity and access management of your customers that are accessing uh, that EC2 server. Then we get into container services, which are a little bit more abstract than the infrastructure services. That will include Amazon Relational Database, Amazon Elastic MapReduce, and AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Because AWS are taking a little bit more control over what they're, what they're looking after. So they're going to be looking after the actual platform that's running on there. They're going to be looking after the operating system. So that Linux operating system, you're not going to be looking after that with Amazon RDS. You're not going to be looking after 
patching that uh, MySQL database application that's running uh, on Amazon RDS, AWS will be looking after that for you. So you're responsible for the network controls, you're responsible for your firewall configuration, your security groups, and platform level security. For example, if you've got a MySQL database, you need to make sure that your, your administration for that database is actually secure. And finally, we've got the abstract services. So they're, they're high-level database storage and messaging services, and they include Amazon S3, Amazon Glacier Archiving, DynamoDB, AWS Lambda, Amazon Simple Q Service, and Amazon Simple Email Service. Now, AWS is then going to be taking a lot more control, so they're going to be taking all of this as well. So what that means is that they're going to be managing the underlying service components or the operating system on which they reside. So they're going to be taking a lot more control. So with Amazon S3, they're going to be taking a lot more control around server-side encryption. You just set that up through the console, but AWS manages that for you. Network traffic protection to Amazon S3. AWS will be managing that. And AWS will also be managing a lot of the IA identity and access management with Amazon S3. So why do we need identity and access management? Well, we've got a, an account and we may have that, or there could be an account for an enterprise that may have thousands of employees. How do we manage all of those individual employees? How do we make sure that they've got the correct access levels for our account? How do we manage people that are outside of our enterprise? How do we manage users of our application that might be hundreds of thousands of users that are accessing a web application, for example? So identity and access management allows us to control all of that. It's a web service. You run it through the console and it allows you to securely control individual and groups of individuals access to your AWS resources. You do that by creating and managing user identities, which are called IAM users, and then you grant those users permissions. The features of IAM, it provides shared access to your account. So if you have thousands of employees in your organization, you can give them shared access and individual access to your account. It has granular permissions, so very fine-grained control around what people can do and cannot do and under what conditions they can actually access your account. It provides secure access for Amazon EC2 applications or applications that are running on Amazon EC2 to access resources. So if, if you have a web application that might need to access uh, an Amazon S3 bucket, for example, you can set up a role that can allow that to happen. Otherwise, that Amazon EC2 instance won't be able to access that resource. We can set up identity federation, and that grants permission for users outside of AWS, outside of our account, and even outside of AWS completely. It's PCI and DSS compliant, and it provides access log auditing using the AWS CloudTrail service. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. It is eventually consistent. So it's a global service across all of AWS's regions. And so when you make a change to IAM, it takes a while to that, for that to propagate across all of those regions. So it's eventually consistent. It is something to consider if you're a developer. So don't expect things to happen within microseconds. They'll take a little bit of time before it propagates across. Uh, it won't be a very long amount of time, just a few seconds or so, um, but it is eventually consistent. It's free to use. So by all means, take advantage of it to its fullest extent. It won't cost you a thing. When someone first joins your organization, you would want to set them up as a user on your account. And so users, they represent the person or service that is accessing your account. And they consist of a name and a set of credentials. 
They're identified by a friendly name, or there's three options there for identifying them. They can be identified through a friendly name, for example, Bill, or their Amazon resource name. So that will have the format ARN, colon, AWS, colon, IAM, and then two colons. Because the reason there's two colons there is that normally when you're defining an, an ARN, you will have a region in there. So because IAM is a global service, it will have two colons there. And then the account ID, and then colon user, and then the friendly name of that user. There's also a unique identifier, which you don't need to be too concerned about, but whenever you do a call with the API, the Software Development Kits, uh, Windows PowerShell, or CLI tools, when you create a user, a unique identifier will be returned for that user. So you can use that again uh, in, your, in your application that's running with a Software Development Kit. So the types of credentials that can be associated to a user, we have a console password, which is simply a username and password. And so the user will have a URL link to your, to your, your account, and then they use their console password and, uh, to, to, or username and password to log into your account. We also have access keys, and they consist of an access key ID and a secret access key. There's a maximum of two per user that can be issued, and we use those primarily for programmatic access to AWS. We also use it with the, with the command line interface, so when we're remotely connecting into AWS, we can use those access keys. Now, we have a root user, and that is when we first create a, an account, and we can log in as the root user before we create any IAM users. Never use the root user to access AWS resources unless it is absolutely essential. You should always create an IAM user with the correct permissions that you require and always enable multi-factor authentication of the root user. And we'll talk more about that later on. But the main thing to remember here is that create an IAM user even for yourself, create yourself as an IAM administrator user and don't use your root user access and make sure those credentials for root user access are stored away somewhere because someone can get in and do something malicious. So they could change your credit card details. They could do anything with your, with your account. We have user password and password policies that we can attach to a user. So when a user first signs up, do we want to give them a password that they use or do we want them to generate their own password? Uh, how are we going to do that? So we can set a password policy to do these things and that includes set a minimum password length. We can require that the password has specific characters. We can allow the users to change their own passwords. Otherwise, an administrator will have to change their password for them. We can make passwords expire after a certain amount of time, so after, say, three months, they have to uh, create a new password. We can prevent users from reusing pre previous passwords. Uh, and we can also force users to contact an account administrator if the password has expired. So when someone accesses your account, they're going to access it through a sign-in URL, which will be different from when you sign in as a root user. When you're signing in as an IAM user, you will have this URL link to your account. So that's quite a long thing and, and can be difficult to remember because your AWS account ID is not going to be easy to remember. So if you want something that's easier to remember, you can create a, an account alias. So you could have your company name as your alias, and that would be your alias dot sign in dot AWS dot Amazon dot com forward slash console. And that would be your sign in link to uh, to your account and that's going to be easier for for someone to remember we can also group users and iam groups they're a collection of iam users and when when a user is put into a, a group they will assume the permissions of that group so we can define the permissions of that group we can we can associate a policy or n a numerous policies to a group and then anyone who who is 
associated to that group or inside of that group, any users will assume those permissions of the group. Now, users can belong to multiple groups if they like, but groups themselves can only contain users and they cannot be nested. So you cannot have a group of a group. Groups can only have one level. So groups can only contain users. They cannot contain other groups. Now, roles. Roles are quite important, especially if you have people outside of AWS that need to access your account, where you need to assume temporary credentials. And so what they are, they are defined permissions that can be assumed by users or resources for access to your account. They can be used by EC2 instances to access your resources. For example, if you've got an EC2 instance that is running WordPress or whatever, an application that may need to have access to Amazon S3, you can create a role specifically for that EC2 instance to access those resources. It can also grant access to resources to users in another AWS account, so not even in your AWS account. And so you can do that, you can set that up. And also very important is identity federation where users can, or people outside of AWS completely, not even in the same accounts, people that have nothing to do with AWS, can temporarily assume a role and they can be given least privilege access to resources through this identity federation. I'll give you an example. You might have a, a website, a very popular website, that has hundreds of thousands of users. You're not going to be able to create IAM users for hundreds of thousands of users. So what you can do is that you can authenticate those people using an external service. For example, you could use Facebook to identify them, and then they can have access after they've logged in with Facebook they can have access to your application after that. So the, the ways of, I, I, or the types of identity federation that we can use, we can use AWS Cognito pools. And so that is a preferred way where uh, someone signs up to an AWS Cognito pool with a username and password, and that will be controlled by AWS and they can sign into your application after that. We can also sign in using an OAuth provider such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, or we can use an enterprise service for single sign-on using LDAP or Active Directory. So if you've got an enterprise that has uh, Microsoft Active Directory running, you can set that up so that you can also uh, use Identity Federation from that to access AWS resources. Just imagine you have a very large organization, for example, Ford Motor Company, who has manufacturing operations all around the world. They have marketing operations and they're a very large, large organization and they have multiple AWS accounts for all of those different divisions and geographic areas, for example. AWS organizations allows large companies like that to manage permissions centrally. And that is a big thing because if you have one best way across your organization, you're not going to have little pockets of your organization that are going to be a little bit like the Wild West. So it allows multiple AWS accounts that are used by a large organization to be part of an organizational unit. And actually, it doesn't need to be a large organization. It can be any organization. But you create an organizational unit and that organizational unit will have multiple AWS accounts associated to it. And that organizational unit will have service control policies or SCPs, and they allow the whitelisting or blacklisting of services within that organizational unit. So if you want to centrally stop people from using a particular service, across your entire organization globally, you can do that by blacklisting that service with an SCP. So a blacklisted service will not be available even if the IAM user or group policy allows it. So it doesn't matter what at the lower level happens, if it's a blacklisted service at the organizational unit level, the user won't be able to access that service. The benefits is it's centrally managing 
our policies across multiple AWS accounts. It controls access to AWS services across globally, uh, across your entire organization. It can be used to automate AWS account creation and management programmatically using an API. It also allows for consolidated billing for those multiple AWS accounts. So you can have one, so one single bill uh, at the organizational unit level for all of those accounts. Okay, so how does this all work? On the left hand side there, we've got a master organization. So just imagine that is Ford Motor Company and they've got their own account there, account number four. And they've also, in AWS organizations, set up two organizational units for dev and sales. So let's just concentrate on Bob there. So Bob, he has an IAM policy attached to his, his user, and that allows for access to Amazon S3 and Amazon EC2. But because the dev organizational unit only allows access to Amazon S3, he only has access to Amazon S3. Over on the right hand side there, we've got a different one. So with dev organizational unit, IAM is blacklisted. But we've also got there a wildcard for every service as being whitelisted. So what that means is that every service is allowed, but the IAM is denied. So anyone within organizational unit dev, uh, the maximum permissions they can have is, is to allow for everything except for IAM. So when we look at Bob there, Bob has, uh, has credentials for or IAM credentials that allow him to access Amazon S3 and that comes under the dev organizational units wildcard for, for every service. So he can access Amazon S3, but he could never access IAM because that's controlled centrally by that master organization. IAM policies, they allow fine-grained access to your account. Now, by default, users can't access anything in your account. And so you can grant permissions for those users through an IAM policy. And that will define the effects, actions, resources, and optionally any conditions around the granting of that permission. So for example, there we've got a policy. And if you're a developer, you can see that that is a JSON or JavaScript object notation format. But it's a statement. And the effect is that we're allowing, we're not denying, we're allowing something to happen. And the action that we're allowing is on the service DynamoDB. And we're allowing all actions because there's going to be a wildcard there, the star at the, at the end of that DynamoDB. So we're allowing all actions, all DynamoDB actions on a resource. And the resource there is a table called books. And so if we apply that to a user, he will have full access to that, that books table. Now, on the subject of Amazon resource names, the IAM access policy language, it requires you to specify the resource or resources, and you need to specify those using an Amazon resource name format or ARN. Now, that format consists of ARN colon AWS IAM being the service, and then two columns. The region we have two columns there is that normally you would have the region inside there, but because IAM is a global service, we don't define the region in there, so it's two columns. Then our account ID followed by the resource that we're accessing. Some examples there, we've got an IAM user, and that will be at the ARN, AWS, IAM, two columns, and then the account name, and then the resource, which is a user, and then the name of that user will be Bob. And we can see there again for group will be the same, but will be group and then forward slash developers if, uh, for the name of our group. And then we have the IAM role, and that will be the role followed by a forward slash and then 
what that role actually is. And there we've got, it's going to be S3 access for that role. And an instance profile that can be associated with an EC2 instance will be ARN colon AWS colon IAM two colons, the account name, and then another colon followed by instance profile and then forward slash and then the instance profile that is associated with that EC2 instance. If we're looking at federated user identities, they will look like, or the ARN will look like ARN colon AWS colon STS, not IAM. So that's the secure token service, STS, and then two colons, and again, the account name, followed by a colon, and then federated dash user, and then forward slash the name of that federated user. IAM policies are not the only policies that you can use to restrict access to AWS resources. So IAM user-based policies, which we're talking about, but there are also a number of resource-based policies that are applied to an actual resource, not a user or an IAM group or user. So IAM policies can restrict access to a resource, so they're providing resource level restriction and they are attached to a user group or role. They're attached to an IAM entity, and they will specify the actions that are permitted and the resource that they're permitted to access. For example, an EC2 instance, an RDS database, or whatever. Now, they are different from resource-based policies, and resource-based policies will be attached to the actual resource. For example, an Amazon S3, it can have a bucket policy or an access control list attached to that Amazon S3 bucket. So although you might be able to create a user and have permission for that user to access an Amazon S3 bucket, uh, that Amazon S3 bucket may also have a bucket policy on there that may further restrict access uh, for that IAM user. The same goes for Amazon Glacier Vaults and they could have vault access policies. And we can also have policies around SNS topics, SQSQs, and also the AWS key management service, encryption keys as well. Identity federation, it allows us to define an IAM role that will specify the permissions for externally identified or federated users to access our account. A good example of that would be if we had a very popular website that had hundreds and thousands of members. Now we have a maximum of 5,000 IAM users per account. So we're not going to be able to create individual IAM users to access our AWS account because we've got hundreds of thousands of those. So Identity Federation enables us to, uh, to create unlimited temporary credentials for these externally identified users. So we can identify these users uh, by our organization. We could have our own system in place, or we could use a third party identity provider to do that. So the different methods that are available, the preferred method would be Amazon Cognito, Amazon's identity uh, verification service and we could have developer authenticated identity so we could implement our own system that within Amazon Cognito we could have guest access or we could use a public identity service provider or we could use open ID connect so an example of that would be Facebook using uh, login with Facebook or login with Google or login with Amazon uh, we can use their accounts to verify them and then give them temporary access, uh, limited access to our account. We could also use an identity provider software package that supports security assertion markup language too, or SAML2 for short. We could also create our own custom identity broker application that could authenticate users for us. For example, we could use our enterprise's LDAP or Microsoft Active Directory service to authenticate our users through this identity broker application that we create. 
And then that application would assume those temporary credentials for the user. And then the user could access uh, those resources through this custom application. We could also use the AWS directory service for Active Directory. And this is great because we can use it for our enterprise access and also for our AWS access to our account at the same time. AWS CloudTrail is a very important service of AWS. Just looking at the right hand side there, when, when we use the AWS Management Console and we access a service, in the back end there, there is an API call that's made from, from our desktop computer or our laptop or whatever. An API call is made to AWS to access that service. And that's the same with the software development kit. For example, if you've got a JavaScript application and you're running that, it will be doing API calls in the background to AWS. The same for the AWS command line interface. All of those services use the AWS API to communicate directly to AWS. And in the past, uh, there was a lot of good documentation on the AWS API, but it seems to have disappeared because uh, nowadays you don't really need it because the SDKs do everything that the uh, API does anyway. Because those API calls are being made, the CloudTrail service, when it's set up, can log all of those API calls to AWS services. And so those logs will be stored in an S3 bucket and they can be analyzed later on. So if you've got an Elastic Map Reduce job or a Amazon Athena uh, analysis, you can analyze that bucket and have a look at those, those log calls to AWS services. And if you find that there's something peculiar going on, then you can take action. And you can also set up an SNS topic that can alert you to problems uh, if they occur and so that's a very important thing so it's and this is really important to understand that you can have all the firewalls you can have all this network access control this and all this sort of stuff but what happens when you have a, an attack from within your organization what happens when it's no longer outside of your your organization you have an attack from within and this is where CloudTrail is extremely important because it alerts you to those issues that are occurring you know, within your account as well as outside of your account. Now, there are a number of IAM best practices that AWS recommend, and there's quite a few of them. You need to understand them for the exam. So make sure that you understand what they are and why, why they are a best practice. So we've already talked about root user access. Lock away those credentials and don't use them. The only, only time you would really need to use them would be if you're changing your credit card details. Other than that, you don't need to use it. Use an individual IAM user instead. Use groups to manage permissions of people. So assign people to groups and let them assume those positions. We've got AWS defined policies. Take advantage of those. So it's no point trying to create your own policy when there's one that's really good that works that AWS have already created for you and use those wherever possible. Now there's a, a term here that gets used a lot in AWS and that is grant least privilege. So what that means is only give people access to what they need to access and only give them access to that under the conditions that they will need to access. Don't give them anything more than that. Grant them the least privilege. And use access levels when you're reviewing IAM permissions. So what that means is you might have a bucket there and you want to look at a user and say, well, does that user need to list the contents of that bucket? Do they need to also read the contents of that bucket? Do they need to write to that bucket? Do they need to manage the permissions of that bucket? And so if you think about your permissions around the access levels perspective, it provides a very quick way and very thorough way of creating good quality uh, access control. Configure a strong password policy for your users 
and also enable multi-factor authentication. And we'll talk more about that coming up, but that is very important. And also make sure that multi-factor authentication is on your root user access. Rotate your credentials re regularly. Make sure that they expire and they need to be recreated. Rotate them regularly. And remove unnecessary credentials. If someone leaves your organization, make sure that that IAM user is removed. Otherwise, you, you may have problems. Use policy conditions. So you can grant someone access, but you can also put in conditions around how they can access that and under what conditions can they access those resources. For example, you might have an S3 bucket with sensitive information in there, and you might say that that person who or that user must have logged in with multi-factor authentication to access that. And finally, and very importantly, take advantage of CloudTrail to monitor the activity, all of the activity going on in your account. So that brings us to the end of a very long lecture, but it's a very important one. So make sure that you understand all this stuff uh, because it is probably the most important subject for AWS. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lab on IAM, we're going to run through some of the main features of IAM. We'll create a user, we'll create a group, and we'll add that user to that group. We'll create a password policy. We'll set up an IAM role for EC2 instances. We'll create an account alias, which will make life easier for us to log into our account. And finally, we'll create a credentials report, which will list all of the credentials that we've got for this account and the activity of those. Okay, so we start off at services and IAM. And we go to users. Now we want to add a user. We'll give that user a name. And we're going to give this user both programmatic access, and programmatic access means that they can use the command line interface or the software development kits with a access key and a secret access key. And we're also going to give this person console access as well, so they can log into the management console. We'll use an auto-generated password, and we'll require that they have a password reset when they first log in. Click on Next Permissions. Now, because we're going to be creating a group which will have those permissions, and when this user will be added to that group, they will inherit the permissions of the group. So we don't need to define the permissions at the user level. So we're just going to click on Next Review. And we can see there that we've got the username as test user, and they've got both programmatic and console access. Auto-generated password, and they require a password reset. And they've, they've also got permission to change their own user password, because by default they don't have that. Um, but because we selected uh, the option that they have to change their password, then that automatically attaches that policy for us. So we click on Create User. Okay, so the user has now been created. So what we've got now are the credentials for the user. So the user's name is test user. Now for programmatic access and for command line interface access, we need the access key ID and the secret access key, which is what we've got there. And then we've got the password, which is what we use combined with the username to log into the console. So we can send an email to someone with that or we can download those credentials here as well. And so if we download this CSV, but we need to do one or the other, because once we click on close, we can't get this information again. So we need to get this information now. So either download this CSV or send an email. I'd probably recommend you download the CSV. And that will have all of, those, all of that information on there. And it'll also have this sign-in URL as well. So we'll just click on that. I'm just gonna download that now. And, and I'm just going to, now that I've downloaded that, I'll, I'll close it. Okay, so there's our user that has been set up for us. 
Okay, so now that we've created a user, I'm going to create a group now. And we're going to associate a policy to that group and that will have permissions for anyone that enters that group. And then we're going to get our user and we're going to put that user inside of that group and then that user will inherit the permissions of that group. So let's click on Groups, Create a New Group. I'm going to call this Administrators. We'll click on Next Step. So now we need to attach a policy. So we can create our own policy or we can get one ready-made, which is what we would normally do. So there's one just here, Administrator Access, that will be fine for us for Administrators. We'll click on Next Step. So we can see there that we've got our group called Administrators and we've got the policy that's going to be attached to it for Administrator Access. We'll click Create Group. Okay, so that group has been created now. So what we can do now is we can select that group. We go to Group Actions and we can add users to that group. So we select our test user and we add that user to our group. So now when we click on that group, I'll just go back to groups again, so we can click on this group and we can see here the users for that group are test user and the permissions is administrator access. So now our test user previously had uh, no access and now they've got administrator access. Okay, so now that we've got our user in a group, what we'll do is we'll we'll look at the password policy that we've set up for that user. So again, we'll go to Users and we'll select our test user. Just click on the name there. And we're going to go to Security Credentials. And there we can see that we've got the, part, the console password and we can manage our password here. So console access is enabled and we're going to keep the existing password or use an auto-generated password. We'll use an auto-generated password. Require a password reset and we'll put that in there as well. And so then we, that's how we can actually change the individual password policy for a user as such. And so when they first log in, they're going to have to have an auto-generated password and they're going to have to require a password reset. So we'll click on Apply. So now we can download the CSV file for that and that will have the login details for that. So we'll just download that and that will have the, the new password that has been auto-generated for this user. So we can also manage passwords at the account level as well. So what we can do is we can go to account settings over here and we can manage our account password policy from here. And so here you can see we've got a number of options so we can require at least one uppercase letter one lowercase letter, at least one number, uh, allow users to change their own password. We can put in password expiration time. So if we wanted, wanted the password to expire in say 90 days, we can put that in there. So there's a lot of things that we can set up for a password policy and that will be applied to all users of, of the account. And so we just click on apply password policy for that. And so that's been done there for us. Okay, so now that we've created users and groups and we've looked after passwords and uh, password policies and all that, what we'll look at now is having roles for EC2 instances. So if we've got an application running on EC2 and we want that application to access resources within our AWS account, we need to allow that to happen. So if, it wants, if, if we want our, uh, our EC2 server to for example, access to a bucket, then we can create an IAM role that can allow that to happen. If we want our EC2 server to uh, read CloudWatch logs, for example, then we can set that up as well. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll create an EC2 role now. So we go to roles and you can see it just tells you what a role is all about. And it's not only for EC2, but we can use it for IAM users in another AWS account to uh, to access our account, we can use it for a federated identity through, for example, logging in with Google or Facebook or with a enterprise SAML application 
all this sort of stuff. But for now, we just use it for an EC2 instance. So we click on Create Role. So we're going to choose, we're going to use an AWS service and we're going to choose the EC2 service. And that will allow our EC2 instances to call AWS services on our behalf. So we just select that and then we go to permissions. So again, we need to attach a policy for this role. Just the same as we attached a policy for our group before, we need to do this for this one here. So I'm just going to search for EC2. Okay. Okay, so this one down the bottom here, which is CloudWatch Actions EC2 Access, we'll select that one. And so that will provide read-only access to CloudWatch alarms and metrics. Okay, so we click on Next Review. We'll give that a name. We won't worry about giving it a description. There's one there that's quite okay. And we can see there that we've got that password, or that, sorry, that policy attached to that, which is CloudWatch Actions for EC2. And we'll click on Create Role. Okay, so I've already got a role here before, just ignore that one, but here is the role that we just created. So we can click on that and have a look at it. So there we can see we've got our, our policy on there. And we've also got an ARN for this role but we won't worry too much about that. So that's all been done and looking pretty good. So what we can do now is that we can look at creating an account alias. So if we go to the dashboard and we can see here, we've got the, the sign in link and you can see it's quite difficult to remember. The sign in .aws .amazon .com forward slash console is reasonably easy to remember, but remembering the big long account number is not so good. So what we can do is we can click on customize and we can give that account an alias. Okay, so I'm just going to call mine Backspace-Labs, but please don't call yours Backspace. Call, call it something else that's unique for you. Uh, and I'll just click on Yes, Create. And there you can see now the sign-in link is Backspace-Labs. Dot sign in dot AWS. And so that's a lot easier for, for you to remember. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is show you how to get a credentials report. Now that's quite a handy thing to know all of the credentials that you've got out of there and whether they're being used or not. If you've got a large organization, you want to be able to know that those credentials are being used. Uh, and if they're not, then get rid of them. So you can go to credentials report and then click on download report and that credentials report will, will download. So when you open that up, okay, so you'll see here that we've got the, the user. So we've got our root, root account access and we've got our test user that we created. They've got an ARN or an Amazon resource name and the user is created on this date. And we've got password enabled. And we can see here whether we've got multi-factor authentication active, which we don't. But in the next lab, we're going to have a look at that creating multi-factor or, or and implementing multi-factor authentication. And so it gives you a lot of uh, information there around uh, what is going on with your, with your credentials. So that's a handy thing to have. So that finishes up for this IAM lab. Coming up next, we'll have a look at implementing multi-factor authentication on our root account. And I'll see you in that one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lab on multi-factor authentication, we're going to be implementing MFA on the root user access. And that is very important because if you have an IAM user compromised, you can quite simply delete that IAM user. But if you have your root access compromised, then you just won't have access at all. And it will create a lot of problems if, if you actually have your root user access compromised. So it's vitally important that you set up 
multi-factor authentication on root user. So the first thing we need to do is we need to download Authy. So you go to Authy.com in the download section. Now there's a number of options for downloading. You can use any of these. You can download it onto your mobile application for, um, for iOS or, or um, Android. There's a desktop application as well for Mac and Windows. If you're going to select the 64-bit Windows, make sure you're running 64-bit Windows, otherwise we're going to have a problem. And for Linux, you should be able to use the uh, Authy in your Chrome browser. You should be able to use that with uh, Chromium, I guess. Uh, I haven't tried that myself, but that should work for Linux users. So download those. Uh, I'd probably recommend you download both the desktop and the mobile application because it's good to have both in case one goes a bit haywire. You've always got the other one as a backup. Okay, so once you've got Authy downloaded, just run the desktop app um, and set up your account. So you need to put in your country code and your phone number in there and then click on next. Okay, so once you've put in your phone number details, if you used a landline number, you'll have to select phone call. Otherwise, you can select SMS. Uh, if you've already set up Authy uh, and you've already been using Authy in the past, you can use your existing device to do that. Uh, but just click on probably SMS if you're using a mobile or phone call to verify your account. Okay, so once we've got Authy set up, then we can go back into the IAM Management Console. We'll go to the Dashboard. And you can see here under Security Status, we've got a warning here that's saying Activate MFA on your root account. So we just click the drop down there and we can manage MFA. So we're going to be using a virtual MFA device, which is what Authy is. It's a software application. It's not a hardware device. And next steps, and it's telling us to download and install an MFA compatible application, which is what Authy is. So next step. Okay, so if we're using the mobile application, we can open it up and in the top right hand corner there, there'll be a drop down menu. And what you can select there is Add Account and then Scan QR Code. And when you scan that, that will order it automatically add uh, the AWS account to your uh, virtual MFA device. If you're using the Authy desktop app, you need to just cut and paste the actual key in there, which is what I'm going to do now. So just double click on that and copy it. And I'll copy that into Authy. So what I do is I click on the plus sign for Authy here. And I'll just open that up here. And I put that key in there now. And I click on Add Account. So what it's going to do now, and you don't have these options for the mobile application, it just automatically just puts it in for you. But what you can do is you can select whatever you want here. So if you scroll down, you can see the icon for Amazon Web Services. So just put that on there and give your account a name as well. So I'm just going to call mine Backspace Labs. Make sure you don't call yours Backspace Labs. Call yours whatever, something different other than Backspace. And click on Save. Okay, so there we have created for us. Uh, our, our account has been set up for multi-factor authentication on Authy. So what we need to do now is get this, this number here, this 817519, and put it into here. Okay. And then we're just going to wait a while for it to change. So it's now changed. So we just put the second one in there now. Okay. So once we've got those two authentication codes, we can click on Activate Virtual MFA Device. So there we have. The MFA device has been successfully associated with your account. So if we now refresh the console. And we can see there that we've got Act Activate MFA on our root account. It has got a big green tick to it, so we've already done that. So next time we log into our MFA root account, what will happen is that we'll put in our username and password, and there'll be a second process where we have to put in uh, this number or this code from Authy. So that brings us to the end of the MFA lab. And make sure that you go and download the lab notes and follow this through quite carefully because it's very important to set that up.
And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the Trusted Advisor service of AWS. Now, what that is, it is a online service that will audit your infrastructure against best practices across a number of different areas, being cost optimization, performance, security, fault tolerance, and service limits. Now, make sure that you remember those because it may come up on the exam. Now, depending on what level of support you've got with AWS will determine how detailed the Trusted Advisor report will be. So this account here has enterprise level support from AWS. So it has all of the available recommendations from Trusted Advisor. But if you've just got a standard account, it'll have the majority of these will be grayed out, but you will have the essential ones there. So don't be too concerned if everything is not there and available for you. It just means that you haven't uh, you haven't got that level of support from AWS. So looking at the first one here, we've got cost optimization. And so everything is with a green tick. So there's nothing for us to be concerned about. But I can click on that and have a bit of a closer look at it. So we can see there it's looking for idle DB instances or EC2 instances or any sort of instance that we're not using. We need to get rid of those and save the money. Uh, we can see there idle load balances, EC2 instances that are not utilized fully and they can go to a smaller EC2 instance, unassociated elastic IP addresses. So there's quite a bit of stuff there that it can recommend for us that can save us quite a bit of money. And not only that, is that we can actually expand these and it will tell us exactly where these resources are. So that can be quite difficult to track those down sometimes, but this will make life a lot easier for you. Trusted Advisor can also advise us on performance, how we can reduce the bottlenecks in our infrastructure, how we can reduce our cost with resource record sets in Amazon Route 53, how we can use CloudFront in front of our our buckets to minimize our costs for delivery of that content. In security, there's also a lot of areas that we can look into. Right here, we've got everything in green, but we've also got two which are actually alerting us to a problem. So we can see down here, we've got, we don't have CloudTrail logging on any of the regions here. So that's something that we'd want to implement. We also have some security groups that have unrestricted access. So let's have a look at those. So I can see here when I've created a WordPress AMI or used the WordPress AMI for a lab, it's created a security group and by default, it's just had that open on port 22 for, uh, for all IP. So we can now just click on that and it'll take us straight there where it is. So we can see there, here are these two security groups and they're being created for that WordPress AMI. So if we have a look at that and we can see there we've got SSH and we use SSH or secure shell to connect directly into the Linux operating system of an instance. And we can see there on port 22, it's open for everyone. So that's not desirable. Uh, it's not a major deal, but it is not desirable to have that. And so we can edit that and we can change that to our IP. So the only way of accessing over secure shell be, will be from our own IP address. Anything else outside of our IP address will not be allowed. But that said, you still need AWS credentials to actually get in anyway. But again, it's not a good practice and you should have that locked down as well. So what I'm going to do is just delete those So they've gone now. So I can go back to Trusted Advisor. And if I refresh this one, that should no longer be a warning. Okay, so after a short amount of time, those uh, that warning for or that alert for those security groups has now disappeared. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. So let's go to Fault Tolerance. And here we can see we've got two warnings there for S3 bucket logging and also for versioning on our bucket. So it's not uh, it's not a major deal, but it's something that it's recommending we should do. We should have versioning on a bucket. That's that's certainly a best practice. And finally, we've got service limits. So if we're exceeding our service limits, that's going to cause problems for us. If we're exceeding 
the number of instances that, that, you know, that we should have, then we're going to have a problem when we go to launch instances. But you can see there we've got no problems there, but it goes through uh, a whole heap of different stuff there to make sure that you're not exceeding the service limits. For example, elastic IP address. So if you're getting close to that, uh, then it will warn you uh, that there is a problem with that. So that's the Trusted Advisor service. So make sure that you go to it. And the way you get there is go to Services and Trusted Advisor, quite simply. Uh, and, and again, your Trusted Advisor won't be as complete as this one if you don't have uh, enterprise support from AWS. Um, but still, it's a good idea to go and have a look at it and just see how it all works. So that's it. And I'll see you in the next lab. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture on Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2 for short, we're going to start off by looking at the different ways that you can purchase an EC2 server, and also look at the different instance types that are available and for the different applications you may use those. Then we'll look at the instance lifecycle. What happens to an instance from when it is launched through that process through to when it is actually terminated. We'll look at cluster networking and how we can group clusters of EC2 servers and interconnect them with high-speed networking. We'll look at the storage options that are available to attach to our EC2 instances. And finally, we'll look at the options that are available for us to connect remotely in to our EC2 server operating system. There are a number of different options that are available for us when we're purchasing EC2 servers. Up till now, we've been using on-demand instances and they're the, the most easy to understand. We simply launch an instance and from that point onwards, we're paying by the second at a flat rate for that instance. There's no upfront cost for launching it and there's no cost when we terminate it. We just pay by the second for what we use. Now for AWS to have capacity available for these on-demand instances, AWS needs to have a certain level of reserve capacity available to fulfill that. So if all of a sudden everyone just comes along and wants to start launching EC2 instances, there needs to be a little bit of reserve capacity available. Now, instead of having that capacity just sitting there doing nothing, what AWS does is that they have that capacity available for people to bid on. And so whoever bids with the highest price can get that capacity. And it's a little bit like eBay for reserve capacity of EC2. And that helps you to significantly reduce the cost of running instances. And it's generally the cheapest option, although not always. The reason is, if all of that capacity has been taken and the spot price goes through the roof and your maximum spot price is above an on-demand instance, then you're going to be paying a premium for that instance. So you're really putting down there a maximum price that you are willing to pay. The downside is that AWS, they can take that capacity back whenever they want. And that's called a spot instance interruption. And they can also take it back when the spot price for that next hour exceeds your maximum price. So that is something that you need to take into consideration. It's really best for batch type compute processes. For example, if you had big data stuff that need to be processed. And, and once it's processed, you don't need that capacity anymore. A spot instance is great for that. Now, if your spot instance is terminated or stopped uh, by AWS, within that first instance hour, you won't be charged anything for that usage. If you terminate that instance within the first hour or any other hour after that, you're going to be charged per second or the per nearest second for the use of that instance. So as we mentioned before, there is a significant amount of reserve capacity available for these on-demand instances and for the variation in usage of those instances. Now, there is also a very 
unlikely possibility that that reserved capacity is actually used up as well by all the on-demand instances. So there are a number of other options that are available for you to reserve capacity outside of on-demand instances. The first option there is a reserved instance. Now, what that means is that if you find that you are going to be using a certain level of capacity of EC2 over the next year or two years or up to three years, you can go to AWS and say, right, I would like to have this capacity available for me for that period of time, and you can use that capacity. And by making that commitment to AWS over that period of time, you are going to get a discount on the cost of your instances. A scheduled instance is where you can purchase instances, but instead of being over a one-year period, continuously, you can have it over a one-year period intermittently on a schedule. For example, you might use it for one day in a month for, I don't know, accounts processing or something like that. And so that will give you that reserved capacity that you need for that specific time of every month or week or whatever. On-demand capacity reservations are different to reserved and scheduled instances in that you're not entering into a long-term contract. These reservations are on-demand. You use them when you need them or you create a capacity reservation when you need it. When you don't need it, you just stop it and there's no long-term contract. Now, the downside is that it is at the on-demand rate. So you might have a capacity reservation that you never use, but you will still be paying for the cost of an on-demand instance. So that needs to be taken into consideration because there is no cost benefit with a on-demand capacity reservation. But it does reserve capacity for you in the event that something goes wrong with AWS and they run out of on-demand instances that are available. You will always have an on-demand instance available for you. And finally, we have dedicated instances and dedicated hosts. With a dedicated instance, you're going to be paying by the hour for an instance that will be running on single tenant hardware. They will be hardware that only you will be using. And we also have dedicated hosts where you're going to be paying for a physical host that is fully dedicated to running your dedicated instances. Another way that you can reduce your EC2 costs is through a savings plan. That allows for reduced pricing in exchange for consistent usage in dollars per hour over a one or three year commitment. The difference between this and a reserved instance is that this is based on your historical usage in the AWS Cost Explorer. And those recommendations within the AWS Cost Explorer will be used as a basis for that saving plan. There are two types of savings plan. You can have a compute savings plan that will be the most flexible and that will apply to all the different instance types, the size of the instance, the operating system, or any tenancy type. And that is going to provide up to 66% off your normal on-demand rates. The other option there is an EC2 instance savings plan, and that is applied to an individual instance family. For example, if you select an M2 type, and that is applied to a specific region as well, and that can provide up to 72% off of the on-demand rates. You can also reduce cost depending on what payment option you come up with. So if you decide to have no upfront payment and just simply pay on a monthly basis, that is one option. If you want to reduce it from that, you can go to a partial upfront cost, and that is going to reduce the price over a no upfront, or you can do everything upfront in one payment, and that will provide you with the lowest price of your savings plan. Another thing to take into consideration is that a savings plan does not provide capacity reservations. But that said, there is nothing stopping you from including your capacity reserved instances 
into a savings plan. But the savings plan itself does not provide that capacity reservation. To prepare for the Cloud Practitioner exam, you will need to understand these different reserving options that are available, but it can be a little bit confusing. So having a look here, I've got the capacity reservations and the two different types of reserved instances. So we have reserved instances that are reserved based upon an availability zone. They're zonal reserved instances. We have regional reserved instances that are reserved within a specific region. And then finally, we have our savings plan. The first point there is the term. With a capacity reservation, there is no long-term commitment required. Whereas with the others, there is a required, either a fixed one year or a three year commitment. With capacity benefits, the capacity reservations and the zonal reserved instances, they reserve capacity within a specific availability zone. But if you're going for a regional reserved instance, not a zonal reserved instance, that will not provide capacity in that availability zone. So although you're going to get the cost benefits, that capacity will not be reserved. The same again with a savings plan, that does not provide a capacity reservation. But with a savings plan, you can always include as part of that savings plan, a capacity reservation as well. Capacity reservations do not provide for a billing discount. But that said, you can use capacity reservations with a savings plan or as part of a regional reserved instance plan as well. So both the zonal reserved instance and the regional reserved instances and the savings plan, all of those provide for a billing discount. And finally, there are different instance limits that are applied to these different plans as well. So if you're going for a capacity reservation, that is simply going to be limited by your EC2 on-demand instance limits, which are applied per region. If you're going for a zonal reserved instance, that's going to be limited to 20 per availability zone. If it's a regional reserved instance, that will be limited to 20 per region. But both of those... If you find that you need to exceed that, you need more than 20, you can put in an application to AWS support to have that limit increase uh, affected for you. And with a savings plan, there is no limit on the amount of instances that can be applied to that savings plan. There are a number of different instance types that are available for us to select with EC2. The first one, and the one that we've been using so far, is the general purpose types. They're great for, as the name suggests, for general purpose databases, data processing tasks, backend servers, and the like. The next one there is compute optimized. So it's going to have a lot of compute capacity available, and that's going to be good for web servers, for batch processing, and the like. Memory optimized is great for high performance databases, and for in-memory caches where we need to respond very quickly to requests instead of having to go back to uh, a hard disk to retrieve that, uh, that information. And we've got GPU or graphics processing units uh, and accelerated computing instance types. And they're great for 3D applications for video encoding. They're great for machine learning and AI applications as well. And finally, we've got storage optimized, which is going to be great for your big data stuff. It's going to be great for NoSQL databases, for MongoDB. It's going to be great for Elastic MapReduce, for data warehousing, anything that requires a large amount of storage. Now, with all these EC2 instance types, we have a choice of Linux and a whole heap of varieties of Linux or Windows Server. And if you want more information on those types, there is a link there uh, to the EC2 instance types page. The instance types that we've looked at previously are running under a virtualized environment. So what that means is that the EC2 service has physical hardware and on top of that hardware is running a hypervisor. And on top of that hypervisor are virtualized servers running on that. And so a Linux operating system is not actually running 
on physical hardware. It's running on a hypervisor, a virtual environment. And that goes the same whether it's Windows or Linux under EC2. EC2 bare metal instances are running on a non-virtualized environment. And the operating system is running directly on that EC2 physical hardware. It's particularly suitable for applications that benefit from deep analysis of the performance of the underlying hardware, or specialized workloads that require direct access to that physical hardware as well. There could be legacy workloads that are just not running on a virtualized environment, and you need to have the actual access to a physical environment to run it. There may also be licensing restricted applications that rely upon that physical hardware uh, for license validation. Examples of bare metal instances are the i3, M5 metal, R5 metal and Z1D metal instance types. The T2 burstable performance instances, now they don't blow up on you, they don't explode or burst, but they're a very important instance that you need to understand. So what burstable means is that this instance will operate at what we define as a baseline performance, but it will have an ability to burst above that for a short period of time if need be. And that will be governed by what we call CPU credits. So the more CPU credits that we have available, the longer that we can burst and for the most amount that we can burst above our baseline performance. So that's great if we have demand that is not predictable. It's a bit all over the place, but we kind of know where our average for that 24 hour period is. T2 instances are great when used with an auto scaling group because when an instance is launched, it may take 15, 20, 25 minutes or whatever to go through that whole launch process that may be required. So that may be too long. And by that period of time, that burst of, of demand has disappeared. So the T2 burstable performance instance will fill that void and provide instantaneous response to that increased demand. Credits, they're built up over a 24 hour period. So if you stay below that baseline, you're going to build up credits for every hour that you are under that baseline. And then you can use those credits when needed to burst above that baseline capacity. And after the 24 hour period, uh, that will be reset. Now, if you're finding that you're never having enough CPU credit balance to burst, that means that the average demand that you're getting over that period of time, that 24 hour period of time, is above what your baseline capacity that you're planned for is. So you need to consider upgrading to a larger instance uh, to keep below that baseline capacity. Now there's another option there called the T2 Unlimited, and that will provide that burstable high CPU availability at a flat additional rate of five cents per vCPU hour, and that is for as long as you need it. So instead of building up CPU credits, you just get billed for what you use. Graviton instance types, they are based upon a 64-bit ARM Neoverse core. If you've used a Raspberry Pi before, you've obviously taken advantage of an ARM Cortex core that provides very low cost, high performance. But this is an ARM Neoverse core, and the Neoverse cores are optimized for large infrastructure such as cloud infrastructure. And they will provide a very low cost and high performance compute capacity. So if you have something that is really compute intensive, and it will run on an ARM core, then by all means use that and it will provide a fantastic performance for you at a much more reasonable cost. The first generation are called the A1 instance type, and the second generation are the Graviton 2 processors, and they can provide up to 40% better price performance over the comparable 
current generation x86-based instances. Graviton instances are perfect for scale-out applications that can run on multiple small cores. But you need to take into consideration that not all software will run on an ARM core. But if it does, this is a great option for compute-intensive applications. If you find that you want to have a mix of different instance types and you want to have a mix of on-demand and spot instance options available, you can create an EC2 fleet of instances. And you can create an unlimited number of instance types per EC2 fleet. So you can mix and match. You can put a T2 in there with a M1, whatever. And you have the choice of mixing both on-demand instances and spot instances. So you can have a baseline capacity there, but you can also have also spot instances available in that EC2 fleet as well. So it's only available through using the AWS API or one of the software development kits or using the command line interface. You cannot do this through the console and it's available across multiple availability zones but not across multiple regions. So you need to create uh, an EC2 fleet in each region if you want to have that happening in each region. And there's no additional charge for using EC2 fleet. We already know what an Amazon machine image is or an AMI. We have used an AMI to launch a WordPress server and we know that it provides the information that is required to launch that instance. And that includes a template for the root volume of that instance. For example, the operating system will have the Linux operating system. It will have the WordPress application there that will be required that goes on that root volume. It will also have launch permissions for that AMI. So if it's a public AMI, it will have availability to all AWS accounts. If it's a private one, it will be private to that AWS account or certain AWS accounts. It will also have a block device mapping and that will specify any volumes that are attached to that instance when it's launched. We have the AWS marketplace where people can put AMIs on there and sell them or give them away for free. So they can be paid, they can be free, they can be trial versions of AMIs or, or of software, or they could be BYO licensed software. For example, it could be an Oracle database and you bring your own license uh, to use it. And so you can normally find a great deal of applications on that AWS marketplace. And we've already used that before because we've used it to launch a WordPress application. There are a number of different states of an EC2 instance depending on whether the root volume of the instance is an EBS or elastic block storage type. And we'll talk more about EBS and instance store volumes. But if you have an EBS type, you can actually stop and start those instances. But you can't do that if you have an instance store type of root volume attached to that instance. So with an EBS backed instance, you can stop it and that instance will be shut down and you're not going to be get, getting any more instance charges. But you will still be charged for any EBS volumes or any drives volumes that are attached to that EC2 instance. And if you stop an instance in less than one minute, then you're still going to be charged for that one minute when you restart it. There is another option and that is stop hibernate. And again, it's only for EBS backed volumes. And that is very good because it will suspend all of your RAM to disk. So it will save your RAM to the EBS volume. So it will allow for your instance to come back online uh, very quickly and it will keep all of that session data that was stored uh, in that RAM. The other option there is that we can reboot and an instance and we can do that for either an EBS or an instance store backed volume and that is simply an operating system reboot and finally we can terminate those instances when we don't need them anymore okay 
So first off, we can use our AMI to launch an EC2 instance. While that instance is launching, it will have the state of pending. After a period of time, it will then transition to the running state after it's done all of its checks. While it's running, we have an option there to reboot the operating system. We can do that no matter what type of instance it is. It's simply an operating system reboot. If we have an EBS backed instance and not an instance store instance, we have the opportunity there to stop that instance when we're not using it and then restart it later on. It'll go back to that pending stage and then obviously on to running again. And finally, we can issue a terminate command. And while that terminate is in process, it will be at the status of shutting down and then it will transition to terminated after that. If you require a cluster of EC2 instances that need to be connected between each other with high speed networking, you can place those inside of an EC2 placement group. An EC2 placement group will provide a low network latency. It will be using a 10 gig interconnect between those instances which will allow for a high network throughput. It's available for all instances that support enhanced networking. It can't span multiple availability zones. The cluster or the placement group must be in a single availability zone, but it can span a peered VPC, but you're not going to get that full bandwidth between that cluster and you cannot merge placement groups. The enhanced networking required within a placement group uses single root IO virtualization or SRIOV for short, and it provides a higher IO performance and lower CPU utilization at no additional charge. It's supported in a number of instances, but not all of them. And it requires an EBS optimized instance and they are designed to deliver the provisioned IOPS that you specify for 99.9% .9 of the time that they're operating. There are two options available for storage directly to an EC2 instance and that's not including the external storage for example uh, using an Amazon S3 bucket or using Elastic File Service. So the two options there are Elastic Block Store or Instant Store. Now the EBS is the most common type and an EBS volume will be replicated within an availability zone, which is great. So if your drive fails, there will be another copy in another availability zone. Now the EBS volumes, if they're attached at instance launch, they will be by default deleted when that instance is terminated. Now that is the default behavior and you can modify that by changing the delete on terminate checkbox in the console or the delete on terminate flag if you're using the command line interface or an SDK. The EBS volumes that are attached to a running instance are not deleted by default when the instance is terminated, but they will be detached with that data intact and you will still be getting billed for those EBS volumes, even though you won't be getting billed uh, for that EC2 instance. But again, that behavior can be modified uh, on the delete on terminate flag. Instance store volumes, they are physically attached to that host EC2 instance. And data is not lost when the operating system is rebooted. And that's the same for an Elastic Block Store backed EC2 instance as well. But the data will definitely be lost if there's an underlying drive failure because we don't have any replication there. And also if the instance is terminated, uh, that will be lost as well. So you don't rely on an instance store for any valuable long-term data. But they are good because they do provide a, 
a little bit of a performance advantage over EBS. And you cannot detach an instant store volume and attach it over to another instance. There are a number of storage options available for EBS. The first one there is the default choice and is a general purpose SSD, or it's called a GP2. The next one there is if you've got some IO intensive applications, such as a large relational database or a NoSQL database, you can use a provisioned IOPS drive, SSD as well, and that's called an IO1 drive, and that will give you high performance, consistent and low latency. The next one there, are, or the next two, are magnetic drives. So they're going to be lower cost, lower performance options. So the first one there is a cold hard disk drive, and that will provide you the lowest cost per gigabyte. It's just a standard magnetic drive. The next one there is a throughput optimized hard disk drive, and that's going to provide a low cost per, big, per gigabyte, but not as low as the cold, uh, but it is very good for frequently accessed workloads. For example, if you had a large amount of data and you wanted a low cost, but you were going to be accessing that data quite a bit, for example, uh, for a big data data warehouse. If we want to back up our EBS volumes, we can take EBS snapshots and they are a point in time backup of that EBS volume and they will be backed up to the Amazon S3 service. They're an incremental backup. So if you take another snapshot after that, it will be incremental and it can be copied to other regions or other accounts to create new EBS volumes from that snapshot. We also have encryption available on EBS. We can use the AWS KMS master keys or you can use your own customer master key for that encryption. And the data stored at rest will be encrypted, including any snapshots that are created from that encrypted drive. And also, as well as data that is in transit between the EBS volume and that EC2 instance. Another feature of EC2 is that we can connect remotely into our EC2 instances. So for example, if we're sitting here at our desktop with our Windows or Mac PC, we can have a AWS access key, which will have an access key ID and a secret access key. Provided we've got that, we can use that to connect over the internet to our EC2 instance and access and run commands on the operating system of that instance. Not only do you require those AWS access keys, but you also need to have permission to access that network. So you need to have a security group inbound rule that will allow access from your desktop. You can connect to a Linux system using the secure shell or SSH and Mac or Linux desktops will use a console straight out of the box to do that. Windows computers will require an SSH client such as PuTTY or a bash client such as Sigwin to be installed on their computer before they can access their Linux instance over SSH. And Connecting to a Windows Server instance can be done using the Remote Desktop Protocol, or RDP. So that brings us to the end of this lecture. Coming up, we're going to be having quite a number of pretty complicated labs on EC2. I look forward to seeing you in those. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In our first EC2 lab, we launched an EC2 Linux instance and we were running a WordPress application on that. And we used a username and password to log into that instance. Now, that's great because as a WordPress administrator, we can create blog pages, we can change menus, we can upload images, we can do all of that stuff that you would do 
through the WordPress application. But what happens if we want to actually change the WordPress application itself? We want to change one of the PHP files. We want to change one of the configuration files. To do that, we need to connect into the Linux operating system that is running our WordPress application. So to do that, we can connect remotely into our EC2 server using Secure Shell, and that will give us direct access to the Linux operating system. Now, this is a hands-on demonstration, so I'm going to show you how it's done, but I don't expect you to do this yourself. It's not a lab, and it goes a little bit beyond what you need to know for a cloud practitioner, but you still need to know that you do you are able to access Linux servers using Secure Shell or Windows servers using remote desktop protocol. So what we'll do is we'll launch an EC2 instance and then we'll create a key pair and download that key pair and we're going to use those credentials to access this EC2 Linux server. Okay, so starting off in the EC2 management console, I'll just very quickly go through what we've already done. We launch an instance. We'll select the AWS Marketplace as before. We'll search for WordPress. We'll select WordPress certified by Bitnami. Continue. We'll select a T2 Micro because it's on the free tier. We'll select Next. We'll auto-assign a public IP because we want to access this over a, or through a browser. We'll click Act Next, Add Storage. Next again. We're just going to add a tag, just a name for this. Now, name has to be capital N. And we'll just call it SSH Test. And Next. Now, the... Bitnami AMI has recommended or has listed some recommended rules for a security group here. So we've got here HTTP and HTTP access, as you would expect for a WordPress web server. But there's also one there for SSH on port 22. So that means that we can access, if we, if we use this security group, we can access from anywhere on port 22 and get direct access to our Linux operating system. And we can see here, we can access from any IP address, but we still need security credentials to do that. But it is also a good idea, and it is certainly recommended, if you have a static IP address that you're connecting from, to use my IP. And that way, anyone else from any other IP address cannot access this instance. So I'm just going to leave it as it is, uh, but in a real situation, you'd probably lock that down to your IP address and it'll come up with a warning as well later on. So just click on review and launch. And there we go. It's telling us that um, on port 22 and some others we've got um, open to the direct or open to all IP addresses. We know about that. Uh, it's not a major concern for us. We're going to shut this down straight away anyway. So we just click on launch. Now I'm going to create a new key pair. And I'm just going to give that key pair a name, uh, test maybe, whatever. And I'll just download that key pair now. Now this key pair is really important. You need to save it somewhere and you generally use the same key pair most of the time for groups of instance that you're launching. If you lose this key pair, you will never be able to access the EC2 instances that you've created. So it's very important. You cannot get this again off AWS. You can only get it now. You Once you click on Launch Instances, you won't be able to get that back again. So I'm just going to click on Launch Instances. Okay, so after about 10 minutes or so, we've got our WordPress application up and running and we've got these status checks uh, all completed and okay. So we can now go to that public IP address again and have a look at our WordPress application in our browser. And there it is. And as before, we can log into it if we have our username and password. So again, as before, we're going to go to Actions. We go to Instance Settings and get the system log. And that will be all of the console output from our Linux operating system. So we'll scroll down to the bit, to the bottom and we'll get our 
password there. And our application or our username will be user. So let's scroll down and we will log in. And we'll use user and password. And we'll log in. And that'll get us into the administration page or the administration dashboard of our WordPress application. So that's great. So just close out of that now. But what happens if we want to get in and we want to play around with some of these configuration files? So what we need to do now is that we need to connect to our Linux operating system. So the easiest way to do that if you're running on Windows is to use a bash client that will allow you to run bash or Unix bash commands on a Windows operating system. If you're using a, a Linux or a Unix environment such as Linux or Unix type environment such as Mac, then you'll be able to just use that through your terminal application provided you, you navigate to where your key pair is located. So I'm just going to jump into where I've put my key pair and here it is my test PM key pair and I've just downloaded that to my OneDrive. Now if I've got Windows for Git installed and you just go to windowsforgit.org or sorry git for Windows. So if you go to git for windows.org and you download that and install it what it will have is it will have a git bash here option when you right click on on your file explorer so if you click on that now or well, i'm just going to click on that now and it's going to give me a a unix type input screen or unix type terminal there so what i can do now is i can run unix type commands here so i'll just click on connect here and that will give me the ssh command that i need to connect to my Linux operating system. So if I put paste that in there now and I click enter and there we go it's connected me into my my operating system. Now I've connected into this before there will be another part before that will ask you to say yes or no you just type in yes to accept that that key pair or those credentials and that will get you straight into the Linux operating system. So from here we can just do a ls command and we can see uh, all of our files and directories that are there. Now instead of downloading the console, the Linux console log or system log, we could actually log in like this and we can get our credentials for that or for our WordPress application here by just having a look at it. So we can just see, see here, we can do vi and bitnami underscore credentials. And there we can see we've got our default username and password is user and there is our password. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this hands-on demonstration. It's not a lab. I don't expect you to do this yourself, but you do need to remember that you can connect in remotely to EC2 instances. If it's a Linux instance, you can do that using Secure Shell on port 22. If it's a Windows Server instance, you can do that on port 3389 using Remote Desktop Protocol or RDP. So what we'll do now is we'll just exit out of this and that will close that connection. And of course, the next thing we need to do is to terminate our instance. So again, actions, instance state and terminate. So that brings us to the end. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lab, we're going to go through the process of creating an EC2 Windows Server instance and then connecting to that instance using Remote Desktop Protocol. So first off, we'll jump into the EC2 Management Console and we'll go through the process that we've gone through before with creating a Linux instance. Uh, it's no different there, so we'll just click on Launch Instance. Now we'll go down and we'll scroll to Windows Server and we'll select that as our AMI. We'll just select General Purpose there, that's fine. And we'll configure Instance Details. I'm just going to leave everything 
as it is there. There's no point in changing anything there. Obviously, you would go through and assign public IPs and put an IAM role there or whatever. Uh, we just want to basically launch an instance and then connect to that instance and uh, simple as that. So just go through there, add storage. We'll flick through that again, configure security group. So this is where things change with a Windows Server instance. So whereas before with a Linux instance, we would be using SSH to connect into it. So we can see there SSH we would use if it was a Linux instance and we'd be using port 22. Because this is a Windows Server instance, we can't connect in with SSH. We have to use RDP to connect into. So we select RDP, and that will be on port 3389. Now, normally I would select my IP here, but because it's uh, it's just an example, and I'm just going to shut it down immediately after creating, I'll just leave it as anywhere. So we just go through and review and launch that. We can see there everything is... Everything is the same as a Linux instance, except that we've got here RDP. Okay, so we just launch that. Choose our existing key pair, that is fine. And launch the instance. Okay, so that's started to happen. So we can just go back and, uh, and view our instance. And there we can see it's starting to deploy. So now, thanks to the magic of pre-recorded video, our Windows EC2 instance there is up and running. So what we can do now is that we need to connect to it. So the first thing we need to do is click on Actions and get our Windows password. So what we need to do is select our key pair uh, or our key pair file. We upload that in and then we decrypt our password and we'll give us those details. So I'm just going to do that now. I'll just choose my file. Okay, so that's uh, decrypted the password fine. So there I've got my uh, password and my administrator and everything there. Okay, so I've now just jumped into the Windows 10 remote desktop application. But you don't have to use that. There are a number of RDP remote desktop applications out there that you can use. So the first thing we want to do is click on Add to add our RDP connection. And we select Desktop there. Now the PC name will be our server name that we were given. So I'll just jump in and find that. So I'll just copy that over and put that in. Now we need to put the user account details in there, which was administrator. And the password. And we'll save that. And save again. And there we can see we've got a connection there set up on remote desktop. So all we need to do is double click on that and we'll connect into our, our EC2 server, our Windows server. Let's see it happen. And we'll just click on connect. Okay, so there we are. We've connected into our Windows Server. And that uh, brings us to the end of the, of the hands-on session on Windows Server. I'll see you in the next ones. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lesson, I'm going to run through what we previously did with connecting to EC2 Windows and EC2 Linux instances. But I'm going to do it using a Mac instead of using a Windows PC. So... If you're a Windows PC user, you can skip over this lesson, it's not for you. So now in the EC2 management console, we'll launch an instance and we'll select the Amazon Linux AMI and a T2 Nano and we'll auto assign a public IP. We'll skip over that and we'll go to 
security group. So we've got a security group there for SSH on port 22, which is fine for us. So we just review and launch. So I'm just going to create a new key pair here. Okay, so now I'll just download that key pair. And I'll launch that instance. Okay, so that's currently pending and after a certain amount of time it will be up and running. Okay, we can see there now that our EC2 instance is up and running, so we just select that and then we'll click on Connect. So the first thing we need to do is to change submit permissions on our PEM file that we downloaded previously when we created the EC2 instance. And then once we've done that, we can connect to our instance using the terminal using uh, that endpoint. So I'm just going to jump into the terminal. And I'm just going to create a directory for putting this key pair into there. Okay, so just created that there now, and so I'll just uh, CD into that. And now I just jump back in and grab that file, and I'll put it into that location. So first of all, I'll just get Finder up. And there's the key pairs directory. Let's jump back into Chrome and grab that file. Okay, so I'm just going to copy that file over to the key pairs directory that I just created. Okay, so that's that done. Okay, so that's fine. So now we've just got to uh, create or just to do a command to change the permissions on that file. So I just jump back into here, grab that command, save me typing it out. Uh, just put your password in there. And that's changed the permissions on that for us. So now we've got that that key pair file located there and we're in that directory where our key, key pair is so we can now look at connecting into our instance through the terminal. So I'll just jump back into Chrome, just grab this uh, and AWS have made life a lot easier for us here so they've just given us the actual command that we need to use in terminal so we just copy that over. and paste that in. And just uh, type in yes for that. And there we go, we've actually connected into the Linux instance there. And so we can do our uh, sudo yum update if we want. And there we go. So we've success successfully connected into our Linux instance using a Mac. Something new for me. I'm not a Mac user, so it's, uh, it was quite interesting to get to do this. Uh, but life is a lot easier for Macs uh, as compared to Windows. So this, as you can see, we just go straight into terminal. There's no using PuTTY or anything like that. You just go straight in and uh, and it's it's a lot easier. It's very easy, very similar to the process that you use with, with Linux as well. So now that we've launched an EC2 instance, we've connected into it with SSH and we've run some commands in the terminal from our Mac. Let's have a look now at using SFTP to transfer files from our Mac across to the EBS volume that is attached to our EC2 instance. So we use FileZilla the same as we would with Windows. So just go to the FileZilla website and download and install FileZilla. Then once you've got it up and running, just go to File, 
site manager and then create a new site. Now our host will be the public IP address of our EC2 instance. So I'm just going to jump back into the browser and I can see here this is the public IP address of that EC2 instance that I want to connect to. And we're going to connect on with port 22 for SSH and our protocol will be SSH File Transfer Protocol or SFTP. And we're going to be logging on using our key file or our key pair. So all we need to do is just browse for that key pair and we just download that. And there it is. Now our, our user, because it is an, a, an Amazon Linux AMI, it will be EC2-user. Will be the user. If it was an Ubuntu AMI, it would, the user would be Ubuntu. So we're just connecting to that now. And just trust this host, not a problem. So it just connected in, it's retrieving the home directory of this and there we can see, so we've got our, our uh, EBS volume that we're having a look at now, so we've got our home directory there, which is EC2 user, and that looks all pretty good. So now we'll look at connecting to a Windows server instance from the Mac, so again let's launch an instance. So this time we're going to look for a Windows server standard edition. We don't want the data center edition. We're looking for a, so here we go, so Microsoft Windows 2012 standard edition is the one we're looking for. So we'll select that. We'll select a nano instance for that. And we'll go along and we'll make sure that there's a public IP enabled. We don't need to add storage or tags. But we need to configure a security group, so obviously we need 3389 for RDP connection to a Windows Server instance. So that will be fine for us. So just review and launch. And we'll use the same key pair that we used before. And we'll just wait for that to boot up. Okay, so our EC2 instance there is up and running, so let's just have a look at that. So what we can do now is that we can get our Windows password. And we do that by opening our key, part, our key pair. And then we get the contents into this box here. So let's open that up. So there's our PEM file that we downloaded previously. And now we decrypt the password. So there's our endpoint for this server and this is our username as administrator and our password there so we just need to go into an RDP client now on Mac uh, the one that I've found that seems to be quite reliable is cord c-o-r-d so just go to Google and type in cord RDP and you'll find the website for that so just download that and install it so once you've installed it you'll you'll get a screen like this so all you need to do is to just, just click on service and this little slide will come out and just add the server information. So I'm just going to give it a name EC2. Now the address will be the endpoint, which is here, our public DNS endpoint. So I'll just copy that and bring that over. And our username and password. Okay, and we just save that password there. So all we need to do now is just close out of that form and that should be all ready to go. So we just double click on this instance that we've created, or this server that we've just created. That will connect us straight in. And there we go. So it's connected and it'll start to do its business and we, we should get a user interface for our Microsoft server.
Okay, so there you can see. So we've connected in, we've uh, we've got our user interface for our server, and everything's fine. So that brings us to the end of this lecture, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next ones. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this hands-on lecture on creating a custom AMI, we're going to be creating a Node.js server from scratch using the EC2 service. So we're not going to be using a pre-baked AMI. So before we use the Backspace Node.js AMI, we're going to be making this from scratch. So we're going to launch an EC2 Amazon Linux instance and then we're going to put the software that we need on that instance, and then we're going to create an AMI from that instance, and then we'll use that AMI to launch another Node.js server. And then we'll also look at copying this AMI over to another region. So I'm just in the EC2 management console. I'm just going to quickly launch an instance using the Amazon Linux AMI, and that will be a T2 micro instance. And I need to make sure that we have a public IP address assigned to this, this instance. We'll leave storage and tags as they are, but we need to create a new security group. So I'm just going to call it test, uh, and I'll just leave the description as it is there. That's fine. So we need to have SSH access, obviously, to connect in and uh, operate our instance. So we'll leave that as it is, but we also need to have access from the wider internet to come in because it is a web server that we're creating, a Node.js web server. So we need to have HTTP access on port 80, and that's for, for everything to come in. So now that we've got those two rules set up, we can review and launch, and then launch our instance. We'll use a key pair that we've already got. If not, we'll create one. So we'll just launch our instance. Now, once our instance is up and running, I'm just going to get the connection command that I need. So I just click on Connect after we've selected that instance. And I'm just going to copy uh, the con connection command here and use that in a terminal screen to connect into this instance. OK, so I've just opened a terminal screen and I've navigated to the location of my key pairs that I'm using to connect into this EC2 instance. So I'm just going to paste in that connection string and hopefully connect in. And there we are, I've connected in. So the first thing I want to do with this Linux instance is to update it. So sudo yum update and dash y just to say yes all the time. So after a certain amount of time, we're going to have our yum date completed. Now the first thing we need to do is that we need to set up our Linux firewall settings. Now being a Node.js server, it will be expecting, or the way that we've set up our Node.js sample app is it will be expecting traffic to come in on 8080. Uh, but our web traffic will be coming in on port 80. So what we need to do is we need to set up IP forwarding from port 80, the traffic coming in, and forward that on to Node.js through the Linux operating system uh, to port 8080. And then we need to enable port 80 access in our firewall settings. So the first thing we need to do is set up IP forwarding. And we use that command there. And that's the same command that we used in the previous lesson on, on uh, creating a Node.js environment. So just go back to the notes there and you'll have that in those notes. And then accept traffic inbound on our port 80. And again, there we put that in on our output. So there is our instance is now set up in the Linux operating system to accept traffic on port 80. It will re redirect that traffic across to port 8080 to enable Node.js to receive that traffic. Now the next thing we're going to do is that we're going to install Node.js, the latest version of Node.js on this instance. Now I've, I've provided a link in this to the Amazon documentation that will explain how to go through and do this. Uh, so if you just go to the resources section and, and just click on that link, it'll link to the 
uh, the J JavaScript SDK documentation on Node.js that will have that section on how to do this. So I'm just going to paste it all in there. So first we do a call, uh, sorry, a curl, and that is to install NVM or the Node version manager, and that is what has happened there. The next thing we need to do is to activate that Node version manager, which we've done there. And once we've done that, we can now install Node. And the latest version currently is 8 at the time of this video is being done. So we're going to install Node.js version 8. And there it is. So if we do uh, Node dash dash version, it will tell us that we've just installed version 8.2.1, which is the latest version out there that we can use for Node.js. Now, the next thing we need to install is Express so that we can create web, page, web pages. So we'll do npm install Express and we'll do that globally. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to need to install Git. So I'll put Git on there as well. So we just do a yum install git. And we'll just check that that's working. So do git dash dash version. And we can see we've got 2.7.5 set up there. So that's fine. So now that we've got git set up, what we're going to do is we're going to pull in the sample code that we've got on the Backspace Academy side or on the Backspace Technology GitHub account. And so the we do a git clone and the address is github.com forward slash backspace tech and then forward slash node dash js dash sample dot git. So if you type that in, that will clone that sample application. And if we just do a DIR and we can have a look and we'll see that it is. So there's our node dash js dash sample application that has just been pulled in from that GitHub repository. So I'm just now going to cd into that directory and we'll just have a look inside of it. So the first thing I need to do now is install the packages that are needed for the application. So we just do npm install and that will pull in those npm packages that we need that are defined in our package.json file. So now we can run our application. So uh, you can just do npm start if you want or if you want to see it uh, in a debug output as well, so just put in this command there, otherwise you can just do npm start, it'll both do the same thing. And we can see there it's listing on port 8080, so Node.js it will now be listing on port 8080, but the Linux operating system will be accepting traffic on port 80, and we've also set up our security group to accept traffic on port 80 as well. So we should be able to now go to the public IP address of this instance and we should be able to see our sample application running. Okay so back in the EC2 management console I'm just going to select that instance and I'm just going to select its public IP address and go to its public IP address and there we go. We've got our sample application up and running so we've successfully launched an instance we have set up a security group that is going to accept traffic on port 80. And we've also set up our Linux instance with its firewall settings to redirect traffic from port 80 to port 8080. And also we have our Node.js instance that is accepting that traffic and responding to that traffic as well. And so there we have it. So what we'll do next is that we'll go back into the EC2 management console and we'll create an AMI of this EC2 instance. Now back in the EC2 management console, we just have to again select that instance, go to actions, and then we go to image, and we can create an image of that. We'll give it a name. Okay, so once we've put that in there, we just create the image now. Okay, so create image re request received. So we can click on the pending image. So we just go on here. Okay, so after a certain amount of time, our AMI will have been created. 
and it'll have status available. So what we can do if we go into permissions, so currently by default when we first create an AMI, it's going to be private. And so we can actually edit that, and so we can change it to public. So if we change it to public and we save that, it will then be available to be searched for on the community AMIs. So I'm just going to leave it private because I don't want to uh, put another AMI out there and get people confused when they're looking for the backspace Node.js AMI. But if you wanted to create an application and you wanted to put that AMI out for the rest of the AWS community to use, then that's how you would do it. You would just make it a public AMI and it would be on there. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. So what I'm going to look at doing now is to copy this AMI over to another region. So I'm currently in North Virginia, and let's just say I want to copy it over to, say, Mumbai. Why not? So what I do is I go to Actions, Copy AMI, and I select my destination region, Mumbai. There we go. And we have an option to encrypt it. I'm not going to worry about that. And so I copy the AMI over to Mumbai. So again, it comes up with a screen saying that this operation is currently in progress. So we can visit the AMI in AP South 1, which is the Mumbai region. So let's have a look at that and see what's happening. And there we can see it's going through the same thing. It's going to be creating. Uh, it'll be pending and then eventually go to available. Okay, so after a bit longer amount of time to doing it in the US East region, to do a cross-region copy tends to take a little bit longer. Uh, but we have our AMI that was in the US East region has now been copied over to the Mumbai region. So if you want to create multiple instances in multiple regions that are identical, then this is how you do it. You create an AMI and then you copy that AMI over to the region that you want to launch into. So we can again, we now that that's created, we can launch an instance from here, uh, just the same as we will before. So I'm not going to go through that process now, simply because I haven't got a key pair set up for, um, for connecting in. But all you would need to do is to go through and launch that instance. Again, make sure it's got a public IP address. Launch that instance and make sure that you've got a security group that will have access on port 22 and on port 80. And then once that's up and running, you can connect into it. You can again set up your IP forwarding in your Linux operating system and set up your firewall settings in your Linux operating system to allow traffic on port 80. And then you will be able to run that and run that application and you'll be able to go to the IP address of that of that EC2 instance and you'll see the application running. So that brings us to the end of this lecture. So you now have a very good understanding of not only how to launch instances using AMI, but also to launch an instance with a bare bones Linux operating system and then go through and install software and create an AMI of that finished EC2 instance, then copy that over to multiple regions and launch EC2 instances that are the same in multiple regions if you'd like. So that brings us to the end and I look forward to you in the next lecture. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture we'll explore using EBS or Elastic Block Storage as a storage option for Amazon EC2. We'll create an instance which will have an extra EBS volume attached to it. And then we're going to go into the Linux operating system and mount that volume. We'll then take a snapshot of that volume and use that snapshot to create a copy of that EBS volume. OK, so from the EC2 management console, we'll launch an instance. And I'm going to just select the Amazon Linux AMI. Now, I'm just going to slow down here and explain a few things. So we can see here it's with our T2 Micro. For instance storage, it only has the option for EBS. There's no option for attaching an instance store to that. So when we scroll down, we can see that most of them don't until we get to an M3 medium. 
and we can see there an M3 medium can have instant store storage attached to it. You may want to consider using instant store storage if you've got a batch operation and you just want a, a device, a storage device that is going to be used for storage of batch data that is not going to need to be persisted afterwards so it can be lost after you've, you've finished with that batch operation. And so that's a, the kind of thing that you would use an instant store for, but it's normally with larger instances. I'm not going to go into instant store, it's pretty well the same sort of process that you would do with an EBS volume, uh, but I just don't want you to get a bill at the end of the month if you forget to terminate all this stuff. If you forget to terminate a, term, a T2 micro instance, it's not a major deal for you financially, but if you get a bigger instance, it, it, you might be a bit surprised when you get your bill at the end of the month. So I'm going to stick with a T2 micro and be responsible for you. Next, configure instance details. So we want to make sure that we have a public IP auto, automatically assigned for that. We'll leave everything else as it is. Add storage. So we can see there, as, as we normally have, we have our root storage there, which is has, has a storage name of dev or device name of dev forward slash xvda. And the snapshot, which would come from our, uh, our Linux AMI. And we can see there that we've, we've selected a general purpose. Now we're going to add a new volume additional to that. And if we look at the selection there, we've only got the option of EBS. But if this was a large instance, then we would have an op option of EBS or instant store type storage. The device name that has been selected for us there is dev forward slash SDB, but we can change that if we want. If we're going to be attaching multiple volumes, they will have different device names and we would need to take note of the device names so that we can recognize them when we go to mount them. We also have the option of, of creating this EBS volume from an EBS snapshot uh, and we could select that. We don't have one, so we're not going to do that. And we have our volume type. So here it's automatically set, selected as a general purpose type. But we could do provisioned IOPS if we want and we can put our IOPS that we, that we would like to provision for this drive. We could also go down to magnetic if we wanted to save costs and if speed was not a major deal for us. I'm going to stick with general purpose. Now I'd like you to take very good note here is that by default delete on termination has been selected for the root volume but by default manually added EBS volumes are not deleted on termination. You need to you need to remember that so def by default root are deleted on termination but by, by default manually added EBS volumes are not but of course you can change that here if you'd like. The reason why uh, manually added EBS volumes are not normally deleted on termination is, is that they normally contain data and if something goes wrong with your EC2 instance and it is terminated you don't necessarily want to use that data, you want that data to persist afterwards and use it maybe later on with another instance. But for this lab, or for this hands-on exercise, I'm going to select delete on termination for both of them because I want to make sure that when you terminate this instance, everything is cleaned up afterwards and you're not going to get a bill at the end of the month. So I'll just click on review and launch. And launch, and I'll just select a key pair that I've used before and launch that instance. And after a certain amount of time, we're going to have our instance up and running. If we look at the description of our instance, and we scroll down to block devices, we can see that we've got our root device of XVDA and also our manually added EBS volume, which is at SDB. So if I just click on that, it'll give us the details of this. So we can see that we've got an EBS volume ID there. And it is attached and it has delete on termination selected for true. Now, although it has been attached, it's not necessarily available for us to use with that instance until we mount it. So we're going to go now into the command line interface and we're going to connect into this instance and we're going to mount it using the Linux operating system. OK, so I've just connected into that EC2 instance. Now, the first thing I want to do is just to list the uh, block volumes that are attached to this instance. So I just do uh, ls or list blk 
and that will list our volumes there. So we can see we have our root volume is f of x VDA, and that is uh, mounted as a root volume there. It has a mount point there. And we also see that there is x VDB, which is our manually added EBS volume and there is no mount point for that. So we need to create a mount point. Uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll have a look and see whether or not a file system is actually on that disk. So the command we use there is sudo uh, for root. Uh, we'll need root access to do that. File dash s forward slash and the name of our, our EBS volume device. Now all the details of this are in the AWS documentation, so if you get lost, just refer to that and uh, it'll, it'll uh, be pretty straightforward for you. And there we can see it's come back with data, which means that there is no uh, file system that has been created on this volume, so we need to do that. Now the command that we use to create a file system is sudo mkfs, and then we have the dash t option and the file system type and then we have the device name after that. And there you can see it's created that file system for us. Now to check whether or not we've successfully created that file system, we can just check the file systems now. So we can sudo file-s and then the name of that volume and it will tell us whether there is a file system on there. So there is a file system there. Uh, we've got the ID of that file system as well. So now I'm just going to make a directory that we can use as a mount point for this EBS volume. So we just make a directory called data. And now we'll mount our EBS volume to that mount point directory. So now that we've mounted our volume, we need to make sure that it's uh, mounted when the instance reboots. So to do that, we need to edit our FS tab file. Now, if you don't understand what all this means, uh, don't worry too much because this is not a course on the Linux operating system. It's a course on AWS. So you just need to know how to go through uh, this process of mounting a volume. You don't need to be an expert in the Linux operating system, but it is a good thing if you're going to be using Linux in the future to learn a bit more about it. So what we're going to do now is just uh, edit the, or first of all, we'll make a, a backup of our FS tab file. So before I edit the file, I need to get the ID of the EBS volume. I can use the device name, uh, but it is more reliable to use the ID of the device. So I'll just do that same command that we used before to get the file system into information. And there I can see is that the ID there. So I'm just going to copy that. You UID equals. Just going to copy that. And now I'm going to edit that file, the FS tab file in nano. So just sudo nano and then uh, the file. And there we can get into the edited screen. So you can see there's a number of entries and we need to add another one for our, our new amount. So we'll just scroll down to the bottom of the list there. And we're just going to put another entry in. It's going to paste it in. So what, we, what we're going to put in is we're going to put in the ID of that volume that we got from that command previously. Then we're going to put in the mount point directory, which is data or forward slash data. Then the file system type. And then we're going to do defaults and then no fail, comma no fail. And then we're going to do zero and two. And once we've done that, that will enable that the EBS volume will be mounted uh, upon reboot. So I'll just do Control X. And if we want to save that, we would just click on yes. We do want to save that and enter. And so now we can just check that it works. So we do sudo mount a and there's no errors coming back. So that's fine. And so now we're just going to CD into that data mount point directory, which is where our EBS volume is now mounted. And we'll just do a DIR on that. And we can see there's nothing in there. And so now I just create a test file there. So just do uh, sudo touch, uh, just create a, an empty file there of test.txt. And I'll just DIR into that now. 
Okay, so we've successfully created an EC2 instance with an additional EBS volume. We've mounted that volume using the Linux operating system. We've added a file to that volume. What I'd like to do now is to create a snapshot, snapshot of that volume and then use that snapshot to launch another EC2 instance with an EBS volume that will be an exact replica of uh, that EBS volume that we created the snapshot from. Okay, so back in the EC2 management console, if I uh, select the description of that EC2 instance and we scroll down to the uh, EBS volume that we've attached there, dev forward slash SDB, and if I click on that, and if I click then on the EBS ID, uh, I can get the details of that EBS volume which we've got there. So what I want to do now is to create a snapshot of this volume. So I'll just go into Actions, Create Snapshot, I'll give it a name. So I've just given it a name, Backspace uh, Dash, and then the, the details of the, of the volume. And just click on Create now. And it has started. And so we can view this snapshot now, so we just click on View. Now after a certain amount of time it will be available for us to use, so there is our completed snapshot. So we just go into Actions and we can create a volume from this snapshot. So we're just going to leave those the same as they are there and we'll create a volume for this snapshot. And we can view the volume there. And there's our volume ready to go. So now jumping back into the EC2 management console, I'm going to launch another instance of the same type using the same AMI, but I'm going to use the snapshot that we just created uh, to attach a volume from, or an identical volume from the one that we just created a snapshot of. So just going to launch instance, we'll select the same Linux AMI that we selected before, we'll select the same T2 micro that we had, uh, we'll again put a public IP therein. We'll add storage now. So now we can add a new volume, EBS, and we can put the same uh, device name there. And now we've just got to search for our snapshot. We just type in, uh, because I know it started with backspace. So just do backspace, and it will come up with that snapshot there. So it's always a good idea to put a description in so as you can find your snapshots a lot easier, but I didn't put a description in, uh, but I know that that was the snapshot. It was the only one that I created. And I'll just do delete on termination again. So what we'll, we will be doing is we'll be creating, as before, a Linux instance with an EBS volume attached, but this time it will already have a file system created on it from a snapshot. Uh, so we just need to mount that volume afterwards and we'll have that ready to use. So just going to review and launch and launch using a key pair that we've used before. Okay, so after a while our instance will be up and running and so we can have a look at that now. And we can see there that we have our extra block device set as well. So we've gone through, we've, uh, we've done it two ways. We've created a EBS volume from scratch uh, on launch and we've mounted that and we've added files to it and we've also gone the other way of of doing it with a snapshot as well. So I think you've got a pretty good understanding now of EBS volumes and I'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture on Elastic Container Service, or ECS for short, we'll start off by talking about what actually Docker containers are and the registry that we put those into so that they're available for ECS. We'll talk about how we can get ECS to follow tasks that we define to do with those containers. We'll talk about how we can deploy these tasks that we've defined 
on EC2 servers and also on a serverless environment as well. And finally, we'll talk about how we can set up a cluster of compute resources that will run these tasks as a service for us. The basic process for ECS will start with your code. And that could be in code commit, it could be in a Git repository, whatever. So for example, if you've got a Node.js application or a PHP application, you would have that in code commit or any other Git repository. And then you would use a Docker command line interface if you had Docker installed on your desktop computer, for example. And you would get that application code and everything that it needs to run. So it would have Node.js. Uh, it would have the Linux operating system. It would have all of the libraries and everything that needs for that application to run. And by doing that, no matter where that container is installed on Docker, uh, it will always run the same. And so that's very good from an interoperability perspective. So once you've created that container, you can then upload that to the ECS container registry or ECR. And once it's in there, you can then pass it on to the ECS container service or the Elastic Container Service. And depending on what you want to do with it, you can deploy it to EC2 instances or you can deploy it to a serverless environment as well. The Elastic Container Registry, it's a very secure registry or repository for your Docker containers. All of your containers, they'll be encrypted at rest and they'll be encrypted in transit between the service and EC2, for example, and that will be through HTTPS. And also you're going to have very fine grained control by using IAM permissions on a user or you can have roles. So this can be also controlled by EC2 under a role. It's going to be highly available and fault tolerant and it's going to simplify the integration of your Docker containers with the ECS service. Now, once we've got our container inside of the Elastic Container Registry, we need to tell the ECS service what to do with that container. We need to tell it what resources to deploy for that container. How many containers are going to be on each one of those resources? What security is going to be around that container? And so that's where a task definition comes in. A task definition, it's a JavaScript object notation file or a JSON file, and it specifies those parameters for your application. That can include the launch type, whether it's an EC2 or whether you're going to go for a completely serverless environment, what ports and are going to be open and closed, uh, what interconnects between those ports, uh, the Docker image that we're going to be selecting, uh, what volumes, IAM roles, all of that sort of stuff. You can define multiple containers within the one task and your application can span multiple task definitions as well. It also defines how much CPU and memory of that instance you're going to use with each task or each container within that task. Okay, so let's have a look at one of these task definitions. On the left there, we've got, it's a JSON file. The first object there is family. Now family, it's just simply the name of that task JSON file. And if you upload another family of the same name, then it will be given a revision number starting with one. So it keeps track of your different revisions of these tasks. What we've got there is the container definition. So it's going to have the name of that container, what the image is. It's an Nginx image and it's called web. How much CPU and memory are we going to use uh, of this instance allocated to this particular container? And we can see there that it's going to be running on Fargate. Now Fargate is the ECS serverless environment. So as opposed to running it on Elastic Beanstalk or EC2, uh, EC2 instances, this one will define it to be launched as a serverless environment. 
Then we've got also network mode. So there's a number of different options there, but with Fargate, the only option there that you have available is AWS VPC, and that is networking using AWS VPC. And the other options that we've got there are none, and that just simply means that this application is going to have no external connectivity. We have Bridge, which will be using Docker's built-in virtual network. And finally, we have Host, which will bypass Docker's built-in virtual network, and it will map the container's ports directly to that EC2 instance that it's running on, directly to its network interface. And finally, we define the amount of memory and CPU that is going to be allocated on this instance or on this serverless environment for this particular task. And as you can see, that is more than what is defined for the container. Now, a task scheduler, it will place those tasks that we've defined using our task definition within a cluster of compute resources with different options. And that cluster is a logical grouping of resources that will run those tasks. Now, if you're using the Fargate serverless environment, then that will manage that cluster for you. Now, on these, uh, on these instances, whether they're managed by Fargate or whether they're managed by you within your own cluster, they will have a container agent running on those. And that will, that will allow those instances to communicate with the ECS service. Looking at the diagram on the right hand side there, we've got the ECS service there that is going to schedule a task and it's going to do that by communicating with that ECS agent process that is running on those instances inside of that cluster. And that will receive those commands from the ECS service and it will run those tasks. And you can see there, we've got those tasks that are then being deployed on that, on that instance inside of that cluster. And that will obviously pull from the container registry the containers uh, that it needs to run. The first option available for us to deploy our task is to deploy it on individual EC2 instances. The next option, if we want to create a highly available and fault tolerant architecture using EC2 and load balances, the easiest way is going to be to use Elastic Beanstalk. And Elastic Beanstalk will look after everything for you. It will obviously create that highly available and fault tolerant environment, but it also makes sure that the ECS agents are deployed on those EC2 instances, and that will allow the ECS service to communicate with those Elastic Beanstalk instances. And the last option we'll look at there is AWS Fargate. And so that is the serverless service for ECS. So if you want to deploy strictly serverless without having to worry about EC2 instances, without having to worry about elastic loan balances or elastic beanstalk or anything like that, AWS Fargate will simplify everything for you. Once we have our tasks deployed to a cluster, be it a serverless environment or EC2 or Elastic Beanstalk, we can then manage that as a service. And so ECS will scale everything for us. It will look after our application. It will manage those containers and it will make sure that everything is highly available for us. An ECS service, it will run and maintain a specified number of instances of a task definition simultaneously within your ECS cluster. And unhealthy tasks will be replaced according to your desired count of tasks. And that will happen automatically, just like it would be in an auto scaling group with EC2. And a service can also run behind an elastic load balancer. So that load balancer can receive requests for that service, and then it can distribute those requests to all of the tasks that are running on that cluster. And remember, there might be multiple tasks on multiple EC2 instances. So that brings us to the end of the lecture on ECS. Coming up next, we're going to 
demonstrate a hands-on of using the ECS and using a sample application. Look forward to seeing you in that one. Welcome back to Backspace Academy. I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of the ECS service on a hands-on basis. So when you go to the ECS console, if you haven't used it before, you'll be presented with this welcome screen here. If you have used ECS before, you'll be presented with this screen here, but both of those screens will have a get started button. So what we'll do now is just click on get started and it'll walk us through uh, the getting started tutorial. And so there we can see a good diagram. It lets us understand exactly how all these ECS objects work and relate to each other. So we can see we're going to launch a cluster of compute, uh, compute services. Uh, inside that, they'll be running as a single service with a task definition that will define what container and resources that we're going to be having uh, inside of that service. So we scroll down here, we'll just select the sample app. We could also select Nginx if we wanted to or Tomcat. And we can see here we've got our task definitions. So we already know what one of those looks like from a, uh, from a JSON perspective. So we've got that family name or task definition name. We've got the network mode. So this is going to be running on Fargate. It's serverless. So the only network mode that's going to be available will be AWS VPC. We're going to create a new task execution role. And we're going to allocate 512 and 256 for memory and CPU. So we'll click on next. Now, if we scroll upwards, we can see that the diagram has changed. We've got a couple of ticks there. So we've defined that container. We're going to be using the sample app container. And we've defined that task. So the task is going to be using that container. Uh, it's going to be launching on Fargate and we've defined that it's going to be using AWS VPC as it's networking. And what we need to do now is define our service. So we need to define the number of desired tasks. So we've got here is one and or the desired count. And what that does, it will maintain that. So if, if that task becomes unhealthy, it will replace that task. And we're going to be creating a new security group because it's only one task that's going to be running. We're just we don't need a load balancer, so we're just going to select none for that, and we'll click on next. Okay, so again, our diagram here has changed. We've got another tick for service, and we now need to define our cluster that surrounds that uh, service. Now, as you can see there, it's coming up saying that the that your cluster needs to be unique. And it's already populated that as default, which is not unique. So I'm just going to put in anything in there that will surely be unique. And that's all we need to do. It's going to uh, automatically create a new VPC ID for us and create subnets for us. So we click on next. And there we go. We can see everything's been done. We've defined our container, our task that's going to be using that container, and what resources that we're going to be de deploying to, which will be Fargate, our service. Uh, and what our desired count of tasks are going to be at any one time, and our actual cluster and the cluster name, which will be unique. And we'll create. Okay, so after a few minutes, we've got that up and running. Let's view that service. So remember, we have a cluster and we have services are running on that cluster of resources. And so that's what we can see here. We've got no load balancer because we only really had one, uh, one compute resource available, so we didn't need to load balance. Uh, we've got some events here, so we can see here that it's reached a steady state. Everything should be fine. So because we've got our service up and running, everything looks fine, one thing we need to check is whether those tasks that are running inside of that service are actually working. So let's click on Tasks and select that task ID. Don't click on the task definition, but select the task ID. So there we go. So we scroll down here, we can see the status of it, or that container status is running. So we should actually have a web application up and running now. So we can look at this network here, and we can see that we've got a public IP address. So if we select that, 
and go to it, there we can see we've got our Amazon ECS sample application. So it's pretty cool. So we've run through, we've, we've defined a task. That task has defined a container from the Elastic Container Registry. And it has deployed that across compute resources that are running as a service. And all that needs to happen now is that we just need to clean that up. So we'll just go back to Amazon ECS. And the way we do that is we go to the cluster. Now we've got two sections here for clusters. So we've got Amazon ECS and Amazon EKS. Now I haven't talked about EKS, but EKS is a Kubernetes service of ECS. And Kubernetes, it's an orchestration uh, process for Docker. And so it just manages uh, your Docker containers a little bit differently. So it's a different flavor of ECS. You don't need to be too concerned about it, just that, that, that it actually uses Kubernetes uh, rather than the, uh, the Docker orchestration as such. But it still uses Docker containers. Uh, so what we need to do is go to the ECS clusters, select that, scroll down to our cluster, and delete that cluster. Okay, so after a few minutes, uh, that will be deleted. And that brings us to an end, and I'll see you in the next one. And welcome back to Backspace Academy. In this lecture on Elastic File Service, I'll start by explaining what EFS is and the advantages and disadvantages of EFS. And then I'll talk about mount targets and how we use those to communicate from our subnets through to the Elastic File System. And also talk about how we can access our file system from the EC2 Linux operating system. And then I'll finally talk about the security features of EFS. So EFS, it's a simple, scalable file storage for use with Amazon EC2 instances. It's network attached storage as opposed to uh, EBS, which is uh, attaching a block device storage to an EC2 instance. And it can be accessed by multiple EC2 instances at the same time, uh, as opposed to uh, block device storage, such as EBS and instance store. So where it fits in with the uh, the storage options that are available for EC2 there, it is a file system that is accessed through the network, as opposed to object storage with S3 and Glacier, and block device storage, where we're attaching a block device to uh, our EC2 instance, which is what we do with EBS and instance store. So the advantage of EFS is it's a fully managed service. The file system grows and shrinks automatically and it can grow to petabytes in size. So very big or it can go to as small as you want it. You only pay for the storage space that you use and there is no minimum fee. The throughput, it scales automatically depending on demand. So it scales to ensure you have consistent low latency and it can support thousands of connections. And it also has multiple availability zone replication of your data. So there's some fantastic advantages of EFS. The disadvantages of EFS, it's not available in all regions like with most new services with AWS, but that is expanding all the time and it won't be too long before EFS is available in all regions. It doesn't have cross-region capability, uh, but of course neither does EBS. It's a little bit more complicated to provision compared to S3 and EBS. So for us to access the EFS share after it's been created, we need a mount target located in a subnet, in the subnet that our EC2 instance is, uh, is has been launched in. So that mount target is a VPC NFS endpoint in a similar way that we have endpoints for Amazon S3 that allow us to communicate from our VPC out to a service uh, within uh, AWS outside of our VPC. The mount target will have an IP address and a DNS name and you can use that 
to uh, with the Linux mount command, but it's not recommended to do that. It's better to use the uh, the DNS name for the actual EFS share rather than the DNS name for uh, the mount target. But you can use either, and it can be mounted to multiple EC2 instances at the same time. So you can see there on that diagram on the left, we've got two EC2 EC2 instances uh, within availability zone there, US West 2A that are both uh, mounted to the same mount target which is then mount or with which is then connected through to the EFS share and also the mount targets can be in a different subnet to the instance but they cannot be in a different availability zone so you see on the right hand side there of that diagram we've got a EC2 instance in a subnet uh, which is which has a mount target from another subnet that is mounted to it. So that's quite possible to do that. But you couldn't have an EC2 instance in one availability zone uh, mounting a mount target from another availability zone. That's not possible to do. So the ways that we can access our file system from EC2, now that first of all requires an NFS client to be installed on our EC2 instance. Now that is standard on the current Linux distributions and if you're using the Amazon Linux AMI it will, be, it will come pre-installed on that so you don't need to worry about that. You mount the file system using a Linux mount command similar to what you would do with uh, EBS or instant store but you use the domain name for the EFS share and the file system DNS name or the mount point point DS, DNS name can be used to mount uh, the EFS on the EFS share on EC2 but it is recommended to use a file system DNS name and it's much easier to do that. There are a number of security features of EFS that you can use. Obviously we have IAM permissions to create, update and delete which we can set up uh, on a user or group basis. We also have EC2 security groups that can be set as inbound rules for EFS and also uh, vice versa. We can have uh, security group rules for EFS uh, as inbound for EC2 as well. We can use network access control lists to further control traffic. And we also have Linux Unix file root only permissions by default and we change those file permissions using chown or chmod uh, commands within Linux as we would do with any other Linux file server. So that's uh, it for now. The best way to learn about EFS is to get your hands on and use it which is what we'll do in the next lecture.